Muy buenos días a todas las personas que nos acompañan el día de hoy. En nombre de la Administración Municipal Ibagué Vibra, en nombre de nuestro alcalde, el ingeniero Andrés Fabián Hurtado, y en mi condición de secretario. Welcome to all participants of the second seminar of music and social transformation organized jointly with uh, Fundación Nacional Batuta within the framework of its 30th anniversary. This seminar is the first at national level event uh, uh, around music happening in Iwagé since 1936. So for our city, it is a big pride to be at the center of conceptual debate around music for mu uh, the city and the world. And to uh, capitalize on our condition as music city of Colombia and cultural capital in 2022. The second version of the seminar is a great opportunity to address debates and discussions on the role of arts and culture in building. Y sobre todo, la forma en la que pueden convertirse en herramientas clave para crear mecanismos tools to create mechanisms of social interaction that allow us to strengthen local na national presences to build peace. It is also an opportunity to call attention on the needs of the cultural sector and the importance to create initiatives that can boost the music and the arts sector. This event is also held at a time when we are working very hard. Económica del sector cultural uno de los sectores más golpeados por la pandemia global del COVID-19. Este seminario nos permitirá intercambiar ideas sobre las necesidades de la cultura a nivel global, nacional y local, y nos permitirá también trabajar en estrategias a estos retos de una forma adecuada y pertinente. Por último, será también una oportunidad inigualable para poder construir redes de colaboración y cooperación con otras ciudades o países alrededor de los temas de la música y la cultura. Es por esto que, por ejemplo, en el marco de este seminario, tenemos reunida a las ciudades que hacen parte de la Red de Ciudades Creativas de la UNESCO de Colombia y también de América Latina, para poder fortalecer nuestra apuesta la que tiene la ciudad de Ibagué para ser parte de la red de ciudades creativas de la UNESCO en la categoría de la música. Todas estas son razones para las cuales este segundo seminario de música y transformación social es de gran relevancia para nuestra ciudad, país y también para el mundo y es por esto que los invito a todos a participar activamente en los diferentes espacios de este seminario. In this way, we will achieve our goal to create and share and listen to and execute ideas that can adequately respond to the needs of our sector. Now, let me welcome the Minister of Culture, Angelica Mayorga. I want to invite you to this second version of the National Seminar of Music and Social Transformation organized by Batuta, the Mayor's Office of Iwagé, with support with the Ministry of Culture, Bank of the Republic, and the private sector. This space uh, is it, uh, aimed to uh, understand new ways to think music and how to reconfigure uh, the music industry. The seminar that's organized on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of Batuta in this country and that has the aim to highlight the importance of the candidacy of Iwagé to become a part of the Creative Cities Network of UNESCO. This will bring together 88 experts and successful experiences from around the world around the meaning of music in today's world. You cannot miss it. Please log on and learn about the magic of music in this space. Good morning. My name is Maria Claudia Paires, Executive President of Fundación Nacional Batuta. I am here together with Grace Fentes, the Secretary of Culture of, of our host city, Iwagé, the capital of the Department of Tolima in the south of Colombia. For the Mayor's Office of Iwagé and Fundación Nacional Batuta, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the second International Seminar in Music and Social Transformation. It is a space for reflection, dialogue and construction of knowledge on the dynamics of music in today's world and its social and cultural impact on 
the creation of more just, inclusive, and creative societies. Over four days, the seminar will uh, feature 88 musicians and experts from 24 countries in a hybrid format for the first time to reactivate the academic and cultural and music uh, and the music sector in New York. Some of them are here in person from uh, the auditorium of the University of Tolima, an entity to whom we are extremely grateful for their collaboration and active participation to stage this second version of the seminar. Some other experts and musicians and academics are joining us from around the world virtually. These academics and panelists and representatives of extraordinary experiences and from different academic sectors will discuss and uh, talk about four main axes of discussion. Today, we are focusing on fo uh, music education for today and the future. Tomorrow, we'll talk about music and musicians facing symbolic and physical limits. The following day, music and musicians in virtual reality during and after the pandemic. And then the fourth day, we'll focus on the claims for a new future music and musicians in the construction of a better world. This academic event has been organized by Fundación Nacional Batuta. We are here with the executive president of Batuta, Maria Claudia Paria, and the mayor's office of UAG and the head of our mayor, Andres Fabián Hurtado, to commemorate this celebration of Batuta's 30th anniversary and to highlight the municipal plan UAG Uria. Uh, and how the plan focuses on culture as a factor for integral and community development. To configure uh, the seminar, we will have active participation of a very distinguished academic committee comprising the hollow uh, following people to whom uh, Gr uh, Grace and myself and all the organizers of this event, we want to express uh, our most uh, our greatest gratitude for the work in the conceptual structuration and the contents. Gretchen Amusen, international advisor to different uh, cultural organizations who for a very long time was uh, uh, international cooperation director of the uh, Paris Conservatory of Music and Dance. Jaime Renoir is departmental director of culture of the government of Tolima. James Fernandez, the rector of the Tolima Conservatoire. Celia Fischer, the director of the International Music Council, Juan Camilo Giraldo, who is the music representative of the Council of Culture of Berge, Kathy Graham, director of music of the British Council, Silvio Spina, art director of British Council in Colombia, Angela Maria Perez, the deputy cultural manager of Banco de la Republica, Juan Rojas Castillo, the executive director of the Youth Philharmonic Orchestra of Colombia, who uh, is here among us this morning, Catherine Sorace, the academic director of Fundación Nacional Batuta, Claudia Tani, our closest advisor in the configuration of the topics and the conceptual structure for the event, who is the cultural advisor at the University of São Paulo in Brazil, and Cesar Sambrano, the musical director of the University of Tolima. The event is also possible uh, thanks to the support of our partner entities, the Ministry of Congress, the um, Chamber of Commerce of Yagay, Bank of the Republic Compensar, the Bolivar de Vivienda Foundation, and the um, British Council and Ecopetrol. Now, the second version of this seminar, these entities have joined us as well, the Embassy of the United States of America in Colombia, the Bavaria Foundation, Ban Colombia Foundation, and of course, where we are this morning, the University of Tolima. We want to give a very big thanks to our allies and our partners for their valuable support and for believing in the transformative power of music. All the contents of the seminar are, will be available with a simultaneous translation on a virtual platform that will be available for free at www.simts.co. We invite you to share it with your friends and your networks and your partners, work partners who might be interested in music and social transformation in today's world. And we would also like to invite you to follow us in our social networks so that you don't miss one single detail of this wonderful gathering at Fundacion 
eh, at Ibagué, at Fundación Batita, en eh, Instagram and Twitter, and at Alcaldía de Ibagué on Instagram. You can publish your pictures uh, and pics on hashtag let change sound. Now we will begin the discussions of today around the music, uh, the, the topic of education in music for today and the future. The questions and the ideas that uh, we're going to evaluate today are the following. What music and which musicians, what musical projects, new musicians for the 21st century, new methodologies and techniques to rethink music and its relationship with artistic training, informal and non-formal education, music, uh, popular music, symphonic music and chamber music, universes in dispute, music formats and the construction of new paradigms and extraordinary musical projects. To begin, we introduce the academic panel, New Ways of Teaching, under moderation of Professor Emily Akuno, who is joining us this morning from Nairobi. Uh, she will be talking to Alex Rithman from NYU Steinhardt, Emily Howard from the PRISM program uh, from Manchester, and Sean Gregory from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. With over 30 years experience, Emily Akuno is a professor of music at the Technical University of Kenya. She holds a PhD uh, from Kingston University, an MA in music from the Northwestern State University and a BA in education from Kenyatta University to learn more about our guests. And the moderator, you can uh, download the digital program in English or Spanish on simts.co. Let's give a warm welcome to our panelists and all of you. Dr. Akuno, you have the floor. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. What a joy to be in Colombia, even though I'm in Colombia while sitting in Nairobi. I'd like to appreciate Maria Claudia, the president of Batuta National Foundation for this initiative. And I'd like to recognize the presence of Grace Cifuentes, the secretary of culture, and just to express my joy to be able to be part of this second symposium on in, international symposium on uh, uh, music, transformative power of music. The, that topic, the transformative power of music, I don't think we could have selected a more experienced and more knowledgeable um, panel to kick it off because there is something about what these two gentlemen and this lady are doing that are transformative in itself. Ladies and gentlemen, to take us through um, new ways of teaching, we have individuals who in their own practice and in their own research are creating new things as well as being very innovative. And in that way, making sure that we are approaching different ways of teaching so that music education remains current. Allow me to introduce in the order in which they will speak. First from the Guildhall School of Music, Sean Gregory, a practicing musician and educator. I like calling people composer, performer, educator, researcher. He's all of those. And, and Sean does a lot of collaborative work, which is exciting because it means that he does not work alone. And remember music is a socializing something. So he works with others and he's very um, visible on the music education platform in London. Sean, you're most welcome. After Sean, we will have my namesake, Emily Howard. Emily is in this space that is merging music and science. <laughs> and you wonder how you do that, but I'm sure we're going to get a few things. So coming to us from the Royal Northern College of Music, 
Emily is a curator and director of PRISM, that project that gets us to see how these things link up and how they perhaps influence one another or affect one another, or how through one we can excel in the other. And then we'll come to Alex, who is coming to us from New York. Um, and it's interestingly working in two spaces at the, at the moment, but that's for another discussion. Alex has a, a way of dealing with the IT, with, elect, with technology in ways that you wonder, is that going to generate music? I'm sure it now, enough. It does generate music and it does disseminate music and it does store music. But in the process, all the three persons generate or develop or present to us new ways of teaching music. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we proceed? And so I invite Sean to please pick it up and take us through your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for that lovely introduction for all of us. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, hello from London. Uh, it's the afternoon here. Uh, while I talk, I am just going to uh, try and show my uh, slides, um, which I hope will come up in a moment. Uh, excuse me just for a moment, just one sec. Just need to come back and go from the beginning, beg your pardon. Apologies for that. Um, so I'm going to um, speak about uh, the Creative Music Workshop. I'm speaking as a composer um, who has, collab has composed through collaboration with people of all ages, experience and backgrounds for many years, both as a practitioner myself, uh, but then also as a manager uh, and a leader uh, within the uh, organizations and institutions such as the Guildhall School and the Barbican. Um, the thing I'm going to focus on in this presentation uh, is uh, particularly around uh, what I'm going to refer to as the Creative Music Workshop. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it uh, as teachers and musicians yourself. It's something that many of us have engaged with in many different ways. Um, but I think the thing that I want to home in here is just to look a little more closely at uh, what it is that makes this space so special and so important, not only for us as musicians and educationalists, but critically for the participants, uh, both in terms of their own personal transformation and indeed the collective transformation that can come through group make music making. Um, I, uh, where we are always striving for the best with our students, particularly when you're at somewhere like the Guildhall Conservatoire, is not to lose the sense that everyone has the right to be part of a music making process. And we have a responsibility um, to ensure that everyone can be part of that experience. Uh, so having talked a little bit about the Creative Music Workshop, um, where it comes from, of course, the practitioner itself, the person who is leading or engaging with a Creative Music Workshop experience, um, this musician, this practitioner, is often referred to as a, a portfolio musician, a portfolio practitioner. I think this has become more of a common term. Uh, what that just means is that whilst you may have a central skill as a performer or a composer or indeed a teacher or a leader, an educationalist, um, you are able particularly within a creative music workshop environment to apply and engage with all these skills and not see just one thing for yourself and the composing side, for example, or the teaching side as something for someone else to deal with. This is a holistic approach and it needs the practitioners involved to feel that they can innovate, that they can collaborate, that they can work in partnership, not just with the people in the room, but maybe other organizations who have been involved in setting up the workshops you are doing or the projects you are doing. You are a connector alive to every possibility, everything that brings people and ideas together. 
and you are always reflecting, reflecting yourself as a practitioner, but reflecting with the group you are working with to make the experience as strong and as vibrant uh, and as meaningful as possible. The environment itself, the space you are in, um, this again it, uh, is a very, very important part. Uh, this is not just a fixed space where a certain type of music making happens. Of course, that is valid as well. Whether you're going in for a, to play in a band or a symphony orchestra, that has a certain parameter already. This is a more open, a fluid space, a space where anything can happen. A space where trained musicians, so-called untrained musicians, musicians who have been taught formally, people who just love music and want to be part of it, or perhaps feel very nervous about even trying out some music, all of those people can be in the room together. All of them have a part to play and have a voice to give uh, and to speak within that creative music making experience. What type of leadership qualities do we need for this sort of experience? Well, uh, as a leader within a creative music workshop, you need to be able to enable and to listen. Um, you have a sense of the social engagement side to this experience, as well as the music side. It's not either or, it's both of these things and many other things working together. So your human qualities as a workshop leader, as a musician within a creative workshop are really important and need to be at the fore. You are not just a trained teacher or a trained musician doing what you do because that's how you've been taught to do it. You are bringing yourself into this experience and you are excited by the social and the communal experiences coming through it as well as the musical ones. And critically, you are there as a leader to respond to what is happening at that particular moment, rather than just working to a fixed method methodology as to how you do things. Um, you are also very mindful of the different roles that you play. I have mentioned some of these things together uh, already, uh, but in essence, to the second point of this slide, you are capturing what's being created. So the environment you've encouraged and that you've got going where musical ideas are being generated collaboratively and the music that comes out of that starts to have its own character and definition. You are the person, maybe in collaborations with others, who are really helping to capture those things so that everyone feels part of it and feels that they have contributed to what has come out. Uh, excuse me for rushing a little, but I don't want to run over time. These are some of the skills. I'm sure many of these things are familiar to you, but maybe um, it's to highlight um, the plurality of some of these skills, some of which may be recognized as a slightly more formal side of the skills you'd expect a musician to have. Um, some of them may be seen as slightly more West skills from the Western side of music making. But the key thing here is to get beyond that, speaking as someone who's come through the Western classical tradition, but who loves improvising and creating with musicians from many different styles and genres. All of these things count. So your oral skills, your physical skills, as well as your cognitive skills that may become through reading notation in the more traditional sense, all of those things count, as well as your ability to connect to other art forms, to other inspirations, be it text, poetry, visuals, technology, whatever. Um, being able to evaluate the experience that comes with this is really key as well. Um, and the types of criteria that you measure the quality of the work, again, this is a, another whole presentation in itself if one really goes into it, but the quality and, effect, and effectiveness of what you do as a musician, as a leader in these environments um, is very much to do with the people you are working with, what is needed at that moment, and the context that you are working in, as well as the quality of the music making and the experience that comes with it too. And this is a sort of visual representation of that, how you might go through the doing, the reflecting, the evaluating, and how that feeds back into what you do next. I have some questions here, which I won't try and answer now, and we probably won't have time even on the panel, but things to take away. 
uh, in terms of really thinking from now into the future, not only in terms of a creative music workshop, but more broadly, uh, what a musician of now and the future, and I mean musician in the broader sense, a musician who is a music maker, as well as being a teacher, a leader, a collaborator, a creator, what impact you feel you can have and indeed perhaps have a responsibility to have within the wider context of education culture and society um, again i think these links are available for you but i just wanted to quickly reference some of the things we are doing more specifically in the guild hall uh, and indeed tied to the barbican where i, uh, I work as well uh, and these ranges from our own research institute which is particularly looking at uh, social impact of music and the arts more broadly uh, lifelong learning programs uh, and some community-based projects that we do, such as Drumworks and Messengers and National Open Youth Orchestra, which is specifically an orchestra we are leading through the Barbican and Guildhall uh, for uh, musicians who need to make music with the support of technology uh, due to maybe physical constrictions uh, and other things as well. Uh, and there's a particular book by Peter Renshaw I'm referring to there where a lot of this original thinking has come out. Um, just to finish, maybe for one minute only, I will, in fact, definitely only for one minute, I will give you a taste of one of these groups who I think capture much of what I've been talking about. This was set up by ex-students of the Guildhall School, Drumworks, um, and they are now, through the support of the Barbican and the Guildhall School, they have become a... Um, a an organisation in their own right, a charity, who do many exciting projects. <laughs> This is a music project based in East London. We use drumming as a tool to inspire creativity, build confidence, build social cohesion and empower young people to make positive choices about their lives. We've been invited as a whole band for Drumworks to play in a place park in Wolverstow at the Wolverstow Garden Party. I look forward to Wolverhampton every year because it's like the gathering of every person who does drum works. It's the biggest band we ever do, so it's quite an event. Participants take part in weekly drumming sessions led by professional musicians in our partner secondary schools in East London. They monitor us as we go along and then, and then when you're ready they just promote you up to drum heads, yeah. The cornerstone of the project is that we create new music with the participants, that there's a conversation involved, so they feel as much as invested in it as we do. We're just holding the space for young people to work in the way that they want to work. There is such a wonderful culture within the project of listening. I will stop there. I'm very sorry because I don't want to um, overrun on time, but I hope you just caught the, the spirit uh, through that um, short X film extract of what I've been talking about and the only thing I want to add there is one key part of this Drumworks model which has been running for a number of years is that the young people who become involved with this group uh, eventually some of them become the next leaders so we have a progression route all the way through and um, the model you see here and that I've been talking about is something we apply to instrumental ensembles, cross arts ensembles, uh, and many other different groups uh, that start here and incubate here as part of a laboratory and then go out. Um, I will finish there and uh, hand back to Emily. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, I've picked quite a lot of a lot of things there. And I think the one that caught me heavily at the end is the whole sense of the progression uh, from those who have been um, participants coming up to become um, leaders. And, and you cannot help but call that a very simple exhibition of transformation from lead to leader. I'm being simplistic. Thank you, Sean. May, and and uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, please do note them. There's going to be a little time for us to interact with you. Emily, let's move over to the Royal Northern College. What's happening up there? Hello from Manchester. Um, thank you, Emily. And also thank you, Sean. It's great to 
hear your talk and to follow it. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's lovely to meet everyone. And thank you for inviting me. So as Emily mentioned, I'm based at the Royal Northern College of Music. It's a conservatoire in Manchester in the UK. I'm a composer, so a practitioner pursuing practice-based research. I'm a teacher and I'm also a curator. And today I've been invited to speak about PRISM. It's the Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music at the Royal Northern College of Music. Now we're only small when we We've, we've just begun in many, in many ways the last few years. And what I wanted to do is to give you a kind of very personal journey through how I think the last few years, how we've arrived where we are. And I shall share my screen to do that. So I'm the director of the center and one of its co-founders. And I first met PRISM co-director and mathematician Marcus de Sotoy in 2016. And Marcus is the Simonai Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford. And we bonded when we discovered a kind of mutual admiration for the shape, the torus. It's a mathematical shape. It's shaped like a donut, so just with a hole in the middle. And at that time, I was creating a work for large orchestra to deadline. And my piece was titled Torus, inspired by thinking about musical journeys around this mathematical donut. Now, Marcus had also coincidentally created a play, a mathematical play that explored this shape. And when he heard that my new work would premiere at the BBC Proms, quick as a flash, he said, the Royal Albert Hall is torus shaped. It's donut shaped. You can walk round and round and round its centre as though you're walking around this donut. And, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because I hadn't even thought about that. I, I, I thought a lot about the Albert Hall because um, the piece would probably there, but I hadn't thought about it being the shape of this donut, the sort of the torus that I was thinking about all the time. And it was a kind of light bulb moment for me. And I always remember this moment of discovery, of illumination, this moment of viewing something through a different lens and through sharing a creative process with someone in a completely different arena of work and with different experiences and knowledge and how illuminating it really is to connect with and to collaborate with and to co-create with practitioners and researchers from contrasting disciplines. So I suppose the wish to create a more formal space, a research environment, and to bring together on a regular basis um, to foster collaboration between mathematicians and musicians, more widely artists and scientists and students and researchers was a real catalyst for PRISM. And we were also very keen to situa situate ourselves within a thriving conservatory environment, the RNCM, enabling us to involve and integrate our students as well as to learn from them in the way that we do. So PRISM officially launched at the RNCM in October 2017. And in 2019, we were awarded just under a million pounds from the Research England Fund, Expanding Excellence in England, known as E3 to support and augment our research. We take a lead in interdisciplinary and reflexive research between music and mathematics, more broadly the creative arts and sciences, with a view to making a real contribution to society, to developing new digital technology and creative practice, and to addressing fundamental questions about what it means to be human and creative today. And through E3, we have been able to develop a new space at the RNCM. It's called the PRISM Lab. Um, and it, it was completed in February 2020, just before the UK lockdown. And we are now looking forward to using the space and it becoming a hub of research and teaching activity. We also appointed a research software engineer um, uh, to, the, to, to, to come into a music conservatoire and work with us. So PRISM brings together researchers and practitioners in composition, performance, artificial intelligence, mathematics, music perception, and data science to foster and promote world-leading research through creative interdisciplinary collaborations between music and the sciences. And more, more than the application of AI and digital technology to creative practice, PRISM brings creativity to the AI digital practice. 
We've got world premieres and research publications, along with workshops, festival appearances, and the development of cutting edge technology, including the Prism Perception app for audiences and the machine learning software, AI software, Prism Sample RNN. We've worked with New Scientist Live Festival, Manchester Science Festival, Oxford E Research Centre, the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra, the Barbican Centre, the National Archives, and Drake Music. So I'd like to encourage you to explore our Prism web pages on the RNCM website. We have a blog with in, in, information and articles about our research, as well as an events page and a page for ongoing collaborations. We have a Prism software page, a summary of Prism software projects to date. I'm going to give you. I'm going to finish this short club um, presentation by giving you an overview of our collaborations and, and projects, and in particular the ones involving our students. Um, we, we are a research. We are a research centre based within a thriving student music student population. Just checking how I'm doing for time. Um, it's a collaboration between eight research scientists, eight student composers and eight performers, in which music and science entwine in the creation of new works. And so far there have been two iterations. So in 2018, a collaboration between RNCM student composers and performers and research scientists based at Manchester Metropolitan University. The world premiere performance of the new works took place during the British Science Week in 2018 at the RNCM in person. The second, in 2020, was a collaboration between the RNCM and University of Liverpool student composers, research scientists across the physical sciences at the University of Liverpool, and the acclaimed young music group, the Riot Ensemble. And this was a digital concert online. And so paired research scientists and student composers spent time together over an academic year reflecting on each other's practice. The composers immerse themselves in understanding the scientists' work, visiting laboratories, taking part in experiments, and the scientists gained insight into the artistic process of composition and reflected on their own practice in discussion with musicians and the other scientists, both within their pairings and within the wider cohort. So you can watch videos of performances of the 16 works available on the prison web pages, and there is an information about each pairing. And I'm also so I'm, I'm completely thrilled by how different um, and how varied this, these pieces really are. Um, and from 8Cubed, RNCM musicians have gone on to present their work at science conferences, and they have also gone on to create further collaborations with scientists, as well as to lead and engage other students in events like these. Music Play Maths. On a, the 11th of March, 2020, we piloted an event called Music Play Maths, a day of mathematical musical exploration at the RNCM, connecting GCSE A-level, so that's 16 to 18 year olds, maths and music students and their teachers from, um, um, with RNCM student composers and performers. Um, and this, this was a pilot event, uh, took place in the week before lockdown, and we are very keen to find new ways to bring younger students into the collaborative space. Changing Music in a Changing Climate was again a lockdown project. So PRISM invited students working in climate and environment science to collaborate and co-create with RNCM students in composition and performance. Workshops brought the scientists and musicians together, led by PRISM artist in residence Sarah Nichols and Laura Bowler, who both create artistic work on the climate and ecological emergency. We were also joined by leading academic and climate activist, Professor Julia Steinberger. A digital show was streamed on the 15th of October 2020 and presenting outcomes of these collaborations and is online and available for viewing. And finally, I'd like to mention our annual festival, Future Music, where we examine new developments in new music and technology, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, live coding and more. And earlier this year in Future Music 3, we celebrated our love of cross-disciplinary collaboration. We were excited to link machine learning specialists with audiovisual artists in Unsupervised, a new concert series created by the Machine Learning for Music group. And this group itself is a collaboration between PRISM 
and the Novars Research Centre at the University of Manchester, led by PRISM lecturer in composition, Dr. Sam Salem, and Professor Ricardo Clement at the University of Manchester. Again, you can watch these varied audiovisual works online. Several of these works have been created in collaboration with PRISM's research software engineer using our own machine learning software, PRISM Sample RNN. So briefly, I will go, I will go just to show you. Um, here is the, here's the website. Um, this is, I'm showing you the future music. Here is um, some information about unsupervised. You could watch them all online. Um, other, here is uh, another event, Dawn on the Morning After the Storm. A storm. Um, a, um, doctoral researcher, composer, Zakia Leeming, who was part of the Eight Cubed in 2018 and is now leading her own um, work, working with health data researchers. Um, she, she worked with eight um, researchers um, internationally working on COVID and speaking to them about the surgeon. They performed the work and that is online as well. And finally, we had a world premiere um, by Memo Actin, um, The Awesome Machinery of Nature. Um, and Memo was our first scientist in residence. So I think um, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. I'll stop the share. Thank you, Emily. And as Cecil spoke, I couldn't help but imagine how you are going beyond the obvious, going beyond the expected, to create new spaces for developing new ways of learning and teaching. Thank you so much. It, it sounds exciting. I think I should come and visit you one of these days when various kinds of lockdowns are done. Thank you. And now let's cross. Um, if I were home, I would be crossing the Atlantic <laughs> to go to New York and find Alex. Alex, speak to us, please. Thank you. Hello, it's uh, my pleasure to be here and to be speaking with you all today and to and thank you to Emily and to Emily and to Sean for everything you're sharing. There's a lot of, I think, overlaps uh, and themes that are emerging across our work, but I'm here to speak a bit about the work of um, my the Music Experience Design Lab that I've been uh, setting up and working through uh, at New York University, both in New York City and now also at our Shanghai campus. Um, I'm both um, an orchestral performer and electronic music performer and composer, um, as well as a technologist, uh, educator, and researcher, and be speaking a bit today about uh, some projects uh, and methodologies that we've kind of been piloting over the past eight years in uh, my research lab that have then brought uh, brought come over into our uh, my college teaching both in Shanghai and New York and now are graduating out of some technolo technology development projects now into work uh, with research with uh, arts partners and, and work from that. But a bit about um, the MUSED lab, it's the Music Experience Design Lab where uh, we use experience design because um, we're a very diverse group of musicians, composers, uh, software developers, technologists. Uh, we're we're working uh, closely with our music and audio research lab uh, with that. But as a former middle school music teacher in the United States, I was always frustrated by the complexity of a lot of technology. And so we developed this lab to collaboratively design new technologies and experiences for music making, learning, and audience engagement together with young people, teachers, cultural partners, uh, industry partners, so that what we would develop as a product of our collaborations would actually be beneficial to these audiences. And we've done uh, now almost approaching 30 projects over the past eight years, uh, ranging from creative web software for lowering barriers to expression and play and learning, to exploring the intersections of teaching code through music and arts and play, um, techniques for developing uh, virtual concerts and learning with AR and VR, and most recently uh, uh, a a uh, re new research lab focused on sustainable and entrepreneurial careers in the arts funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and so I'll be talking a bit about our processes that we've uh, piloted and worked through in our lab and how we're applying that uh, in our teaching uh, and work with that. Uh, we've had many, many projects which you can read more about at musedlab.org. But for us, we start with the premise that everywhere there is music is an opportunity for music education. Um, and thus, 
for music experience designers. Um, these are all rich spaces where our students work. Uh, and it's not just about education in schools, but across the lifespan from very young to older adults uh, in communities, schools, online, home, and particularly now um, in the middle of COVID in the hybrid spaces between these areas. And how can we leverage and design technology and experiences that bring us together uh, for learning, for creativity, uh, and how do we support that learning uh, in our educational efforts? And so one of the key processes uh, that emerged was a course that we developed called Creative Learning Design that we started in New York and New York City and now has moved over to Shanghai, where we collaboratively uh, work together with industry partners uh, or cultural partners or schools or, um, or other organizations to build. And so it's not your traditional university course because it's very much a community workshop uh, where we bring together stakeholders to design together. Uh, so that our solutions are useful. Sometimes that's a piece of technology, sometimes that's an approach to audience engagement, sometimes it's collaboratively composing and producing a concert together. But really it's about creating spaces for experimentation uh, and collaboration and mutual learning, that it's not just about us as experts talking and communicating with students, it's how can we create environments where we and our industry and community partners are learning together uh, in mutually beneficial ways. So um, again, a big part of what we do is collaborative design with audiences. These are some photos of some of our work, uh, prototyping and iterating uh, challenges with kids, uh, and then implementing them back in the, in, in the settings. This was a collaboration with a, a school in Hangzhou, China, where we were developing interactive music interfaces for coding and music uh, with kids together with the principal and, and teaching artists going in together. Uh, again, just opportunities to share and work together, both with physical technologies as well as software, and then also focusing on learning design and how can we develop uh, and design creative learning experiences that are sustainable, not just in the short amount of time we have with our students in these community settings, but also leveraging online so that uh, our teachers and students can continue to engage with this work before our interventions and experiences and then after. Uh, a big focus of what we uh, do in our lab is a focus on experience design, and we're influenced by uh, the work of Nathan Shedroff, in particular uh, around um, how can we sustain engaging musical experiences for our participants, uh, bring them in, work through different models, and, uh, and work with this. Rather than just pure education, we look at it a bit more broadly. And we're also really interested in uh, the ethos of play, making, tinkering, and curiosity. Um, we don't really focus on games or uh, competition or kinds of uh, extrinsic motivations. We're really interested on a research side of understanding how can we sustain learning and creative engagement through musical and artistic processes of improvisation, of composing, of wanting designing an interface that has audiences asking questions as the metric, not necessarily the amount of time they're spending or completing a certain goal. Uh, how do we deepen inquiry and exploration and play through the interfaces and experiences we design together? Um, and for us, a lot of our core questions are, you know, really in these classes, uh, sitting down with our partners and considering who are our audience, what are the freedoms that we need to design for, and what are the frictions we need to design for? A lot of, we bring a lot of design methodologies, but a lot of the the design work um, and methods are about removing barriers and making things simple. But in learning, we often need complexity to motivate. And those are the times if we think back, when did we learn something? We actually went through a process of working through resistance and working through that. So we're really interested in figuring out how do we balance uh, and scaffold both freedoms and frictions um, and how to work through that. What might we remove from experiences? How might we learn? Uh, to better design digitally for learning engagement? And how do we capture and re reflect students' creative processes throughout this to sustain that learning and engagement? And we've been exploring a number of projects in our lab that do that, but then really bringing this as a core process uh, to our courses. And uh, to give you an example of one of our uh, course partners, we've been doing some work recently with the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra to illustrate how uh, some of this works. Um, we work together with our organizations to set a design challenge for our students because it's really important 
uh, for me that our students are working with real world partners on real world challenges to learn together so that the methodologies that we're bringing and the opportunities for learning are, are relevant now skills and processes that they can use in the future, whether they're a performer, composer, educator, uh, technologists. And so how this was, how might the Shanghai Symphony increase their brand awareness uh, in both local and international markets using social media and digital tools? Uh, we then went through a big prototyping process of sharing uh, different solutions with the symphony. Uh, focusing on social media here with Instagram and, uh, and, and WeChat in, in China, uh, and then also prototypes, uh, iterating and working through that. A lot of our students in our classes come from a variety of majors, and so we want to really bring together um, their experience across interactive media and business uh, and humanities to um, work with our partners to advance that. Another one was working with a uh, a Chinese music instrument company uh, was building a rainbow sheng, which is a Chinese um, a traditional instrument, uh, and they were developing a uh, it as a kit, uh, as a creative kit, not just for students to learn and to play a real instrument, but to have a kit that they could put together. Uh, and we worked together with them to develop a creative curriculum around uh, a number of design challenges. Uh, here, oh, uh, one more slide here, including how do we make digital resources that will engage with both the tradition and the creative possibilities of these? Uh, how do we develop a curriculum that supports creative learning that's not just transmitting culture, but students are able to bring their own culture and own kind of connections to contemporary music and traditional Chinese music together with these instruments? And then how might we work with the company to roll this out in a way um, to people in China that will uh, better engage uh, and t tie into the value propositions of creativity of the 3,000 year old history, but also promoting, uh, promoting, uh, yes, promoting uh, musical learning. So from this work, uh, we've taken from these classes uh, and are now applying this kind of design process of iterating between uh, we spend the first third of the semester building these design skills, working on design thinking, then going through two iterations together with our partners to prototype and then to share in the showcase. And we're now bringing this to our research work as part of a new research lab on sustainable entrepreneurship uh, in the performing arts, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. We have a 10-year funding runway, initially partnering with the New World Symphony and their 30 years of alumni, but are really... Um, the key part of our research methodology is bringing these design workshops and collaborative design processes, not just to um, uh, the symphony, but to our, our students at our partner research institutions uh, to collaboratively design with the fellows, with the teachers, with the staff, uh, and to bring that into our research courses. And uh, particularly as we start here with the New World Symphony, but as we expand into the jazz area and with popular music and also with our cross-cultural institutions in China to get a better sense of uh, how this is working. We want to bring design in all of this. So my key, t key takeaways of the key ideas that we're exploring are creating new models for courses that are community and industry engaged from the very beginning that link together our students with these partners, centering pedagogies of design and collaborative design and teaching through real world design challenges, which involves iterating and ideating and prototyping around problems, around solutions, embracing that we don't know the answers to this and that it's okay to be exploring these uh, without and giving processes to students to do that, applying that to our educational experience design projects in the lab, but also as part of a research process uh, together so that we're creating value together and involving uh, all sorts of participants so that the fellows at the New World Symphony are also our research partners learning how to do this kind of research in addition to uh, furthering knowledge around their careers and how to extend that work. So. With that, I will uh, return back to uh, our, our moderator, Emily, and look forward to uh, the discussions around all these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I do note that uh, I think because I spoke in between, I've eaten up all the time, so there will not be time for question and answer unless there's one question somewhere. Uh, but I, I would like to ask uh, yourselves, not the panelists, just two questions. And I start, I mean, one of the, the um, quotes that I picked from here is, everywhere there is music is an opportunity for music education. Question is, do you believe it? Uh, 
Do you see it as such? Can you grasp that? Can you grab that and run with it? But a question that I'd like to ask everybody who is uh, in the audience is, uh, are there any notions of new ways of teaching that you have got from these three presenters? And uh, is there anything in these presentations that resonates with what you are experiencing or what you're going through or what you're dreaming about. And because of time, uh, I'd like to share four things, four of the many things that I picked from these presentations. Number one, that if we are going to be successful in coming up with new ways of teaching music or teaching anything, we've got to be very deliberate about it. Number one, we must plan. So there must be design. It is not, uh, you know, by accident. It is not something that will just happen. You will do it. I often tell people that I come from Africa and in Africa, things don't happen. Things are done. So here is one of those things that must be done. And then the second thing is the central focus of collaboration and partnership, that you're not doing this alone. Whether you're partnering with other art spaces or with other disciplines, there's science, there's technology, there's you know, the Royal Albert Hall. Whichever it is that you're doing, you, we are not going to be going this alone. Number three, involvement. Whether you're involving learners in real life challenges or engaging learners in the exploration and creation of sound or of, of ideas or involving the industry and the society, that space, that wider world where these learners live and operate. And then fourthly, ah, the central role of leadership. It looks to me that you, the teacher, are going to need to be a good leader because somebody needs to take responsibility. I wonder uh, if these would not make some sound pillars for developing new ways of teaching. We have two minutes to go. And I'm not too sure <laughs> that I can invite questions and answers. But if, uh, lady and gentlemen, if somebody has a sentence, a parting shot, that would be impromptu. <laughs> okay. None coming. All right. So allow me then to, in the next uh, couple of seconds, to say a very big thank you to our hosts and a very big thank you to those who are participating, those who are listening in to this uh, presentation. And a big thank you to um, our two hosts. And we have, oh, and I must not get this wrong, Maria Claudia and Grace. We really appreciate your being with us throughout the session. And we sincerely hope that what we have said has made at least a little bit of sense to you, but more so that it has contributed to your objectives of setting up this second international symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, with these, allow me to bring to a close this uh, academic symposium that has been teaching, talking about new ways of teaching. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Viviana, in the background, making sure that the technology is working. Thank you. Good morning for everyone accompanying us in person at the Tolima University Auditorium and online through www.simts.co, where any person from any place in the world can uh, access to the valuable academic content of the second International Seminar in Music and Social Transformation. This event is organized by Fundación Nacional Batuta on occasion of its 30th anniversary 
and by the Mayor's Office of Iwage as Music City of Colombia. Our purpose with this seminar is to create a space for reflection and dialogue around music and the social role of music and uh, its social and cultural uh, role in today's world. Now we welcome to uh, the participants of the panel of significant experiences in, in today's world under moderator Claudia Toni. We will uh, welcome Sarah Johnson from the Weil Institute and Jennifer Stum from the Illumina Music Project from Sao Paulo and Esther Vanuela from the Reina Sofia uh, Music School in Madrid. This is a top level panel. Let me introduce Claudia Toni. She's a specialist in public policy for culture uh, from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Today she is a member of the International Society of for Performing Arts, ISPA, and she, also, uh, she works also as a consultant in different institutions in planning uh, activities for uh, cultural administration. She is also an advisor to the rector of the University of Sao Paulo, and she has received many awards for her work in the cultural sector. Claudia, it is our pleasure and our honor to welcome you in Iwage, the capital uh, the music capital of Colombia, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a very big joy and an honor to be here with you today. I begin by thanking Maria Claudia Pardes, President of Fundación Nacional Batuta, and Gracie Fuentes, the Secretary of Culture of UAG for inviting me to partake in this wonderful group of professionals that organized the second international seminar on music and social transformation. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Fundación Batuta and its very impressive record of achievements. Thank you also Sarah Johnson, Esther Vignuela, Jennifer Stum for accepting our invitation and being here with us today. Our conversation will explore different experiences that have been successful and innovated that require from musicians certain abilities and capacities and knowledge that are different from what uh, is naturally and traditionally expected of them in uh, more interconnected societies and interdependent societies like ours. It's necessary to have artists that have m broader skills and abilities. Today's musicians are required to go beyond than just playing well. Nowadays when they, we need musicians who can act in different contexts as agents in certain processes that require vision and broader outlooks and more commitment to communities. And so today it's very important for musicians to receive multidisciplinary training that includes uh, coexisting with different artistic languages and going deeper in their training, in their intellectual training. In a post-pandemic world, music will have a very significant role for society and institutions and professionals will build new ways to relate to each other and with the different publics that we need to reach. And so let's listen to our three guests and let's find out what they have to share on this topic. Let me begin with Sarah Johnson, the Director of Education of Carnegie Hall and the Royal Va Music Institute of New York. Uh, she will be joining remotely. So let's listen to what she has to say. Good morning, Sarah. It is a very great pleasure. Buenos dias, thank you. So would you like me to start, yeah? Yes. Yes, you are okay. the first. <laughs> okay. 
Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from New York City. I am so sorry not to be there with you in person, um, but glad to join you from here. Um, and it's an honor to be with all of you and so many people doing such amazing work. Um, my name is Sarah Johnson. I oversee Carnegie Hall's Wild Music Institute, which is the education and social impact programs of the hall. And I'm going to share some of what we have learned over more than 12 years of supporting artists in programs working across education settings. I will specifically focus on skills needed in some of our non-traditional settings, but I think they also apply in school and out of school settings as well. So very briefly, um, there are two programs that have informed my, my thinking in major ways about the development of skill development. So um, the development of skills in musicians. So I'll just very briefly describe those programs. One is called Musical Connection. It is a program that is active in Sing Sing, which is an adult men's correctional facility about an hour away from New York City. In this facility, we've been working for more than 12 years. Artists go in every other week. They support compositional work by the men, as well as instrumental learning. And then four times a year are performances that the majority of which feature the work written by the men in collaboration with performances by the faculty and other guest artists. The work is very aspirational artistically, and um, it's a very serious community of 35 men who are doing that work. And they do those performances for broader group um, from the facility. The other program I'll reference is the Lullaby Project. Um, this is a program in which artists are paired with young families to write a lullaby um, to think about their hopes and aspirations for their either unborn children or their very young children. And it's a program that started at a hospital here in New York City and now happens in 10 different kinds of locations across the city and also with about 45 partners around the world doing lullaby. So as a part of running these programs, we support and train artists. And that work has evolved over the years as the programs have evolved and deepened and as artists have grown their skills and knowledge. At this point, we have long relationships with some of the artists who have been doing this work with us since almost the beginning. So their professional development needs have evolved and changed as the program has evolved. I wanna start with thinking about artistic skills. Um, in addition to their core ability to play their instruments or sing, we need musicians with many other skills in order to effectively run programs like Musical Connections and Lullaby. One of the first um, artistic skills I'll share is just around improvisation. So the ability to be present with other musicians, creating things together the willingness to try things musically, to share their own musical ideas, and to model artistic vulnerability. When artists do these things, particularly alongside their students, it opens pathways for participants to do the same. I think this is a particular challenge in the current training of classical musicians. When we bring jazz artists, of course, they're very comfortable as improvisers, but for classical musicians, this is really something they need to work on. And as I said earlier, I think this is true in musical connections, but that improvisation skill is just as important in school settings. Moving on from improvisation, Creative and compositional skills are very important. In a traditional context, these include the ability to hear a melody and play or sing it back, to notate it, to create charts, to be able to add harmonic ideas, et cetera. Those are some of the composition skills that are taught in conservatories, in uh, you know, traditional settings, that are very helpful, obviously, when supporting students' creative work. To be clear, we also think it's important to help students use their ears to move away from written music. And we believe in exploring a range of ways for students to express, capture, and record original musical ideas. These are all crucial skills when supporting creative work and both 
both of these programs are fundamentally about that. But at WMI, we see the creation of new music as a central music learning activity in all of our programs. A couple other things to mention, familiar, familiarity and knowledge of other genres, having some comfort level and curiosity about other musical genres is really important. And collaborative and listening skills as well. Um, artists who want to do this work well have to be very sensitive listeners and collaborators. And um, one would think that would always be true of musicians, but I have found that it is not. <laughs> listening is not only musically important, it's also a powerful way to build relationships and to connect with other people and cultures. Both of those things are incredibly important in rich learning environments like the one um, in musical connections. So I wanna talk now a little bit about the human side of things. We talked about artistic skills. I'm gonna talk about human skills and I'm, I'm presenting these as separate, but of course they are in many ways connected to each other. To think about the human side for a moment, um, in this work, who you are as a human being when you walk into the room is as important as your musicianship and artistry. I imagine many people here may know Eric Booth. Um, Eric talks about the law of 80%, that 80% of what you teach is who. So thinking about some of the human side of engaging with participants is helpful. I wanna talk first about intention. What we intend is very important both on a granular level, on a planning level, for example, when we're choosing what repertoire we will engage students in, it's incredibly important what we intend. And then bigger picture, when we decide to work with people in a correctional facility, for example, it matters what we intend. I say this because sometimes people enter into this work with a savior complex, and it can be quite problematic and, and not very helpful. This is not really about the skill of an artist. It's more about our attitude and the way in which we approach our work. In order for us to have the greatest impact, we have learned that it is important for us as, as program managers, organizations, and for the artists we work with to approach our participants as students and collaborators who bring rich life and musical knowledge and experience to the table. We need to bring our curiosity and our own capacity to learn. When we develop an exchange with students in which we are also learning, very powerful things can happen. Another way to think about this is to take a strength-based approach. Instead of talking about and thinking about people in the context of the challenges they are facing, it is powerful to talk and think about them in relationship to their strengths and capacities. This includes a respect for their musical lives, experiences, and tastes. This attitude coupled with really great listening skills and a well-built relationship with participants that's built on trust can lead to a very rich learning journey that is co-created, not imposed, the teacher or the program, but co-created by participants and artists programs, and that can lead to learning for both. So those are just a few of the key skills that we have found to be important for artists working in these types of programs. Um, I want to mention a resource that we have developed that, um, that speaks to these. It's called the Great Music Teaching Framework. And it was co-created by artists, participants, teachers, teaching artists, all feeding in ideas about what we think of when we see great teaching and what we see in really great educators. And it includes seven key impulses that we all agreed are, are found in great teaching. Those impulses are artistry, intention, inquiry, expression, compassion, inspiration, and agency. And if that sounds interesting to you, you should check out on the Carnegie Hall website. Um, you can 
look for the great music teaching framework, we define each of those impulses and have examples of places where um, clips, video clips, where you can see teaching where we, we think those things are, are present. So check that out if that's of interest. And I'll just close with one quote by one of our artists that I think um, touches on many of the, the things that I've raised in this very short talk. Um, her name is Juana, and she is an artist working in our Lullaby Project. And she said this, I was writing songs with participants through different institutions, getting to know them, trying to connect with them in a one or two hour session, trying to empower them through music in this short time, trying to acknowledge their funds of knowledge. I was also asking myself many questions. Who am I in this context? How can I really be helpful and what can I give back? What is required of me? What are my funds of knowledge? It was important to understand that in spite of our titles as teaching artists, we are in fact close collaborators to the participants and less so their teachers. Thank you. Muito obrigada. Gracias, Sara. Thank you. Uh, escuchemos ahora Esther Viñuela, coordinadora del Programa de Emprendimiento e Innovación Social de la Escuela Superior de Música Reina Sofía y del proyecto Nuevas Habilidades para Nuevos Artistas, financiado por el programa Erasmus Más Plus. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, I'm going to turn now into English and well, uh, first of all, thank you, Fundación Batuta, for this great opportunity to come here and talk about this very loved program, project of the Reina Sofia School of Music, the Entrepreneurship and Social Innovation Program. I would like to tell you a little bit about our institution. We are based in Madrid, and we have a double-sided mission to develop young, um, young talent, young talented musicians, and also to make classical music more accessible to society. I, I, I like to think that one of the uh, subjects, uh, the programs that best combine these two, this two-sided mission is precisely this program. Um, that we have been able to, to develop thanks to the support of our sponsors, Fundación Banco Sabadell and Edmundo Rothschild Foundations, which I thank from here. So um, I'm, I want to start with a question for the audience. Um, what do our music students need to know, need to be, in order to have successful or satisfactory careers? And how do these satisfactory careers look like? What is awaiting our students out there in the real world? Well, so this is the question that the Reign Sophia School was asking uh, itself. We were asking ourselves when, when we designed the entrepreneurship program. So I'm going to go through a few data so you can understand a little bit better the context of Spanish for the Spanish musicians. So here you can see uh, the, the evolution of the graduate students in Spain. So you will see that in 1977, there were like um, 462 people graduating. And if we jump uh, to 2019, going through a few years in the middle, we see that there are, um, I cannot see the numbers from here, <laughs> uh, 1626 people. But, um, Let's, I'm going to focus only in the orchestra specialties. specialties. Uh, so let's take out of here uh, the data of, the, of, of pianists, accordionists, composers, or other non-orchestra specialties. So here, well, the numbers are a little lower. And here, for example, the, the three last years, we have uh, six, 680 graduates in 2017 or 772 in 2019. But now, another question for you. How many positions do the Spanish orchestras offer? So in the last seven years, uh, there is an average of 25 positions per year. 
So that if we, if we take these 800 average students in the last three years, that gives them the probability of entering an orchestra is like 10.2%. So that is, that is a very low probability of entering an orchestra. Of course, we don't train them only to, uh, to go for Spanish orchestras. They, they go out there and compete in the, in the international uh, panorama. But of course, there in the other countries, there are also schools like us training the students the best they can. On the other hand, there is this, this very interesting data that Eurostat is offering us, and um, this is from 2019, where they stated that uh, the cultural sector has the is the the, the average of, from the average of the whole economy. I'm going to read it, not, not to not to miss anything. So they they stated that the proportion of self-employed professionals in the cultural sector was more than double the average observed in the economy as a whole. So this means that um, cultural professionals need uh, the double, uh, the need double to learn how to self-employ themselves. So with this data and some others and this reflection is how our subject uh, was born in 2016. Um, so, well, this is the, we are running now the sixth edition of the entrepreneurship program, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about how we, uh, how we are training our students. So, the program is based on three pillars, inspiration, knowledge, and learning by doing. So, the first one, inspiration, we try to bring uh, musicians with international careers, programmers from different institutions, uh, jour music journalists, or other influencing people from the music sector, or musicians that are building their paths with music to bridge into other places, other non-traditional places, let's, see, let's say. Then we try to give them also knowledge in order to develop the tools they need to be out there in the real world, as we like to say. So we, we start, like, for example, telling them how an invoice should be, or what are property rights, or maybe other more elevated uh, things like, like digital marketing or, or some uh, self-management uh, basics. And the third and more, more, most important is learning by doing. So what they do in the, during the old academic year, our students develop projects in groups of, on, on three, to five, of three to five people. And well, so what they have to do is design an idea and then implement it, which is re really what makes the difference in these students, when they have to really get to the, go into the territory and do their projects. The kind of projects they do are very different. I'm gonna just you know, mention some of them. They can be social or social plus environmental or uh, artistic innovation plus social. Well, they're very different projects, but what, what we always try them to understand is that they need to make an impact. And so they choose maybe uh, either bringing new audiences to classical music through educational uh, projects or innovative performances, or they try to tackle the, the, the big uh, challenges that the society is bringing us, like climate change, or how to be accessible for vulnerable collectives. But I'm going, I think it's better if you see just a glimpse of these projects. The sound. Gracias. The project point of the project is to work with the Valia Niños Foundation, who are immigrant children, and we wanted to bring them together with their roots and their traditions. The children should be proud of these roots and they should not forget these roots. We have taught them different songs in each network from each of our countries. Our project consists of a series of workshops with the final result being reflected on two concerts, one that will be in the foundation and another one that will be at the Sony Auditorium of the Reina Sofia School. So the project is to record a VR concert of classical music with its 
dissemination among schools. Our objective with the Music In project is to reach the children and initiate them in music in a way that's, that is more innovative. Now, this interest in music can create a habit. VR goggles so that children can walk around the stage, approach the instruments, have a close look and see what is the sound of the oboe and the clarinet, the strings. So we can introduce the wang, the composer, interesting information for the children. So yes, I was, I saw that the trombone looked like a snail. Well, there are so many projects and videos I could be showing you, but you can find them all in the Reina Sofia School of Music uh, website. I invite you to, to look at the gallery of projects of the entrepreneurship program because they are amazing. Uh, um, the students really can do amazing projects and amazing things with a little bit of help and guidance. So now I, I just want to close uh, close the, my my well this speech uh, telling you what we have learned during all these years during during these these five years of the program. And I want to do like step by step by by you know year by year. So the first year we we really thought that the students would be very motivated because we were going to fund their projects and accompany them, but we were mistaken. So we learned that it was very important to motivate our students. So definitely the kickoff meeting we did it was a keeper and and the individual meetings with the students. But it was this was something that we had to improve also. Then the second year we made the subject compulsory, which was very important. And this is compulsory for our master students, the performing students, those who are going to be soloists and orchestra players. This is not for I don't know uh, other other kind of students. This is this is for the performance and uh, performers. This is what I want to underline here. Also, this second year, we uh, we invited our, our graduate students to become part of the program, and that was a very good choice to do because they they become leaders among these groups and mentors for their for their colleagues. So that was uh, that was great, and, and but of of course there are many more lessons ahead of us. Then also we reduced the theoretical lessons because the load was too high, and uh, as I was saying, the, the transformation happens with the learning by doing part. Then the third year, we decided that we need uh, exper experts closer to music, because we were having like people like from KPMG being, coming to the school and talking to our students, but they didn't know uh, a lot about classical music, so they were not being able to engage with, the, with, with them. And also our students couldn't really translate this, this knowledge. And this leads me to mediation in the fourth year, which has been uh, a very important role also in the subject, mediating between, even the, if the experts uh, have a link with classical music, it's important to mediate during the classes so the students can really see uh, the importance of, of how, can they, uh, how can they really uh, take this subject and really uh, take the best of it. And also uh, some coaching, really understanding their inner motivations to help them link that to the projects they were going to develop. Sometimes this is difficult with groups with between three and five people, but we, we keep on trying. And right now we are in also in a, in a moment in which we are trying to tune a little bit our evaluation process uh, because we, we well, this is you no, know, it's like a, something you are developing constantly. So we are like thinking uh, how we should be evaluating the process, the result, the the commitment, and also uh, what we are trying to be very attentive is what the words that the students are using, how do they, uh, how what the lang the language in general they are using, their attitude towards the projects, because this, when we, obse we observe them with detail, this tells us uh, also what skills are they are they missing? Are they agency, communication skills, um, or I don't know, um, teamwork, which is very very important, or leadership? And that's it for me.
Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Esther, thank you very much. Now we will have Geneva Stum to share her experiences with us. Geneva is a splendid violist, a professor at the Arts and Music University of Vienna and director of Illumina Music. Jennifer. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, gracias, Fundación Batuta, Maria Claudia, and everything that you're doing here, bringing wonderful people together. Um, yes, I'm a musician, principally uh, a violist who plays concerts around the world. Uh, I'm now a professor in Vienna. And in 2015, I created a project in Sao Paulo, Brazil, called Illumina. And Illumina is a, a hard thing to define. It's a leadership development project that brings together extraordinary talents from principally La now Latin America, but uh, we're expanding rapidly to include projects around the world that takes place in different forms. We have a large international festival in Sao Paulo, educational residencies and projects in many different cities. And what Illumina really stands for is imagining a future where there is economic, gender, racial diversity at all levels of power, not just in music, but everywhere. I'm a musician, so I chose music. Uh, and so um, the way this actually works in practice is to identify each year a group of people who we believe can be not only extraordinary performers, but who have the raw talent, we believe, to become leaders, not just in the organizations where they commenced, which is overwhelmingly social music projects, but in any field that they might choose. And we believe that leadership is something that deserves development and equity, and is something that actually I saw very seldom on stages around the world. If I asked, actually, is anyone on the stage with me coming from an economically diverse background from my colleagues, the answer was almost always no. And I would visit social projects around the world, give a master class, take pictures, play a little concert, and I would think, I'm hearing talent that is equal, if not more impressive than many of my students at major conservatories, why are these people not there? And the more I asked those questions, the more I could no longer in my life ignore my privilege and my role in changing those things. And so Illumina is something that is born out of a real hope that the way that we scale the future of social progress through music, through technology, through government, through so many different fields, is actually by identifying and supporting and investing in the people who can create their own projects, who can bring deep knowledge of the communities they come from, and ensuring that those people have the same opportunity to succeed that I have had, that my colleagues on major concert halls have had. Similarly, we feel the same about our audience, that we should never make assumptions about whether an audience can understand, deserves to understand what kind of music they deserve to like, that there should be equity in the way classical music treats audience members. Our festival happens uh, on an organic coffee plantation uh, in the interior of Sao Paulo State, and the concerts that we perform there are for local coffee workers, uh, many of those people don't have formal educations. We play extremely diverse, complicated music sometimes, and what we've found is their, the openness to which they approach what we do is an inspiration. And for any artist to decide in advance for an audience member what they might like or deserve to like, I think is a form, a systemic form of discrimination. And I see it really commonly in, in my life as a performer. Um, I would say that since we're talking about new ways of doing things, that what we have found is three principal things. One, that the future will be creative. The more that we imagine what happens together when we bring diverse people into a room, when we give each other the freedom to talk, to imagine, to build, 
not in the ways of the past, but informed by the ways of the past. We create something new and fresh and exciting. And what we see at the Illumina Festival is that every year there's an energy and new forms of musical creativity that I've not felt anywhere else. I think my international colleagues who come and play would say exactly the same. There's something happening when we put pe people together in the room and we give them the freedom to dream. We don't say, play this because this is how we play this. We don't say, the viola is not a solo instrument, the bassoon is not a solo instrument. We say, dream big and think about what together you can make. The future will be entrepreneurial. And the way that we can make social progress scalable through music is empowering people to create their own projects, giving them the skills to learn how to manage um, small scale projects first, not always imagining that the future is a large scale symphony orchestra, but that two people can make a concert series in their local bakery play every week, gain a lot of experience, give something beautiful to their community. And if you imagine that every young person right now learning music in a social music project could also learn how to make a concert series in their bakery, every bakery would have a concert series. And I guess the last thing I would say is that the future is going to be human. Let it be human. That, that if we say that music is something we go through towards social change, I think we miss something. I don't think music is a door. I think music is a prism. It's the thing that we look through and it shines light on every single other aspect of our lives. And our belief at Illumina is that everything that we're doing should be shining light on everything else. Every piece of music I play should teach me something about the world, about history, about my colleagues, um, about myself and my own story and empower me to, one, accept my own story and believe that it has value for other people. The more that we believe that an audience of coffee farmers is as powerful as an audience in a large opera house somewhere in Europe, we have made social progress. The minute that I look at a student who's learning violin with challenges in a social project and believe that their potential is exactly the same as mine, should they have both talent and opportunity, that is social progress. And in my mind, you should see it on the stage. If you go to an Illumina concert, I've only done my job if you walk away feeling that you felt something different than you've ever felt before. If you see social progress in the way that musicians communicate with their eyes, with their bodies, in their movement, in their sense of understanding of how to interpret a story written sometimes hundreds of years ago and tell it in a way through themselves, through the prism of their own story, we have made social progress. And I will, I'll leave you with the anecdote, which was when I, when I wanted to make Illumina and I met someone called Claudia Toni, and I said, Claudia, Tony, you know everything about Brazil and music. Tell me what I should do. And, and I said, it's, it's not hard to understand that to make a social program that will benefit musicians who really want to learn how to play their instruments better will help them. That's easy. But the big question is, and the only way this will work, is how will it change the lives of the international artists who come here and work with them? And you said they will learn how to love again. And it's 100% true. And um, that's why the future for classical music, and I would hope all industry, is human. That actually anything we do that's creative should teach us to love again. And to my colleague Sarah and Esther, like, thank you so much for your work. To all of you who are fighting to bring something beautiful and connection between people. Um, to me, this is the most worthy fight, and you have my admiration. Thank you. Gonzalo, do we have Jennifer's short clip to show? Could we please, could we please share that or not? No, unfortunately, we do not. Okay. What we are going to do is the following. In a moment, in one of the next breaks, we will show 
the clip that Jennifer has brought along from Ilomina, not because it's from Brazil and not because it's Jennifer's clip, who I have known for many years, but we will watch it because we will see how fantastic it is to see what they've achieved. And in one of the upcoming breaks, we'll show this clip, okay? Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask you if you have some questions. Esther, do you have something to ask Jennifer? Jennifer, do you have something you'd like to ask Sarah? Or Sarah, do you have anything you would like to ask Jennifer or Esther? Please go ahead. Can we please have Sarah up on screen? Esther, let's start with you. Well, the truth is that I've been now two days with Jennifer, so <laughs> <laughs> eating and, and having dinner together. So we were <laughs> making many questions there in the backstage. And so, you know, I would like to ask her, although uh, she has told me many times, but I, I love this uh, story, <laughs> if I may call it so. I think what is amazing of Illumina, and I have been, I have been following Illumina for already well a while, and I think what is amazing in that is that these kids that uh, come out from very difficult environments and go to super cool schools in Europe, um, I think is so so Im impressive that they come back and they build their own projects. So I would like to know. What's the secret? What's the seed that you're planting there? I really think the answer to that is the way that we make music together, first and foremost, that actually music itself is the generator for everything that we do at Illumina. And the, the way that together we talk about music, we discuss issues, we use music as the lens for... Um, also discussing social issues, discuss, discussing people's dreams for the future. That's one side, that, that, that there's a creation of openness and a sense actually of relativity between artists that actually a facet of being an artist and what I would say a successful artist is actually how do you transmit your privilege and your knowledge uh, to others, and that is very evident in all Illumina projects, I would say, that that's, it's not about you should do this, or you must do this, or you must be grateful. No, I think it's actually like, what? who do we want to be as artists? What does the Illumina family of artists, which is now a very large collective around the world, what, what do we as a collective believe in, and how do we want to transmit that? And so for the younger members of our collective, I don't think it's different than from the older ones, in that sense of exchange. So one side is musical, and the other side is practical. That if you have a river, and it's full of obstacles, we say like small rocks in the river, so many of those practical issues must be taken away before someone has the freedom, in a way, to dream that they can actually create something from themselves. And so that's part of entrepreneurship, right? And actually, uh, that's how we assist in a practical way from the very beginning, is identifying rocks in the river, we say. And then also really encouraging um, younger artists at Illumina to dream what they want. So don't make an Illumina. Make something that is 100% born from you, and we will help you do it. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Sara, would you like to ask a question? Sorry, okay. I have no Spanish. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, um, do you want to I, make a, a, a question to Esther or to so Jennifer? To yeah, or share, share something one. with us? We have some yeah. two, three more minutes. I'll share one thing um, in listening um, to everyone on the panel. Um, it's an idea around impact that we heard early on that I heard so much in your examples. Um, we were working with evaluators when we very long ago started working um, in musical connections at Sing Sing. And the evaluators said to us, um, you are you are looking too narrowly if you are thinking about impact just in relationship to the participants or the men 
who are resident at Sing Sing. That's too narrow. They said, you really need to think about 360 degrees of impact. So the artists, um, Jennifer, as you said, you know, what will happen to artists who do this work in a sensitive and serious way over a long period of time? How will they be changed through doing this work? The, the staff, the staff of Carnegie Hall, the staff of Sing Sing, how are we changed by supporting this work over a long period of time? The place, the facility, this is a correctional facility, how might it evolve and change for the better towards, um, do I say greater equity? I mean, it's a correctional facility, but um, how can a space like that be changed through musical work that is happening and musical dialogue and hearing the voices and perspectives and beautiful music of the men who are resident in that facility. How can that change that space? And then the loftiest, maybe the most ambitious goal is around systems. Um, I didn't talk about our work across youth justice, but we work across the entire juvenile justice system in New York City. And we have seen through the efforts of many different arts organizations working in youth justice facilities, we have seen change in systems. We have seen new policies that are more youth centered, more focused on development of young people rather than um, punitive models for young people. And so I just, I offer that idea around broader impact, 360 degrees of impact, um, because I heard it in so many ways in, in the presentations this morning. Thank you, Sara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the three of you. You are all brilliant women. This is a very important part of all the work that is done. It's no coincidence that you are all women who hold these positions. I always say that the process is often um, attributed m more to women than the results that are seen. But we have very special examples today. Thank you very much for your participation. So I now come to the end of my time. Thank you very much to Batuta once again, and thank you to the three of you. I'm sure that we will have many more successful experiences so that we truly understand the possibilities that we have to work with music in coming years. Thank you very much. Wow, it was incredible to hear from these three women, no? They, it was absolutely spectacular to hear about the transformative power of music, which is what brings us together for this second Music and Social Transformation seminar. So, as part of this second International Seminar for Music and Social Transformation organized by the Batuta Foundation and the City Hall of Alcaldia through the Ministry of Culture, and also as part of Eva Gay's candidature to become part of the Smart Cities Network, we are here today. Amongst other factors, this is due to the recognition of the city as Colombia's city of music. And we will be talking in one of our upcoming panels as to why the city has received this recognition and we will also be hearing from some of our guests, our special guests, about what we have done at the Tolima Conservatorium. And we'll also hear from our big band and we will be talking about the enormous wealth of musical expression that we find here in Ibagué in Tolima. Thank you or thanks to our partnerships with associate entities, for example, the Ministry of Culture, the City Hall of Ibagué, the Bank of the Republic via its Sub-Department of Cultural Management, as well as the Fundación Bolívar Foundation that works with the Philharmonic Orchestra as well as the British Council on Ecopetrol is that we are here. We've also had other special partnerships, for example, the US Embassy in Bogota, Fundación Bavaria, Fundación Ban Colombia, as well as the Universidad de Tolima, which is where we are holding the on-site component of this hybrid event. 
I will go out on a limb and say that I believe it is the first academic event of this size that's been held as we return to the new normal after the pandemic. I'd also like to take advantage of this space to thank all of the different institutions that you have just recognized for believing in the transformative power of music. We would like to invite you to follow our streaming via social networks or through the link that we have, which is www.simts.co. And you can also find us at, at Fundacion Batuta and arroba Alcaldía de Vigade. Now we will be talking about successful experiences in today's world, looking at training for inclusion. We will be joined by Gretchen Amusen as a moderator from Paris, France, and she will be managing a panel. We will have Bob Riley from the Manchester Camerata, Jenny Molika from the Eno Breathe Project in London, and Anis Barnat talking about El Sistema Grecia. Gretchen Amusen is from the educational field. She is a specialist in intercultural dialogue and cooperation for the construction of multilateral projects. In recent years, she has helped to promote the National Conservatorium of Paris through an extensive international network of educational and cultural institutions. Gretchen, it is a true honor for us to have you here as part of this second international seminar on music and social transformation. Maria Claudia and I would now like to hand over to you to take the stage. Thank you for joining us at this very important event. Welcome to our panel on training for inclusion as part of today's um, session on training for, the, for today and for the future. New musicians, the new skills that musicians are needing to develop. And we have three outstanding panelists today who will share their experiences. And um, I will introduce the overall panel and then each of them will speak briefly and hopefully we will have time for questions from the online and, uh, and, and actual audience in Ibagwe. Bob Riley is the executive director of Manchester Camerata. He has had many lives as a violinist and a violist, as an orchestra member, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who is now uh, leading a chamber orchestra, which has been very involved over the last 10 years in a fantastic project working with people who have dementia and also working with young people in the city of Manchester, where he is based. Anis Barnat is the co-founder of El Sistema Gris, and he also has many lives, and he has worked um, in a number of cultural organizations. He's also worked for the French Embassy in uh, the United States, for Radio France, for the um, Harrison Parrot in Britain, and he is going to share the origins of El Sistema Gris now five years ago. So this is a yet more recent project that is involved with teaching and with helping children who are refugees and who are um, getting over trauma of, of their having to flee their country. And lastly, we have Jenny Molika, who is the um, Director of Learning and Strategy at the English National Opera and who worked for a long time at the Guildhall School as the Director of Creative Learning at the Guildhall and the Barbican. What we see in these projects is that they are all born out of very specific social, political, and economic contexts. And they, they also demonstrate the way in which the nature of the musician's work is changing. Um, we will also see that like the other, all the other panelists we've heard so far this morning, these projects are built on collaboration and on teamwork. And in fact, it's as much the musicians as the partners that they are working with who are instrumental in developing these projects. They are inclusive 
and they empower both the musicians and the participants. And they are, I'd say all three are really um, developing human dignity, giving dignity back to people who've been voiceless for one way or another, for one reason or another. And they're giving people a sense of community. Um, they're restoring confidence and they're helping participants reassert their place in their families and in society. Um, I have asked our panelists to talk about the ways in which their projects have evolved. It's obvious that for a project that started 10 years ago, the questions are going to be different from one that's only 12 months old. Um, in some cases, we see that research is already being done to look at how this will evolve. And in some cases, it's too soon to, to have specific answers to all the questions we, we might want to ask about what does this mean for training. But it's in every instance, um, examples of how people are adapting and are flexible and are how these organizations are asking fundamental questions about what the societal impact of an orchestra, of an opera company, or of a training program for children is, what is the societal impact in their communities? And how do they change musicians practice? So without further ado, I would like to ask Bob Riley, Chief Executive of the Manchester Camerata to um, share his video and this video will be shared from Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting us. Um, I think um, Viviana has the video to show from our end. So I'm um, at her, I'm waiting for her to press play. idea is to pair up a music therapist like myself with one of the, the orchestral musicians from the Manchester Camerata and deliver very interactive music making sessions. The music making that I've been doing with Manchester Camerata and the residents has been an absolute massive help. Um, we do our activities and the light set activities, bingo, um, reminiscence and all different things but this has just brought a whole new dimension into activities. The training that I've had and the one-to-one -one sessions that we do over Zoom has really boosted my confidence. I feel more confident now than ever and when I'm doing the sessions I'm able to pass my confidence on to the residents which is lovely to see because it's like we're growing together. So, um, I have a, a slideshow to, to whiz through um, to just to describe a little bit of the background of how we come to be doing such a programme. So the, as you can see there, the orchestra plays um, in many different places. 
Um, this man here, Gabor, has often said that music serves as spiritual medicine, and that's something we take very, very seriously. Um, as you can see at the end of that film, um, we're in a, in a monastery. You can't tell it's a monastery, but that's where it is. And it's the human qualities and the talent of our musicians that allow us to operate in very different spaces like that when we're performing. Um, we have a live programme, a digital programme, and much of it is, is led by research as well uh, with several different universities. So a big part of the orchestra's activity is about making an impact in society. Um, and of course, that's where having musicians with those extraordinary human qualities that we all know musicians have in performance, that's where that comes into play. So our community programme is where we make social impact. There are four areas, um, music and dementia, which Gretchen mentioned earlier, music in schools, projects across the generations, and increasingly, um, the dementia work is in demand um, throughout the world um, for the training qualities. So locally, um, as an organisation, we are a charity and we want to make that impact in Greater Manchester. I thought I'd share with you an individual story here. So David is in a care home in Manchester. Um, he has dementia, he would shout, cry, and it really isolates him, it isolates people. Working with us and our evaluators um, over a period of 20 weeks enabled him to be less isolated. He was happier, he could get more involved. But there's another key thing that happens there, which is that interaction the interactivity that you heard about in the video, that's a key thing to help support our musicians as well. So they're there improvising with David, but that's something that happens between two people and they both benefit. The school's programme is much the same. So it's using those very high level of human skills and musical interactivity. And this is a story I love. David um, Darren, sorry, was on the fringes of everything. He was a really naughty boy. Um, and over a period of time working with him, he kind of got control of his life, um, gained respect of his peers. So a lot of this work is led by research. Um, we have a published PhD, 2018, and in fact, this week, we begin the next PhD research on the dementia programme. There's a bigger question, which I've put at the bottom of this slide, which I think is really important, which is about the societal impact uh, across all parts of society that an orchestra can make um, in a community. One other thing that's, that's not on these slides that I just wanted to highlight is that the profound effect on our musicians um, and the development that they've experienced working in this very creative way in different parts of the community. Um, many of our musicians would actually say it's the best thing they do. And I think one of the reasons for that is that music, um, and it's certainly one of Camerata's aims, is about connecting with people emotionally. That's why it exists. That's, that, that's its kind of purpose in my view. And our musicians have simply found that in some of the community settings, particularly where dementia is concerned, where many of the normal connections that we know in everyday life are removed, like speaking uh, or movement or even sight, uh, it has this very profound effect. And so we've been supporting our musicians to develop their skills and their awarenesses in being able to do that. One of the challenges that I think the whole music sector has is that it still sees musicians as people that sit on a stage. And of course, that's part of what musicians do, but musicians have many other skills which can be deployed in other ways. And we need all to focus on developing those more. If we're going to serve our communities better, but also if we're gonna develop um, a flourishing community of musicians as well. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Bob, um, for this inspiring video and story. Um, I think that what's important to, re to remember here, and I think we'll hear it again and again, is how transformative this work is for the participants, but also for the practitioners. And I loved the story about the musicians saying that this is the best thing they do and uh, that it really nourishes their souls and, and their music making so that the musician is not just somebody who sits on the stage as you suggested earlier. So now we're going to go to uh, a very different project which was born out of the refugee crisis in 2016 in Greece. Anis Bernard, I'm giving you the floor. Thank you. Hi, much Gretchen. I'm going to try to share my screen. It should be up. Yes, so let's start. It's amazing because the kids come from like literally everywhere. I'm from Afghanistan. And it doesn't matter if they don't play perfectly. What matters to us is that when they leave, they go to other countries, and when they go into the classroom, they will have the same values, the social values that they will need in order to grow as human beings. It's, yes, it's on an artist. I mean, you can speak it, you can feel it. It uh, makes me so happy to play music. I think it reminds us all of, of what the really important things in life are. And I think also we are doing a big impact, not only on the kids, but also in the Greek community. I want to be uh, famous and uh, one day I will be. So I wanted to start first with a video for images are worth a thousand words. First, what is El Sistema Greece? It's easy, it can be summarized in five words. It's free, music, education, empowering youth. We started in 2016, as Gretchen was saying now, with a handful of children in one refugee camp, responding to three simultaneous crises. One, it was Europe's biggest refugee crisis since World War II, with an approximate 27,500 refugee children in Greece. Two, the UNICEF reports that 500,000 Greek children lived in poverty, which at 26.6% meant Greece had the third highest rate of child poverty in Europe. And last but not least, the social inclusion and the new face of Europe. Across the European continent, um, xenophobic movements were signifying a crisis of identity. How might we deliver a message of inclusion from a threat to an added value to our society? And we felt that El Sistema Greece could provide some significant and positive answers to these societal challenges. Now, in 2021, some 500 students, including at least 30 different nationalities, benefit yearly from lessons and concerts, all united under the umbrella of collective music making. 15 professionals deliver the program, thus providing economic support to talented teachers and administrative personnel in a country that suffered and continues to suffer from the economic crisis. How do we integrate the many different profiles of our students, teachers, families, and communities? Addressing the social fabric is primordial. Many students are recovering from significant trauma and are offered the opportunity to experience learning in a safe space, discovering social emotional skills, well being, openness, solidarity, intercultural dialogue, and positive experiences of sharing with others. Beyond music making, we seek to work as a team and to build community. In FINE, our goal is to build a more inclusive society, supporting vulnerable individuals and responding to societal challenges. We use classical music training, but take inspiration from many sources. These include the repertoire from the countries of origins of our students, meaning inclusion is not integration. The more, the merrier. And System Agri seeks to affirm identities, be they Greek, largely European, but also Syrian or, or Afghani. Each of these identities helps build a new intercultural community. The methods developed from wide ranging discussions with experts and have led to acknowledging the importance of psychology and legal framework, which implements safeguards and a policy of child protection. 
developing partnership with conservatoires around the world, but also with leading artists joining our students. And finally, but not least, running special projects such as the Lullaby Project in partnership with Carnegie Hall and also the Star Wars Narcos Foundation. In a nutshell, this is a social project with local and international impact. Today is an excellent example, thanks to the Fundación Batuta, bringing us together with ENO and Manchester Camerata. Let's come back to the short video. Important values and principles at El Sistema Gris include words such as grow as human beings, happy, impact towards the community, important things in life. This is more than an educational program, but rather a school of life. And our approach is a holistic one, one in which agency and empowerment constitute guiding principles. How do these keywords relate to today's themes of training for inclusion? This is definitely not an easy topic, but it is a vitally important one and can really make a difference. Coming back to the word impact, there are, have been many, many challenges and issues we have faced from the very beginning. Why begin a new organization in an already competitive field, both from the humanitarian point of view and as regards traditional conservatoire music education? We're seen as disruptive. We therefore had to make the case for our training offer being a different complementary one. And to address this issue of social inclusion, we had to expand beyond the refugee camps and offer this Anis Barna. Thank you, Anis. Thank you, Gretchen. I'm going to share my screen again. And here it is. It should work. Hopefully, yes. It's amazing because the kids come from like literally everywhere. I'm from Afghanistan. And it, do, it doesn't matter if they don't play perfectly. What matters to us is that when they leave, they go to other countries, and when they go into the classroom, they would have the same values, the social values that they would need in order to grow as human beings. It's, yes, it's own language, art is art. I mean, you cannot speak it, you can feel it. It uh, made me so happy, the music. I, I think it reminds us all of what the really important things in life are. And I think also we are doing a big impact, not only on the kids, but also in the Greek community. I want to be a uh, famous, famous and, uh, and uh, one, day one day I will be. I wanted to start with a video for images are worth a thousand words. First, what is El Sistema Gris? It's easy, it's five words. It's free, music, education, empowering youth. We started in 2016 with a handful of children in one refugee camp responding to three simultaneous crises. One, it was Europe's biggest refugee crisis since World War II with an approximate 27,500 refugee children. Second, the UNICEF reports that 500,000 Greek children live in poverty, which at 26.6% meant Greece had the third highest rate of child poverty in Europe. And last but not least, the social inclusion and the new face of Europe. Across the European continent, xenophobic movements were signifying a crisis of identity. So how might we deliver a message of inclusion from a threat to an added value to our societies? And we felt that Antisema Greece could provide some significant and positive answers to these societal challenges. Now in 2021, some 500 students, including at least 30 different nationalities, benefit yearly from lessons and concerts, all united under the umbrella of collective music making. 50 professionals deliver the program, thus providing economic support to talented teachers and administrative personnel in a country that suffered and continues to suffer from the economic crisis. How do we integrate the many different profiles of our students, teachers, families, and communities? Addressing the social fabric is primordial. Many students are recovering from significant trauma and are offered the opportunity to experience learning in a safe space, 
discovering social emotional skills, well being, openness, solidarity, intercultural dialogue, and positive experiences of sharing with others. Beyond the music making, we seek to work as a team and to build community. In Fine, our goal is to build a more inclusive society, supporting vulnerable individuals and responding to societal challenges. And we use classical music training, but take inspiration from many sources. These include the repertoire from the countries of origins of our students, meaning inclusion is not integration. The more, the merrier. And Citemagri seeks to affirm identities, be they Greek, more largely European, or Syrian, or Afghani. Each of these identities helps build a new intercultural community. The methods developed from wide-ranging discussions with experts and have led to acknowledging the importance of psychology and a legal framework which implements safeguards and a policy of child protection. Developing partnership with conservatoires around the world, we're also with leading artists joining our students. And last, running special projects such as the Lullaby Project in partnership with Carnegie Hall and the Stavros Narcos Foundation. In a nutshell, this is a social project with local and international impact. And today is an excellent example, thanks to the Foundation Batuta, bringing us together with ENO and Manchester Camerata. But let's come back to the short video. There are important values and principles at Elzitema Greece that include words such as grow as human beings, happy, impact towards the community, important things in life, this is more than an educational program, but rather a school for life. Our approach is a holistic one, one in which agency and empowerment constitute guiding principles. So how do these keywords relate to today's theme of training for inclusion? This is not an easy topic, but it is a vitally important one and can really make a difference. Coming back to the word impact, there have been many challenges and issues we have faced from the very beginning. Why begin a new organization in an already competitive field, both from the humanitarian point of view and as regards traditional conservatoire music education? We're seen as disruptive. We therefore had to make the case for our training offer being a different complementary one. And to address the issue of social inclusion, we had to expand beyond the refugee camps and offer the same educational program to the second and third generation migrants, as well as the Greeks, unable to afford conservatoire training or who, was, or who simply appreciated the social dimension of our offering. Having embraced a multicultural approach through a program for all youth in Greece, we could then tackle our second biggest challenge, the role and impact of musicians teachers in the program. Teaching at El Sistema Greece is not like teaching in a conservatoire. There is an intrinsic need for flexibility and adaptability, especially in refugee camps where we know there will be a steady influx of children, though we have no idea how long they will stay. Each lesson must be self-contained so that the child not only enjoys the lesson, but also leaves the classroom uplifted. And the organization of each lesson is particular in that we have some goals, but the journey is always very open to creativity. There is no single template and there is ample room for inventiveness and innovation. We also believe in interdisciplinarity and we open the doors of our classes to our artists, be they musicians or not. These artists without borders include magicians, musicians, clowns to name but a few. We are learning by doing and improving constantly. And because we have received so much help and have benefited from so many ideas, we have become in turn an international reference and we now give advice and support many projects around the world. But once again, there is no magic recipe. We are not shy about sharing our mistakes so that others can avoid making the same errors. Our teaching DNA is one of both inclusion and artistic excellence. This has become our motto, a way of life for our teachers, our administration, our families, and of course, our children. What is important is to build bridges, to cherish human dignity, to maintain a positive attitude by respecting one another, working hard to achieve these goals. We have expanded the societal role of musicians, 
for they are both music teachers and behavioral models for the children. And I would like to highlight the values that make training for inclusion a success. Respect, tolerance, reinforcement of self-esteem, confidence, solidarity, and of course, teamwork. As with all I have shared with you, we see the transformative power of music and more broadly, the arts. And I'm more and more convinced that music can open new possibilities by being a universal passport and an effective medium to build bridges across communities. Thus, making this world a little bit more connected, human, and joyful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anis, um, for this very inspiring presentation and story. And I think that we see many of these themes that keep coming back about transformation, about flexibility, adaptability, inclusion, but also excellence, and how um, these are transforming people's lives, both the participants and the musicians who are teaching. So without further ado, I would like to ask Jenny Malika to make her presentation about English National Opera's Breathe Project. Jenny. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I'd just like to start by uh, just beginning with a little bit of music. And I think um, Viviana from the team here is going to share screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana. So um, that was um, Evening Prayer, which is a lullaby from the opera Hansel and Gretel. And that was performed by the ENO um, Singers and uh, Orchestra exclusively for participants on the ENO Breathe programme. And whether or not you've heard that lullaby before, I think we all recognise that the, the power and universality of lullabies is undeniable. So it's instinctive for us as parents to sing to our children. And in fact, lullabies were deemed so important that they were documented as far back as some 4,000 years ago by the Babylonians. And I wanted to start with that because music and specifically lullabies 
play an, a central role in the ENO Breathe programme, which is an integrated programme of singing, breathing and well-being that we developed at the ENO in partnership with Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, with the aim of providing crucial support for people recovering from COVID-19. And over the course of the six week online program, we mirror the techniques used in the training of opera singers to support people to self-manage symptoms of breathlessness and the associated anxiety. And crucially, we learn lullabies together and we learn lullabies from around the world as well as lullabies from opera. And by using lullabies, participants learn memorable techniques to help them focus constructively on their breathing in a musically soothing environment. And traditional lullabies tend to sit very comfortably in non-specialist singers' vocal ranges, and that makes them by their nature very accessible to all, and a really appropriate choice for a group of people that feel very ambivalent about singing, and sometimes very anxious about their physiological capability. And around that six week online program, we deliver, a, we have an online participant hub that contains a range of digital assets from playlists to breathing exercises that support participants to extend and deepen their practice on the programme outside the online sessions themselves. So just going back to the roots of ENO Breathe, when I joined um, the ENO uh, last June, it was mid pandemic. And as has been the case for so many arts organisations, COVID has been a time that's really invited the ENO to think quite existentially about its mission and purpose and its role beyond the stage. And at ENO, we have a long standing history of working in the community and outside the walls of our home, the London Coliseum. And this work beyond the stage is in our DNA. It's right there in our socially driven roots from our founder, Lillian Bayliss, who fundamentally believed that opera was for everyone. And I suppose in my role, what we're very interested in doing in our learning and participation programme is continually revisiting those socially driven roots. And in so doing, reimagining what our social and civic purpose means as an arts organisation today. And that's about inviting us to think about new ways that we connect opera and the ENO with people and communities, both locally, nationally and internationally, in ways that are relevant and that are meaningful and matter to them. And it was at that same time last June that we were consulting with doctors and medics in the field of health and social prescribing around the role that ENO could play in, within the context of the pandemic, that the idea for ENO Breathe came about. At that same time, there was a, a growing understanding that long COVID was becoming a very prevalent problem in the UK, specifically those symptoms of breathlessness and associated anxiety that people were still experiencing some 12 weeks um, post COVID. And fairly quickly, we had a hypothesis that as a company, as an opera company, we might have the skills and expertise to offer a useful solution to that problem. After all, working with breath and finding emotional connection are at the heart of opera. So we set about to design a non-clinical, non-medical pathway for people suffering with those long COVID symptoms and began discussions with, our, with the respiratory team at Imperial College NHS Trust. And I think it's very important to say that crucially, I am only one part of the story here today because ENO Breathe is fundamental, the, the genesis and growth of ENO Breathe is one that's a deep rooted triangular collaboration between an arts organization, the ENO, a healthcare trust, the Imperial College, and the patient. It's been co-designed and co-developed using the learning and vocal expertise of the ENO, the expertise of respiratory physios at Imperial, and the patients themselves who continually shape its development through their consultation and feedback. So that multidisciplinary collaboration is key and intrinsic to the program, has been intrinsic to the program's development from the start. And as we grow the team, we've also developed a steering group who advise us on the program, which broadens the expertise out into autonomic specialists, health psychologists, and um, ear, nose and throat specialists as well. Um, so that multidisciplinary collaboration is key. And we have developed for um, musicians running the sessions with us, 
um, a multidisciplinary induction and training methodology to really support them in how they deliver and run the program. And when we work with people who are joining the program, we're, we're working with singing specialists who have experience at working with um, working in a wide, wide range of participatory settings and in applied contexts. And importantly, in many cases, have extensive experience of working with people who have never sung before and have no interest in singing. And that's really important because ENO Breathe is not a singing group or a choir. People don't come on to ENO Breathe because they want to learn to sing. They come on to ENO Breathe because they want to get better. And in many, in many instances, they've been desperately seeking help for quite some time. And that's a very different skill set that the musician has to bring into the room. Currently, the programme reaching, has reached 650 patients. That includes people who are either um, have completed it, are currently on the programme or being referred. And we're working with over 50 health trusts across England with the aim of getting people back to wellness more quickly and accelerating their recovery post-COVID. Post and we have um, an, an aim in this current uh, phase to work with up to 2,000 patients in England by summer 2022. And importantly, when people join ENO Breathe, we no longer refer to them as patients, but as participants, because ENO Breathe is about demedicalizing well-being. And when people take part in arts on, in culture and, and arts and culture on social prescription, a fundamental difference is that we are speaking to the whole person, to the health in them, not to the pathology. And it's our hypothesis that this human centered focus has been a major a factor in this strong evaluation data and good attendance that we've had on the programme. In terms of evaluating the programme, we use um, validated metrics from within the National Health Service in England and patients complete self-assessments pre and post programme, as well as participating in patient focus groups. And 86% of people who've taken part in the programme so far report improvements in, our, um, in reductions in their anxiety, 81% in, report improvements in managing their breathlessness and 90% of those who've taken part report improvements in their general well-being. And we've just com completed a randomised control research trial with the research team at Imperial College Healthcare, which we are hoping will enable us to continue to build the evidence base. And really importantly, 100% of people who've taken part in the programme have said that they continue to use the tools and techniques from ENO Breathe in their daily lives Three, three months and beyond on the programme. And this is really key because it's about putting the participant in the driving seat. Because when we, when we don't necessarily, when we haven't necessarily thought about how we breathe, um, that can be a very, very frightening thing. And it can be hard to then get back to normal with that. So it's very much about empowering the patient with the tools for self-management. And finally, another key thing that I just wanted to touch on before I finish is that we've had a huge amount of feedback from participants in the focus groups about the sense of connection that the, the group brings. I think there's something about the sharing a space with people that have been through a, the same common experience as you that is incredibly powerful. And many of the patients that we're seeing on the programme have been experiencing their long COVID symptoms for some time. So we're still dealing with a, a backlog of people that have been on a waiting list since last February or March in England. And um, many of them feel very like they've been on, they don't feel that they've been seen or heard and it's massively affected their confidence. And what we, what we found is that by being in a space where, you're, where you, other people understand what you've been going through normalizes those things. Finally, the, fi the final thing to touch on is that 40% of people who've taken part in ENO Breathe have converted onto a post-programme singing group. And what we're tracking there is some real shifts in perception and attitude around singing and music and taking part in music. So our next phase for ENO Breathe is really about thinking about the change and impact that this can have on the ongoing training and development of, of musicians. And as Gretchen said at the beginning, we're now moving into that phase where we can start to really think about how this can have a wider impact and the training that we, we've been developing, developing can be shared more broadly. I just wanted, if we have time, Gretchen, we have another film to show, but if you think we're a bit short for time, we can leave it there. Um, I think it would be great for you to share that. And I would just suggest that this be our final um, statement as a group. And I just wanna thank you all um, I think that we see that there are threads that keep coming back about transformation, about restoring confidence and dignity. 
and about creating community in magical and wonderful ways and, and in which music is a tool for doing so. And it changes <clears throat> the meaning of what it means to be a musician and people's relationship to music making and music participating. So let's hear this final um, video. And with that, I will thank my panelists and um, look forward to hearing more about each of these projects in the years ahead. Thank you. I thought it would be all about singing, um, but that's not what it was. Uh, it, it's a fantastic tool. It's given me my confidence back and um, seeing uh, Susie every week is like a breath of fresh air. Initially, obviously you didn't know what to expect. It's amazing how you suddenly realize that you're not alone and that there are others out there who are going through exactly the same as yourself, which was nice, it was very, very reassuring. The moment I joined, I felt an instant camaraderie with my fellow sufferers, uh, and the way that it's constructed allows you, as the patient, to get involved, but without pushing you into a corner to make you feel like you have to, have to do this. It's simple exercises like lullabies, which you don't even need to know the lyrics to it. You don't have to speak English for it. So everyone is actually included. They've thought of everything. I now have the confidence to go away and quietly do those uh, various singing exercises and the breathing exercises on my own, which for my personal long-term health can only be a good thing. You become fully aware of your breathing. You become fully mindful of what's going on around you. And it has the, uh, the ability to you know, to, to, to put you at peace. It's been absolutely fantastic. I would recommend it to anyone who is suffering the way some of uh, COVID, post-COVID patients are suffering. My breathing becomes better as a result of the exercises that we undertake. This felt personal and this is exactly what I needed. I look forward to every, every session that we have. Staggering results, you know, I do feel the improvement, you know, week on week. It's an excellent tool and I would definitely recommend it being rolled out to the rest of the country, 100%. Bob Riley, thank you, Anis Barnard, for these inspiring stories about transformation and community and music. And music sits at the heart of it all. And we're grateful to you and to our audience. Thank you. After this fantastic panel, Maria Claudia, we will now continue with a second international seminar on music and social transformation being transmitted from Tolima University here in Colombia. And so this has been organized hand in hand with Fundación Nacional Batuta, as well as the City Hall of Ibagué. This is a hybrid event which has enabled us to come to very important insights as to the transformative power of music in the contemporary world. Thanks to this a very broad agenda that has more than 80 international experts from more than 24 countries around the world participating. We have examined some of the new ways of teaching music, and we've also learned from practical experiences about some valuable innovation and inclusiveness exercises that are being carried out in the world. We will now have a panel with Santiago Trujillo, who will be telling us about the diversity 
of being an artist and working in the musical community here in Colombia. Santiago Trujillo is a cultural manager as well as a musician and audiovisual editor. He produces film and television programs. He has a master's in AV technologies and also works in film direction and graduated from the Jorge Tadeo Lozano University in Bogota. So we will be hearing more from our participants. It's great to hear the details about seminar content as well as the bios of all of our participants. You can download all of this information about our guests at our webs website, www.simts.co. Claudia, before we hand over to our guests and to this next panel, I would like to remind you all that once this panel comes to an end, you will then be able to enjoy our first musical ritual. It will be an ancestral medicine um, event. It will be carried out by Asel Cuesta. He's from the Cauca Department of Colombia, which is located in the southwest of Colombia. He studied at the University of Cauca as well as in Cuba and the United States. He's an active member of the NASA community, which is one of the most populous indigenous groups in Colombia. He has carried out arduous work dedicated to rescuing and interpreting songs in Nasa Yue, which is his ancestral language. So he will be carrying out an event today to show the importance of these indigenous communities and their traditions. This will be held at 2.55 this afternoon, but it is now an honor to have Santiago Trujillo here in the musical capital of Colombia, Ibagué. Welcome, and let me now hand over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I would like to thank Maria Claudia and Batuta, of course, as well as the City Hall of Ibagué. It is an absolute honor to be part of this space for reflections and insights. And it is an even greater pleasure to do this next to these three very important panelists who have come here to generously share their musical experience and their experience in doing this absolutely inspiring work of expressing themselves through music. I'd also like to recognize Batuta. When I was a teenager some 30 years ago, I was an active participant in the first sessions of this emblematic project. I remember that in Plaza Bolivar, we had some very famous musicians, for example, Andres Orozco, playing there in the plaza in this nascent stage of this project that has transformed Colombia and touched the heart of so many people in this country. So I would just like to add my voice to everybody else's who is celebrating 30 years of work being done with the music and in our local communities in different regions of the country, this excellent work being done by Batuta. Before we hear about these fantastic experiences that are represented here today, I would like to say that I personally see enormous value in what's being done, not only thanks to the quality of the music that is produced and the processes that are carried out, but also because of this wager, this confidence being put in music, you know, to get people moving their bodies and opening their minds. We can see also how music heals. It helps you also strengthen communities and territorial areas. It strengthens the way that we understand music and perform it. It also gives us a way to recover this material heritage. So I think we have some excellent experiences to be shared. So we are all recovering from the pandemic and we are of course recovering from a difficult situation. It's truly inspiring therefore to see this great leadership and these leaders sitting next to me here on the stage who have led these projects and excellent groups. This is truly meaningful for our country and from our country to the world. These are difficult times in the first quarter of the of the pandemic. Some 40% of cultural sector jobs were lost. Here in Colombia, only 0.17% of our national budget is actually invested in cultural exercises. And more than half of our municipalities have not had any investment made in cultural infrastructure by the Ministry of Culture and more than 40% of our municipalities have deficient cultural management when it comes to carrying out cultural projects. 63% of municipalities in Colombia, especially those in categories four, five, and six, where you come from, 
do not have any diagnostic baselines that would enable the construction of truly informed cultural policies. We have many carnivals and different celebrations held in Colombia. However, we only have official support for 8% of these cultural events. 18% of these resources are used. And many times the support is only 40, 50,000 pesos. So, in spaces where we should be supporting cultural policy here in Colombia, the first response is to not have any support whatsoever. So when you, from your territorial areas, from your municipalities, show that with support from civil society and through perseverance and community leadership work, it is possible to move forward with cultural projects that's truly a source of pride. Let me quickly introduce you. From Guatapé, Antioquia, which is a truly beautiful municipality with great heritage and enormous cultural force, we are joined by Frank Zuluaga, he is a consultant from the Department of Culture and also works in cultural training in Guatapé. He works with many musical groups and the symphonic orchestra. In this municipality that has one of the most interesting cultural development models in Antioquia, he's also qualified in music and cultural management. We are also joined by Lucas Savoya, the great maestro of maestros. He plays traditional music here in Colombia. He's also an inspiration for classical musicians. He's perhaps the person who reinvented the playing of the tipio, which is an emblematic instrument. He's also a fantastic composer. His works are being played by the Philharmonic Orchestra of Bogota, as well as the Symphony Orchestra of Medellin. His works have also been played in London and Paris. He also plays in an incredible group, Trio Palos y Cuerdas. He'll be telling us about them later on. And we now round out our panel with Livia Susana Sinisterra. She's from Guapi in the Calca region of Colombia. She has a project that is coordinated to put together all of the cultures that are run along this river. She works in research and also plays in a fantastic group in one of the most rich musical traditions in our country. Before I hand over to you, uh, well, we've just been saying that singing heals, that singing helps us to breathe. So we are breathing the air of renewal. So, Livia, let's start with you. Let's do it in the way that magical musicians always print themselves through your music. We will have a short presentation from each panelist of approximately seven minutes and if we have audience questions please get them together and then we can hear from you Livia please tell us who are you thank you very much to everybody thank you to everybody who has made this an event this event happen thank you very much I'm here all the way from the Guapi River in Cauca while music heals, it also is transformative and it also is a place for reflection. I would like to start with a song that we produced on our second disc called Yora or Cry. The land cries. Please listen now to this short song. Llora la tierra, llora el planeta, llora, llora de desilusión, llora la tierra, llora el planeta, llora, llora de desilusión. Grita el hombre porque pronto no hallará donde vivir, la tierra que Dios nos dio no la supimos cuidar, llora, llora. Llora, llora de desilusión. El mar no produce peces, abusaba el pescador. Con la changa ellos mataban al pequeño camarón. Llora, llora, llora de desilusión. Llora la tierra, llora el planeta. Llora, llora de desilusión. This is a song that invites us to reflect. This is a song that brings together the experiences that we are living through in our territories, the exploitation of many 
different aspects of it, nature, the lack of awareness. We are not clear on how to care for Mother Earth. We don't care for our children. We do not care for what God has given us for our daily sustenance. We have to care for our lands, for our territories. We have been the most affected by different forms of abuse. So this is a reflection. This is a song that invites us to raise awareness and say, no more, let's take care of what we have because very soon we are not going to have a home to live in. To live in. Who, anyone who does not take care of what they are given will have to beg. Okay, tell us a little more about Semblazas de Rio Guapi. Tell us about this beautiful area in Cauca, Colombia. Tell us about your group that works on research. It's also a school, no? You participate in the Petro Alvarez Festival and you have also won awards. You've also played the marimba. Tell us about this extraordinary group, Semblanzas de Rio Guapi. Guapi. Semblanzas de Rio Guapi is a group of young people. We started as a musical group in 2009. We were very young. We were actually underage. And music really lives within us because this is something that's passed on from generation to generation. When the 11 of us came together, because there are 11 members of the group, we were still at high school. So we came up with this musical dialogue. We wanted to create this group not only for us to have fun, since we were very young, we had been taught that music really brings joy to your heart. Music is a way that you can find yourself once again. We've been taught always that music is a way to live peacefully and with health on our land. So the group came out of the need to create a formal group called Semblanzas de Rio Guapi. This is a beautiful name because it brings together a cultural diversity. Despite the fact that we are all from the Guapi municipality, the, we are four female singers in the group and there are two women who live in the hamlet of Limones and I'm from Del Carmelo. Jessica is from San Antonio de Guaji and so on and so forth. So despite the fact that we are all from the same municipality, we do have great musical diversity because perhaps we use different intonation, we have different pronunciation of certain words and that obviously brings great richness to our group, Semblanzas. When we played at the Petronio Alvarez Festival for the first time in 2014, we were lucky enough to win second prize. The next year, 2015, we performed once again and we won first place. And that was when we decided, when we had to ask ourselves, what will we do with this money that we've won? How will we make a contribution to our territory? Sometimes, due to family difficulties, we have not received tertiary education, but the money that we had won would not be sufficient for us to take university costs or tertiary costs. So that's when we saw the need to invest this money in buying instruments for ourselves and to buy instruments to set up a school. We set up our own school. The initiative started in Limones, which is a very small town, a hamlet in Guapi, and where we needed to raise awareness of cultural projects. Why? Because Limones is a hamlet which has been extremely impacted by our armed conflict and displacement. 
we were really starting to see disintegration of our social fabric. So we started to research with our elders and that's how the group came to be. And so this is what we have in mind and this is what we want to do with our project. So great, this is a school, it's a community project and it is also brought together by the ancestral knowledge that exists along the Guapi River. This is very powerful in your territorial area. We will watch now a very short video so that you can see what's going on in Guapi so we can feel the power of it. O una cultura o cuando un sabedor dentro de una comunidad se muere y no ha sido replicado sus conocimientos, se va a la tierra y hasta allí fue. Me parece muy importante que mi niña asista a la escuela porque es bueno que maneje en sus tiempos libres algo que le quede para su vida, para el quehacer de su vida, para que aprenda de parte de su tradición. Eso le ayuda a ella desde pequeña a ir empoderándose de todas las cosas y las vivencias que hemos tenido de generación en generación. Hola, yo me llamo Javier Renante Ruiz y tengo nueve años y lo que más me gusta de la escuela son bailar, tocar, whatsapp, y canto. Asisto a la escuela dos, dos días a la semana y no me gusta perderme la escuela. La canción que más me gusta es En el fondo del mar. En el fondo del mar. Ay, navega un peine. En el fondo del mar. Ay, navega un peine. En los brazos de María. El niño se duerme en los brazos de María, el niño se duerme. Las escuelas de cultura tienen una importancia porque a través de ella se le da vida a lo que nuestros ancestros y ancestras tuvieron como elementos importantes. Eh, a través de las escuelas de música se permite la supervivencia en el tiempo de las culturas. Además es un espacio de protección para la niñez, la adolescencia y la juventud, ya que en estos momentos hay mucho... The interpreter apologizes. Audio has been lost. Wow, that's fantastic to see all these happy children experiencing music. We'll come back to you later, Lidia. I'd now like to hand over to Frank Zuluaga, joining us from Guatapé, Antioquia. I don't know who knows Guatapé. If you haven't been, I would recommend that you visit it. It's one of the most beautiful places to visit in Antioquia. If you go to Medellín, Medellín and fail to visit Guatapé, you miss out on really connecting with the territory through this Antioquian culture. Frank, tell us about your experience with your art school in Guatapé and the different musical projects that you lead there, of course. Thank you very much. I think that you can never express sufficient gratitude for Fundación Batuta or Ibagué for these spaces and events where we can share our knowledge and experiences. Thank you, Santiago and my friends here on the panel. I think what we do in Guatapé is basically we have an artistic training center. So that is essentially what we set out to do in the territory. This is a public project because it is a public project, which is run for the community and with public resources. We also have to think about people who are close to the sector. We are aware of the difficulty of carrying out continuous projects. And so we need to make sure that these projects don't die due to a lack of planning. And so what I'd like to talk about is the National Cultural Plan. We also have the Departmental Cultural Plan and also a Medellin-based plan for culture. We also have an action path for our strategic vision. There are important elements here. The Guatapé Cultural Plan is also being designed. And so all of these elements um, well, were included as cultural managers, but also as promoters of music in the region.
and we have to make sure that the pedagogical and training and artistic elements that included as well as music also are included in these processes so that's a first um, idea of what we're involved in secondly we have to look at culture and so we also look at multi-dimensionality and we look at participatory projects we want to carry out a social project for transformation we want to see a cultural transformation here we also need to look at tourism tourism in guatape as you just said santiago is something essential and the main aim of tourism is of course economic development in the territory so that's led us to or we ask ourselves constantly due to our identity as we are constantly receiving visitors from different parts of the world with different visions and they're coming to our territory we want to of course showcase our tra traditions we want to conserve them and find different cultural traditions in music and we need to of course ensure that they can be preserved and we need to do this through research and creative work and then in the last place artistic training as such and of the resources that we administrate within source now i mean not just economic resources because we as cultural managers and as musicians and artists we uh, impulse within communities a number of things there are different resources to money and participation uh, it's about coexisting we boost uh, sensibility and creativity and we feel and imagine and to take joy to people and that is my function as a musician and in the sense of planning and uh, all the projects that we have we will promote these resources uh, within culture frank thank you in your music schools you have introduced a number of innovative formats to integrate new publics and audiences and uh include children in different generations why don't you share with us a little bit about these new formats with the band and the music groups that you direct indeed this process uh, has yielded beautiful fruit for community because um we have uh, uh, move, we're moving forward to that uh, social transformation that we imagine the significant experiences we've had to share. We could, for example, mention uh, the research on heritage, and we found a number of relations with antique documents in archives and uh, uh, sheet music and the relationship with uh, the elders. And so we uh, found a project that uh, gave us the option to uh, do different projects with these sorts of populations because we're recovering the sound of the municipality since the 60s and 70s. For anyone that doesn't know, there was a great flood in Guatape. Uh, it was not like that originally and that change the soundscape uh, because we went from uh, riding horses for example in the 60s and 70s mainly in the, among rural communities we uh, started to move around in canoes and boats and that's that was quite strange and that generated among us a, a certain soundscape and that is reflected in some religious celebrations in the municipality and we're recovering that so that is one significant experience where we um, involve uh, these concerts for the elders second example is in music is that we are a, a center in artistic training in general but we also have um, theater and visual arts and dance and what we do is uh, that at the end of each process we uh, do presentations that involves all these different areas with uh, together with the heritage research there's a, a video on YouTube that you can uh, look up about Guatape the territory of a lost cacique that's the name and it is a reflection a fictionalized version of our foundation myth so uh, we love these exercises um, in art now intergenerational relationships another element that we should uh share we uh have a relationship with uh, the elder uh, care center and we go and visit them with our art groups they're young people 
uh, that are learning anime and manga, they go and talk to these elders and they tell their stories. And so the kids uh, capture in manga drawings their stories and create uh, those relationships. And they transform these stories to take them to a new audience. And that is a very significant thing. And we intervene for music also, so we uh, make music during our encounters. And another experience that has been fundamental for us is our work in rural areas. How do we go to these areas? And through our allied partners like the mayor's office, we can reach uh, the, these rural areas and establish channels for communication and talent administration for these kids. There are terribly, terribly talented. And so we facilitate uh, that uh, articulation, for example, to create choirs that we're right doing just with uh, rural uh, uh, groups. So yeah, thank you, Frank. So Guatape is very prolific in the arts and music. It was flooded years ago to make a dam. And so they're working on recovering the artistic uh, heritage now let's welcome Lucas Hawoya. He's member of an emblematic group of traditional Colombian music, Palos y Cuerdas. He is also a composer and a leader of different music groups and different creative places, not just in Colombia, but also abroad. Uh, I remember uh, that collaboration with Alexis Cardenas that um, I revisit every now and then, and I do celebrate it because I do love it. And that great violinist, you have collaborated with a number of artists, uh, both national and international. So tell us a little bit about uh, that family as a, as a creative core. And then what about reinventing the sounds of traditional instruments? And third, how can you um, have a dialogue between different schools of thoughts in such consolidated music projects as uh, the results that the Sawoya brothers have reached, uh, which I highly recommend on YouTube, Spotify, different uh, platforms. Palos y Cuerdas. So, Lucas, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Greetings, everyone. And thank you for allowing me to share this beautiful space. It is very significant for me personally to be here, and it is a privilege. And it's also a way to acknowledge the work that we have developed in the music and cultural sector. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the organizers as well. Well, I'm Lucas Hawoya. I come from the city of Tunja, and I have two brothers, a twin brother, Daniel, and another brother, an elder brother, Diego. And for the last 26 years, we've had a string trio from the Andean region, which is the bandola, the tiple, and the guitarra. And uh, uh, this music uh, has been uh, developed over about a century, and it's traditional Colombian music, and it dialogues with other traditions as well from the world. And of course, uh, we are family. And so uh, this group, and we share this love for Colombian music and our typical instruments in our family. Since we were children, we had uh, uh, a bit of uh, double training in a certain way because um, we attended a conservatoire, a very significant uh, conservatoire in Tunja that offers very rigorous and traditional classical training. And it permeated the whole city all the families in the city of Tunja, and it was very important, and it still is, in training musicians around Colombia, but with this perspective. And at the same time, uh, since we were children, we got to know this music and the instrument of Colombian music. So those were like two parallel paths that we trod along and that generated a number of doubts on both sides. And so it is a bit of a conflict in terms of what it means the music that we saw in school and the music that we played on our traditional instruments. At that time, the school did not allow for a dialogue and there was no space for traditional instruments. So we had this double sort of training at home and 
uh, at school at home, it was the traditional instruments, and that that we developed this our love for this music. Uh, uh, that we started with the voice to it, and then we went on for the three string instruments and the typical trio. And so we're two twins and our elder brother. We had um, a parallel education in all senses, so the group became a sort of lab for us to experiment on what we learned on both sides. And these particular circumstances allowed us to reach this moment 26 years after working with the typical Andean trio, uh, combining the academic and the popular and tradition and classical training. And thanks to our contemporaneity, we all share the same. We've had uh, parallel education and we've developed diverse projects. It's nine records you have published, right? You've worked with Naxos and very well-renowned labels. I've, I know a number of these and your proposal is quite avant-garde. Now, how to dialogue, uh, how to create this dialogue between tradition and the reinvention of these formats, but render it in a classical format because in the end, you have toured the world with your music. So what is that artistic surge and what is happening right now? Yes, I must recognize that we are part of a long tradition of Colombian music. Fortunately, we are members of this tradition and it's ongoing, not just in the arts, because a country like Colombia always evolves. We build a tradition, in this case it's music, but yes, it is a, a great fortune. So yeah, before us, there were tons of trios and composers and interpreters that built the bases and we uh, uh, just got on board and we fell in love with that search and we move forward with this search. And so we know the whole traditional language of the Andean trio and the different uh, formats and the vocal language, the typical quartets, the studiantinas, and at the same time, due to our musical interests and artistic interests, we have searched different places that have informed our new music, uh, for example, academic music, classical music, but we have also looked and fell in love with tango, for example, from Argentina, or the music from Brazil. And so these traditions have informed our music and permeated our music, and we have just um, shown a language that is, in a certain way, a melange of uh, our loves and music. We do not intend to renovate, but it's just a, a, a natural process in, in a constant dialogue. We have shared with musicians from other traditions and other languages, and that has been fundamental in both senses for our music. To be strict, we need to be strict uh, with ourselves as interpreters and creators and administrators, but also for the musician, it's been very important to get to know this tradition that is so important in Colombia. Now, I want to ask the three of you something. Uh, now, uh, it's related to the topic of the seminar, and it's how to reach social and community transformation? How does your work apply to society? What is indispensable in your music? Not just because it has to be listened to, but when it's listened to, it transforms something. When it's made and produced and created, it transforms communities. And uh, this precisely because uh, the idea of, that Lucas mentioned is that sometimes a society that uh, throws out traditions and the new generations have uh, a, a lesser contact to that, those ancestral musics, how to keep them, how to preserve them. And this preservation turns out to be transformative. And it's very important 
but apart from that idea that Lucas mentioned, I would like to ask the three of you, what about your music has a transformative power? Who and how? If you had to build a narrative on that, what would you share with this auditorium that uh, accompanies us this morning, not just in EUAG, but also virtually and on social networks? Frank, what do you transform when you teach, when you play, when you go on stage with your music? It's a direct transformation in a way that the relationship of what we do is conditioned by the community and by the people that we reach. So it's pedagogical action and that is transformation. There's another important element. And it's that in music, it's not just entertainment for us. Music for us goes beyond that. So if, you, if we are an artistic and musical institution, we have to go beyond and uh, take those values to the community. So yeah, we need to have uh, support, but we want to highlight that being and that transformation, what happens in the mind of a, of a young child when they express their feelings for their territory, what they're doing and knowing that their actions have a, a logic within a certain perspective and the develop of what we pursue musically and artistically. So that transformation happens right there. And then there's leadership within these processes. So those leaderships take the possibility to renew the ideas and the forms. And that is also a transformative element. Indeed, music promotes leadership and creativity. And I love that statement because it is very true. Um, sometimes musicians say, uh, every time we feel we're being unjust with someone or, but yes, in any case, I'm very sure that music creates leadership, very powerful leadership. We have seen that in the social mobilizations in Colombia in the last few months. Uh, a number of supporters of these demonstrations were musicians. I also saw, you know, I, I don't really like reggaeton, and this is not a statement in favor of reggaeton, but it was important to see the role of reggaetoneros in Puerto Rico uh, a few years ago. In all social mobilization, when there's social indignation, the leadership is assumed by musicians and they take a main role. So yeah, that is a, a, a lesson. Uh, musicians are uh, trained to be interpreters, but they're also citizens and transformers of society. Livia, what's your outlook? I believe that in our territories, music does transform lives. I say this because, yes, in spite that we have been victims of a number of conflicts through music, we have been able to win children over from war in favor of peace. And that is a deep social transformation. That is a way to look at these children and youngsters, even adults uh, who are vulnerable, and make them have a different perspective and a different look on the fact that music has an impact on them and improves their life conditions. It's also worth mentioning uh, in our activity that we have currently an initiative for transformation. And we want to go beyond just music and we want to preserve wildlife. To build our drums, our kununos, we have to sacrifice animals. So we're also working and transforming music and having a different outlook, which is appropriating new resources and recycled resources like plastic bottles. And so together with the children, we have workshops to produce our own instruments so that in the future, uh, we can save these animals and transform music from another perspective. This is just beautiful, Livia. 
Well, the applause is just to show that, yes, and rescuing children from war, music to respect uh, nature and celebrate territory and identity. Lucas, we have very short time left. We're very happy, but yeah, we have a short time left. So please do share. Yes, I believe that my music transforms in different levels. I think that musicians, like everyone, they just uh, have, uh, particularly on their aesthetic work, they all have a political position, like uh, from the concerts or from the groups or from a music school, any cultural process. There is a deep political vein, and I think that is fundamental. So yeah, it may be at a lesser extent because of our former time, the tradition and the music or the festivals that we attend uh, and we can go to a broader spectrum. But yes, of course, there's always uh, a, a, an influence of politics deep down. And so when we are legitimate and true to ourselves, we have a very deep uh, long term uh, effect in trans uh, transformation. For example, when I started studying Tiple because I couldn't study Tiple in a professional uh, program or setting. I studied music at the Conservatoire of the National University. That was the one I wanted to attend, but I could not study Tiple because there was, there was not the option. Still today, there is no a, a Tiple program, but with time and with our work and the, our shared work with other people, there are um, MA programs at the Javeriana University, where you teach as well, right? Yes, 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 I was a professor there. And also at El Bosque University, there are postgraduate programs in Colombian traditional music. I just want to mention this as an example of what happens 20 or 30 years after certain processes that were initiated initially and that uh, changed the social panorama of our country. It's also good to think about our mental transformation from a traditional Occidental discourse, what is understood as traditional knowledge, how to dialogue uh, with traditional knowledges, how to integrate and move from colonialism to repropose how we are citizens. It's a sort of epistemological justice like the Sosa mentioned and that acquires a relevance when we talk about music for transformation and when those music are inhabited within the ter territories. So yes, yes, we have short time but uh, we know all musicians we know that we can tell our whole life in one song but 45 minutes was a, a long time to share this thoughts and have this conversation. Thank you very much, Lucas, Livia, Frank. Thank you all very much for your participation. Or recreate. Um, so we are not playing in concert halls. You see in this picture playing us outside. Uh, we play a lot of out, uh, in outside venues, but never in concert halls or almost never in concert halls. Most of the time we play in places with music does come normally. Um, well, well, we exist now for 51 years already. Um, normally we reach around 24,000 uh, people a year. Uh, we do three tours a year. So during the year, there is no orchestra. We start rehearsing for a tour. We rehearse for five days of 11 hours, six days sometimes. And then we start touring around. We do this three times a year. And in these three tours, we do 120 concerts and we reach that average by doing four, between four and eight concerts a day. We're driving around in a bus, we jump out of the bus, we build up this, the, the stage, which is no stage, uh, in three minutes and we play. 70% of our uh, concerts are in social institutions like uh, Ms. Duraj said earlier. And um, this is a small movie to give you an impression what Ricciotti does.
Well, now you have a, a little impression about it. Um, the organization is as follows. We have 43 positions. Um, they're all, uh, most of them are students. Uh, they're between 18 years old, that's the youngest, and 31. And they're uh, students in music, but also other students that play very well. And uh, the strength of the orchestra is the combination of these young professionals, uh, wannabe professionals, becoming professionals, and professionals in other disciplines than music. Uh, there is one conductor at the moment, me in the movie you see, you saw my predecessors. Um, five staff members, uh, tour manager, PR manager, I have an assistant, uh, etc. Um, and we have a team of freelancers, photographer, uh, notary, etc., and uh, volunteers to help us organizing all these concerts and venues. Um, the most important thing for us is the audience approach. What I told you earlier, the location. So we never play in concert halls, almost never. Um, we play in re really weird situations like you saw in the movie, in the small movie I just presented, um, outside a lot, in hospitals, in prisons, in when we go abroad, once a year we go abroad, we go to other countries. Um, we've been a couple of times in South America actually. Uh, we go to uh, refugee camps and all, all kinds of situations where people need the music the most. Um, next special thing is the program. A, a normal Ricciotti program consists of 35 different pieces and they never know which piece we're going to play. Um, and uh, it's classical music, pop, jazz, Latin, uh, hip hop, uh, folk music, everything you can think of, we make arrangements for the orchestra with the soloist. We always travel with a soloist, and that can be a singer or an instrumentalist or whatever. Um, I think in Europe, we are the only orchestra that plays all genres. And uh, we have to be honest, we are in no genre, the best orchestra, of course, but I think we are quite good in playing everything. And the goal is, all pieces are short. The longest piece is eight minutes sometimes nine, most pieces are four or five minutes, and we program them uh, around the theme. And the, the, the theme is not musical mostly. Um, and then when we play a concert, there is always something recognizable for the audience. But this is also modern classical music, so really difficult um, avant-garde stuff. Also Mozart, also Beethoven, what I said, all genres, everything mixed up in um, this pori of music. Um, then the special thing is the presentation. Like you see in the pictures, we never wear concert clothes. That's a goal. That's forbidden in our orchestra. Um, that's to to have no boundaries for the audience to to um, yeah to recognize us uh, and to to yeah. I think the the biggest barrier for classical music for people to like classical music is the whole um setting so we try to to get rid of the setting so we're not in a concert hall we are not in concert clothes there are presenters they are trained during this whole uh, uh, program uh, they talk to the audience we do interactive stuff with with the, um, with the audience we do guest conductor stuff like you see here in the right picture um mostly with children. We do uh, uh, improvisation stuff with the whole orchestra and the audience. So we try to, to tear down all barriers between audience and orchestra. Workshops, we organize a lot of workshops to do that. So to, to, to have this improvisation stuff. Um, the other mission is of course the educational program and that's learning all these students, how it works, how this works and how they can use that later in their lives. Um, well, they learn by practice, so we just do it. We are not teaching them in lessons, but we try to teach them by doing it. They learn from each other because they all have different backgrounds. Some study classical music, some study pop music, some jazz music, some doesn't, don't stu study music. They study informatica or uh, mathematics or whatever, but they learn from each other. We have a special project program for young composers. We have a special project for young conductors. I um, guide the, the both groups then. We have a lot of arrangement because we play all this music that's not meant for sym sym uh, symphonic orchestra. So we have a lot of arranging courses and lessons and students learn to arrange. Of course, we have a team of 
professional arrangers to make the, 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 the difficult stuff, but we try to learn that them too. We have all kinds of committees um, talking about the program, talking about the venues, talking about all aspects of the organizations. Um, the staff gives a lot of career advice in, in, uh, in, in, yeah, in lessons and in, in uh, online courses. And we have internships, so they learn by uh, working in our office. Well, this is very short, the whole formula. Um, well, it's there for 51 years now in Holland, uh, and it has a special place in Dutch culture and, and musical landscape. But we also have spin-offs in other countries. Um, the first one uh, found by Amers, a uh, former uh, conductor of Ricciotti, is Street Orchestra Live, Seoul in London, Great Britain. Um, shortly after, uh, Jamie Munn uh, founded Nevis Ensemble. That's there for, I think, six, six or seven years now in Scotland, in Glasgow, based in Glasgow. Um, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, there is, um, well, after, after COVID, well, during COVID, I should have traveled there to help starting up a new group in the Ricciotti family and vibe. It's not started yet because COVID um, entered the world, but uh, I hope in a year or two years, we found uh, there is a foundation of a new Ricciotti-like ensemble in Sao Paulo. And we are uh, talking now with people in Stuttgart, Germany, and also in Leuven, Belgium. So. Hopefully, in a couple of years, there are five international spin-offs of the Ricciotti Ensemble. I think that was all. Oh, no, no, I have the last one. Well, of course, COVID was a difficult situation for Ricciotti, especially in all these social institutions. We couldn't play there. So you'd see we, uh, us playing last summer with distance. Audience, this girl in the front is an audience member very far away. It was not nice, but it was very nice that we could play. In the meantime, we made video clips, CD recordings, uh, we did online workshops, we did an ensemble tour last year, and this year, a big tour with the whole orchestra in a bubble, in a corona bubble. I think that's all. Thank you very Perfect. much. Thank you very much, Cohen Stewart. I do have a comment slash question here from the chat. So. According to Igor Stravinsky, music itself is absent of expression. What makes music expressive is the subjective characteristic of music. Aaron Copland says that there are various types of listeners based on their listening planes and their predisposition and their search for purely musical content or an expressive content. According, accordingly, Arnold Schemberg says, Form is what enables the logic and coherence of the musical discourse. Therefore, music uses similar forms to those of spoken language. So it's articulated around pauses, absences, and rhythms using different criteria of tension and rest. So music uses its own grammar and syntaxis which of course guides the musical experience as a sensorial and cognitive experience. So my question for Maestro Cohen is, within your motivation of taking classical music to new audiences and non-traditional spaces, do you believe it to be important or necessary to train people in knowledge of this musical language so that we can really democratize the enjoyment of music? If if so, how does the Ricciotti Ensemble project's work help with this musical education in the long term? Um, sorry, I answer in English, of course. Um, well, my answer is a little bit double. I think, of course, we need to, we need to educate all kinds of music to everyone. That's our mission uh, for Ricciotti too. But in the same time, I think we don't have to educate that much my experience is um, that, of course, an educated audience thinks it listens better, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, when we play in a venue where nobody is in the audience that listens to classical music or is used to classical music or even saw a, a, a live orchestra before, we play uh, an easy song, 
easy in 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 easy to listen to uh, a famous dutch simple song for instance and immediately after we play avant-garde difficult complex music and after that we play a, a recognizable pop song or whatever and and this diff more difficult but we are used to more difficult uh, music to listen to um is liked by the audience but it depends of the context you create. It's always about context. So I don't agree with Stravinsky. It's not the, the, the it's all about context. So when people feel at ease, they don't feel pressured that we need to, to, we have to like this. We need to find this good or because they don't like it because of that, then, then they will be open. And if it's not too long, because of course it's difficult to listen for to a two hour uh, opera by Stockhausen, uh, but when you bring Stockhouse for, for four minutes or for three minutes, they will like it because of the context and because they are open. That's the experience of the last 50 years of the Ricciotti. And um, in the same time, the last, your last, second question is how the Ricciotti Ensemble contribute to the musical education at long term? Um, well, in the same time, we, this is how we try to educate people, to bring symphonic music to people that never heard an orchestra that never listen to classical music, that never go to concerts in a concert hall. And they are surprised, they are amazed. They like Beethoven all of the sudden, but they don't know it's Beethoven in advance. So we try to reach 20,000, 24,000 people a year like this, new people for music. And that's the way we try to educate them. I hope that's an answer. Chelsea. Espero que haya sido útil la respuesta. Thank you very much for that answer, Maestro Cohen. We will now continue with our second guest, a very special guest from the Orquesta de Instrumentos Autóctonos y Nuevas Tecnologías, the Traditional Instrument and New Technology Orchestra from the National 13 de Febrero University in Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was founded on the 3rd of February with Susana Fierris and the director. And so she is the vice director of this orchestra. This is an interdisciplinary proposal that focuses on musical research and composition, as well as on the creation of masks. And so, they work with undergraduates in the traditional popular and American music program. And when it comes to new technologies and traditional arts, here they you have live performances, bringing their ancestral knowledge to these performances using electronic tools. And so they work here with popular music from the Americas, as well as contemporary electronic music. Today we are joined by Alejandro Iglesias Rossi, who is the founder and director of this project. He is a graduate in music with a major in composition from the Boston Conservatory of Music and is also a graduate of the Pantan Music School in France. He has also won the first prize from a dance school in Paris and also part of the Incentive Program Research Program Director of the Native Music Program, Classical Music and Popular Music Program of America, and the Master's Program for Musical Creation, New Technologies, and Traditional Arts. He also became a member of the International Rostrum of Composers in 1985 and the International Rostrum of Electroacoustic Music in 1996. He has played in the biggest concert halls in the world. He is the founder and director of the undergraduate degree in Native Classical and Popular Music of the Americas, the Master's Program in Music, and the Native Instrument and New Technologies Orchestra at the Tres de Febrero National University. He is currently the head of the Argentine Music Council. Welcome, Professor Rossi, to today's panel. Thank you very much for this invitation, Catherine. As you have already said, the project that I will speak about is an artistic and academic project. This 
course is taught in the 13 de Febrero National University here in Argentina. This is a public free university. So the two work vectors for this project are on the one hand, the recuperation or recovery of the musical heritage left to us by the pre-Columbian, our pre-Columbian ancestors. And so over the last 17 years in the orchestra, we have been recovering these instruments, visiting our continuing existing traditional communities or in some other cases where these instruments have been discontinued, we have traveled to different mu museums in the Americas looking for them. <coughs> and additionally, the idea here is to carry out a project at the university that breaks down traditional paradigms. And so the idea is to stop compartmentalizing areas. All of the members of our orchestra and those who come to study in our undergraduate and master's programs here on site, as well as those who study via distance education in the Americas, the idea is to break down these this compartmentalization. So currently composers or a composer who doesn't perform or a performer that doesn't compose, the idea is to go and buy an instrument and play. And then we have technologists coming at things from a different angle as well as our mask designers. And then we have a teacher researcher participating we here seek to carry out a project that brings together the concept of the traditional knowledge, no, knowledgeable scholars from our continent, together with all of these aforementioned areas. This all comes together in the individual soul. What does that mean to say? If you want to join the orchestra, you have to first go and carry out research all over the Americas, recover instruments, learn how to build them, learn to play them <clears throat> and then compose for these instruments. And to close the loop, this is a constant loop. So at the same time, you have to teach. You need to teach the next generation in the university. So I have now a short video that will show you the different areas that we have within the program for our Native Instrument and New Technologies Orchestra.
L'orchestre des instruments autochtones et des nouvelles technologies mêle tradition et modernité. Lors d'un concert qui ressemble plus à un rituel chamanique qu'à un spectacle, les musiciens argentins ont puisé dans la tradition aztèque et inca, consulté longuement les archives et recréé eux-mêmes leurs instruments amérindiens. Une vraie réflexion sur le concept de frontière. Il y a un art total du corps et de l'esprit entre mémoire et création. Now, this is the artistic vector of our project, and it is the genesis, both in the academic program and in the uh, master's program. And so the video also shows that there are fundamental items, like, for example, physical training is very important within this triad of logic of body, soul, and spirit traditional view of the universe. And so we do treat this as a spiritual thing. It is a logic from traditional societies uh, where these aspects are the core of their existence. And so after that, it's absolutely logic to follow the concept of cultural sovereignty. For example, uh, someone like a philosopher like uh, Rodolfo Kusch uh, mentions in his work. So this is a community project. And in the broader sense, it is a project that defends the cultural values of our continent. So the project has been uh, shown around the world and it has received the um, Musical Rights Award from the International Music Council, which was very significant for us because um, the International Music Council represents that sort of um, 
hegemonic, non-hegemonic logic, and represents uh, a look at the sound event. So after this, uh, I would like to say that uh, our project is constantly evolving. And one of the latest development uh, beyond the masks and the choreographies, which are always a constant factor within this project, we have moved on to grant the same level of ontological dignity to the traditional instruments and pre-Columbian uh, instruments to uh, from our continent as the symphonic instruments. So this is why we created this first uh, program of symphonic and traditional instruments that we debuted a short while ago with the Slovenian orchestra. And the logic of this is to try for the sound palettes of symphonic music uh, can coexist with the traditional sounds of our continent. So in that sense, as in many other senses in our uh, continent, we need to abandon this dichotomy. It's either or. As Americans, it is either and. Maestro, let me interrupt you one second. We are running a little bit late. I just wanted to mention something. Uh, within uh, previous projects that came before your initiative, from 1970, there is the foundation of Israel gets the Odila Orchestra, and other groups in Bolivia also in 1970. Nine, a similar project created by Sergio Prudencio with the Experimental Native Instrument Orchestra. The question is, does your project build on that previous heritage from the 1970s along that line that tries to preserve and compile and circulate, of course, mixed with everyday life and new ways to interpret these sounds? Is that um, your intention with the traditional musics, uh, do you capitalize on that heritage that comes from uh, Maestra Isabel Arez and from Bolivia? Just a brief answer, thank you. Well, this project is based on a logic that is the assumption of the fact that we are the heirs of two legacies the European legacy and one that had existed for millennia in our continent throughout time, there have been a number of uh, examples, of course, uh, the example of Maestra Isabel Arez. But uh, yes, um, there was a case in Chile also, the new Chilean song with composers like Ortega, Salvis, etc., that I believe are deeply linked to the work that we do. Although the logic of our orchestra has similar characteristics to those projects that you just mentioned. Maestro, thank you very much. And we will now move on with our conversation with our next guest, Maestro Constantino Herrera from the Free Symphony Orchestra of Kibdo. So yes, we have the Symphonic Orchestra of Kibdo that began in 2011, a social and artistic and educational project. This project is led by Fundación Nacional Batuta, thanks to the support of the Municipal Mayor's Office of Quibdó, the Ministry of Culture of Colombia, and private enterprises. Its main objective is to support the symphonic development of the city of Quibdó and to contribute to diminish social risks for children and teenagers. 
It also seeks to articulate musical processes already existent in the city of Kibdo, the symphonic orchestra and the free choir of Kibdo today have over 200 participants who enjoy and disseminate the canonical choral and orchestral repertoire, but they also integrate their traditional repertoires from the Pacific and the South regions of Colombia in their artistic process. So we are joined now by Maestro Constantino Herrera, who is a clarinetist, a flutist, composer and producer and has broad knowledge and is a great interpreter uh, with experience of over two decades as an arranger focusing on Pacific music. He has also participated in projects that try to preserve our traditional music of Chocó. He was born in 75 in Chocó under Maestro Moreno, who took him to develop his innate talent and his love for the traditional music of the Pacific region. As a teenager, he started his uh, career as clarinetist with Atrato San Laondita, and then he uh, started playing as a saxophonist of Guayaca under Maestro Lozano. He was awarded Best Clarinetist and Best Chirimia at the Petronio Alvarez Festival, of which he was later member of the jury. And he has also won a number of further uh, uh, awards in the Petronio Alvarez. Uh, as a teacher, he's led the musical processes in Kibdo for over 16 years and the uh, orchestra. His father was called Constantino Rera Flores and he died recently and he is a musical leader back in his uh, city. Welcome, Tino, to this uh, panel of exceptional groups and experiences. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Master Katrin. So, yes, you have mentioned something about uh, the background of the orchestra, but I would not like to use the words. I would you I would want you to listen and to watch this video, and you will understand who we are and what our activity is here in Choco. So please join me and listen to this song that is called Let Us All Reject. Thank you very much by, for, for sharing that little morsel of the wonderful concert that we had a couple of years at Teatro Santo Domingo with the orchestra from Kiddo. Maestro, a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. Number one, how 
has this project harmonized traditional music with the traditional choral orchestra? How have you found that bridge? Like Maestro Rossi mentioned, it's not either or, it's either and in a completely integral concept that can bring together different cultural manifestations or apparently different manifestations. Well, the region of Chocó is a people that have suffered adversity for a very long time, and this is taught us. And we knew that this had to be an imprint of the orchestra. Yes, we did adopt the symphonic format, but we use our own forms. We're one of the first or the only one that incorporates traditional instruments like the marimba, the kununo, wasa, and other typical instruments. And we also use folkloric instrument, uh, uh, rhythms. At the beginning, this was a challenge because, of course, in, the, in Choco, we're not used to what the structure of symphony orchestra is. Uh, our music is more filled with winds and percussion. So we did have a little bit of a clash in the beginning, but with time, we minimized that gap. Uh, and that dichotomy of is this good or is this bad. So in our orchestra, by that combination of traditional music and tradition and uh, classical music, we achieved a balance uh, together with uh, the symphony tradition. Another important element is the singing component. We sing to resist. So we're a symphony orchestra that sings, and the choir is incorporated to our uh, format, like the song we just uh, uh, heard. We have traditional songs, and we celebrate the voice to tell our stories in what hurts us through song. And so we wanted to harmonize our music with this string format, which we're not used to, but that is universal outside Joko. So we did have the opportunity. Let's say to harmonize these two cultures. To disseminate our music. Maestro Tino, thank you very much. A quick question about the way that we teach our students at the Kibdo Orchestra that has also generated pedagogical dialogue, combining traditional and uh, occidental knowledge by welcoming traditional pedagogical uh, um, approaches. So. Why don't you share a little bit with us about this topic? Our ancestors always followed an oral tradition, our percussion music, and the way that the wind instruments were taught, it was always the master, the maestro. And we didn't get the theory of it. We, we were just told, let's do this and do it this way. So uh, when we included this academic aspect into our orchestra, we started combining those two different approaches. So what we do with uh, our students is that we combine the oral tradition that we already know with uh, classical uh, training from Batuta. And so it's a, it is a marriage between traditional knowledge from our ancestors and academic knowledge. That is the tradition of symphonic music. My Sertino, thank you very, very much, and thank you to all our guests in the name of Fundación Nacional Batuta and the Second International Seminar on Music and Social Transformation, I want to thank 
all of you for your generous participation. Maestro Cohen Stewart of in, uh, Ricciotti Ensemble, Maestro Iglesias Rossi from the Traditional Instrument and New Technologies Orchestra of Argentina, and of course, Maestro Herrera from the Free Orchestra of Kibdo. Three experiences that are doubtlessly extraordinary, inspiring, that have sought to increase the dissemination of music and the development of music. Thank you very much. I now yield to Maria Claudia Parias and Grace Cifuentes, the Secretary of Culture of UAG, so that they may continue with today's program. Greetings from Bogota. Now we have finished with our public contact of the second version of the seminar of music and social transformation. We'll now move on to one of the closed events of the program, the Youth Dialogues, giving a voice to young people to discuss about training. They will gather in two groups around the following questions. Group one, how should training evolve for young musicians in order to face current challenges? And the second group will discuss innovation in music and the creation of new experiences for the public. We will have two moderators, one of them is Roja, the executive director of the Young Philharmonic of Colombia, and Jose Pedro Centeno, academic director of the Global Leaders Program. The results and conclusions of these work groups will be presented within the framework of this seminar on Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. Have a good rest of the day. And please remember that tomorrow at 8.50 in the morning, we will resume our programming, our panels, and our conferences. Tomorrow, the topic will be confines, new places, and new territories, musicians facing symbolic and physical limits. You can access all our content for free on www dot s i m t s dot c o hope to see you soon thank you s punto c o los esperamos hola buenas tardes para todos y todas a los a amigos invitados del festival, pues del seminario, segundo seminario internacional de música y transformación social que nos acompañan, gracias por estar acá, a los jóvenes que nos acompañan eh, por Zoom de forma virtual desde diferentes países, desde diferentes regiones de Colombia, gracias por unirse a estos diálogos, aquí me acompaña Ricardo del Conservatorio del Tolima, que va a estar conversando con nosotros también en torno pues a esta temática que hemos decidido para el día de hoy, que es eh, cómo se debe transformar la educación musical para precisamente enfrentar esos retos actuales que tenemos en la sociedad. Viviana, si me ayudas de pronto con, con la presentación y me gustaría también ver un poco a las personas que están digitalmente y que puedan presentarse también para que todos sepamos quiénes estamos conversando aquí en esta sesión el día de hoy. Si quieres, mientras eso sucede, Ricardo, te puedes ir presentando. Eh, ¿Cómo están? Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ricardo López Hernández, eh, soy estudiante de primer semestre del programa de lutería del Conservatorio del Tolima, soy de, del departamento de Nariño, sí, eh, llegué reciéncito, estoy recién llegado a Ibagué y, y nada, pues eh, queriendo aprender mucho de, del día de hoy y, y bueno, si puedo aportar pues alguna cosita, con mucho gusto. <risa> Eh, Susana Gómez o Susana Boreal, directora de orquesta de Medellín, que pues recientemente lideró un gran movimiento estudiantil y pues de jóvenes músicos en la ciudad. Eh, bueno, Susana, bienvenida y gracias por estar acá. Muchas gracias a ustedes por la invitación. Súper. También nos acompaña por aquí, veo en pantalla a Gabriel. Hi Gabriel, nice to see you here. 
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Could you please introduce yourself a little bit to the audience so they know who you are? Definitely. Um, I have a question first. That is, is it better if I talk in English or in Portuguese, really slow in Portuguese? Because my Spanish is so bad, so I'm not allowed to, <laughs> to communicate so well. What would be better? Yeah, English is okay. Perfect. So my name is Gabriel Esquizzacci. I'm Brazilian. I'm right now in Brazil. I flew yesterday from Vienna. And it's a pleasure one more time to be here. Thank you so much, Fundação Batuta. Thank you so much, everybody that's here with me talking and audience that's listening. And I'm, you know, I was born in Sao Paulo and I did my bachelor in UNESP and then I came to Vienna to do my master's degree. And now I'm working with Illumina Music, that's an international institution based in Sao Paulo and going to open a, a base in Vienna. And we develop talent and, and in, in young people and young talent. And that's it for now. Let's, let's keep talking and it's going to be a pleasure to share a little bit more with you. Thank you, Gabriel. Pantalla, me acuerdo haber visto en la pantalla también a Laura Navarrete, clarinetista. Laura, si te quieres presentar, gracias. Hola Juan, gracias a ti por la invitación. Mi nombre es Laura Navarrete, soy de Bogotá. Eh, soy clarinetista, egresada de la Universidad Nacional de Colombia y por tres años llevo liderando un grupo estudiantil de investigación que empezó siendo de clarinete, pero terminó siendo también... Eh, de temas eh, educativos musicales y sobre el oficio en general de ser artista en, en Colombia. Gracias Laura, Laura hace parte de la Filarmónica Joven de Colombia justamente, ha hecho parte durante varias temporadas y bueno, no solo como músico integrante de la Filarmónica, sino también como emprendedora dentro del proyecto y ha hecho muchas muchos acciones digamos dentro de la Joven. Eh, veo también por aquí a Julián Rey y a Esteban Orozco, también músicos de la Filarmónica Joven. ¿Podrían presentarse, por favor? Hola a todos, hola Juan, muchas gracias por esta invitación para poder compartir todo este espacio. Bueno, mi nombre es Esteban Orozco, yo soy flautista de la ciudad de Manizales, egresado de la Universidad de Caldas y actualmente pues, me encuentro mmm, en la ciudad de Bogotá y hago parte de la Banda Filarmónica Juvenil de Bogotá y pues también músico en esta temporada 2021 de la Filarmónica Joven de Colombia. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Julián Rey. Juan, muchas gracias por la invitación. Y bueno, soy violinista, egresado de la UNAP y del Conservatorio del Liceo. Soy santanderiano. Actualmente vivo en la ciudad de Bogotá. Eh, viajo constantemente a Bucaramanga y trabajo allí con distintos proyectos para la Universidad Autónoma de Bucaramanga y de igual forma para la Orquesta Filarmónica Juvenil de Cámara. Muchas gracias de nuevo por la invitación. A ustedes, gracias. Veo también a Leonardo Marfoy. Hola Juan, buenas tardes para todos y todas. Espero que se encuentren muy bien. Pues mi nombre es Leonardo, soy violinista, actualmente estudiante de la Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Actualmente estoy a cargo de todos los procesos sinfónicos del Departamento del Meta con el Instituto Departamental de Cultura del Meta. Eh, también lidero junto con un grupo de amigos de varias universidades del país el festival sinfónico que realizamos aquí y muy complacido de estar aquí con ustedes, de compartir este espacio y tener una buena charla y muchas gracias por la invitación A ti gracias, ¿quién me falta por allí? para que se presente, por favor Falta Juan Sebastián, creo. Bueno, muy buenas tardes para todos. Mi nombre es Sebastián Betancourt. Eh, soy estudiante de licenciatura en música en el Conservatorio de Tolima. Eh, soy trompetista. He eh, desempeñado pues, en diferentes agrupaciones sinfónicas del departamento, eh, tanto como orquestas como bandas. Y nada, pues acá dispuesto a aprender y a aportarles lo que más se pueda de mis conocimientos justo para todos gracias Juan Sebastián y finalmente Gilson García también está allí 
Eh, muy, buenas, muy buenas tardes para todos. Mi nombre es Jason García. Soy el representante estudiantil ante el Consejo Académico del Conservatorio del Tolima. También he estado liderando procesos formativos en bandas sinfónicas municipales eh, y además pues, eh, también me desempeño como formador en la Escuela de Música del Conservatorio del Tolima. Gracias, Gilson. Bueno, Gilson y Juan Sebastián iban a unirse presencialmente, pero afortunadamente las nuevas tecnologías de hoy nos permiten conversar a todos desde diferentes regiones. Gabriel, que está en Viena. Thank you, Gabriel, for being in Viena. It's so late there. So thank you so much. Estamos aquí a Ricardo, presencial. Y eh, bueno, nos faltan los jóvenes de, de la Fundación Nacional Batuta de Puerto Asís, pero bueno, ya, ya iremos aquí comunicando ahorita para ver si se alcanzan a conectar. Igual tenemos todavía... Eh, casi hora y media de discusión, entonces vamos a dar inicio y luego iremos eh, integrando las, las demás personas. Nos falta también Gustavo Peña, violinista de la Filarmónica Joven, que se unirá también hacia las 4 y 30 de la tarde, que dejó, digamos, convenció a su, a su director de la orquesta de dejarlo salir antes para poder participar en los diálogos y eso muestra esa motivación y ese interés que tienen los jóvenes músicos de empezar a integrar diferentes escenarios y de empezar a a tener pues, un poco de reflexión crítica sobre sus carreras y su profesión en la música, que es lo que queremos acá. Entonces voy a dar una, in una introducción muy rápida a esta discusión. Eh, acá la presentación funciona normal. Listo. Bueno, estos son los días de los juveniles. Lo primero es contarles a, a todos los que están y todas las que están participando pues que la idea entonces es hoy tener eh, dos grupos, mientras que nosotros estamos acá reunidos, tenemos también otro grupo en otro salón conversando sobre el tema de innovación, de emprendimiento, también otra mirada y otro enfoque hacia ese desarrollo de la formación musical y la idea es que faltando 15 minutos ellos van a venir acá, los que están presenciales y quienes están virtuales se van a unir a nuestro enlace para que todos podamos eh, concluir un poco los resultados de cada una de nuestras dos sesiones de hoy y nos vayamos preparando a lo que serán las conclusiones finales del último día con las otras dos charlas simultáneas que van a suceder ese día. Entonces hoy estamos acá para hablar de cómo debería evolucionar la, la educación musical para enfrentar esos retos actuales. Como ya lo saben, mi nombre es Juan Andrés Rojas, director ejecutivo de la Filarmónica Joven de Colombia y eh, primero me gustaría muy rápidamente pedirles que en, eh, ahí en, en donde están, en, en, en la comodidad de su casa, donde, donde se encuentren acá Ricardo, en que piensen cuál es su proyecto de vida en la música. Y vamos a tener acá dos formatos, uno en el que yo llamo conversaciones silenciosas, que es algo que ustedes van a pensar por ustedes y no van a compartir con nosotros, eh, y otras que son conversaciones abiertas, que es donde ya eh, les voy a pedir que por favor abran sus micrófonos y puedan dar su opinión, comentar, debatir y argumentar sobre cuál es su postura eh, respecto a ciertas preguntas que yo les voy a lanzar. Entonces, en ese sentido, la primera conversación silenciosa que van a tener con ustedes mismos es eh, ¿cuál es el pro propósito de su proyecto de vida en la música y cómo se ven en cinco años? Simplemente voy a darles dos minutos para que por favor piensen eh, ustedes mismos eh, en la respuesta, no la respondan, no la compartan, quédensela para ustedes por ahora. Gabriel, I'm not sure if you have translation, but if not, and now we are asking you to to think about uh, what is your purpose uh, with music, with a project in, in music, and also how do you see yourself in five years? Thank you so much, Bob. <laughs> Great. Bueno, listo. Vamos a seguir con la la presentación. Ya pasaron los dos minutos. Entonces, eh, acá ya puedo seguir, ¿verdad? Oh, nos fuimos muy lejos. Listo, ahora, eh, simplemente eh, hay una pregunta que yo tengo que no, que no es para que la respondamos ahora mismo, sino es cuál es ese rol del músico en la sociedad actual. Tocar música, educar en la música, crear proyectos de impacto social, hacer la música accesible a las comunidades o crear oportunidades de empleo. ¿Cuál creen ustedes que es un poco ese rol que, que necesita un músico hoy en la sociedad actual, no lo respondan, simplemente quédense con la reflexión, eh, con estas muchas variantes que existen hoy en día de, de hacer el quehacer musical eh, y simplemente cada quien tendrá su postura, cada quien tiene su posición, al final vamos a discutirlo, pero por ahora solo quería dejarlo para que lo piensen. Eh, acá quiero lanzarles una pregunta y es ¿cuánto creen ustedes que podría crecer el porcentaje de empleo en la música en Estados Unidos en los próximos ocho años? Y ahí tenemos, Ricardo, tenemos muy poquito, eh, cuatro opciones, 3%, 10%, 5% o 1%. 
y acá los animo sí a que abran sus micrófonos y Ricardo a que tú uses el tuyo para decirme un poco qué piensan ustedes, cuál es ese porcentaje. Bueno, ¿será que pueden repetir los porcentajes, por favor? Que no, no los escuché claro que sí. por, no 3%, no 3%, 10%, 5% y 1%. Vamos a empezar acá con Ricardo. Ricardo, ¿cuánto va a crecer el empleo en la música en Estados Unidos? Pensaría un 10%. Perfecto. Y en Zoom, ¿quién se anima a participar? Yo... Oh. Eh, ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Sí, no, yo también iba a decir que 10%, eh, porque me parece, digamos, como una cifra justa, pero vi que es la más alta en las opciones. Entonces, no creo ser tan optimista. Entonces, me voy por un 5%. ¿Los demás? Aunque todos los porcentajes son muy bajos. ¿Los demás? Bueno. Gabriel, ¿did you understand the question well? If not, ya, yeah, ok. Yeah, I think 5%. Ok. That's fine. Thank you. Susana. No sé, también pienso que las cifras son muy bajitas, lo que es muy preocupante porque es Estados Unidos, que es uno de los países con la industria musical más grande del mundo. Entonces, realmente no tengo la más mínima idea. A mí lo que me preocupa es si esos porcentajes están tan chiquitos, no me quiero imaginar los de acá de Colombia, por ejemplo. Entonces yo diría 5% también por descarte, pero no sé. Listo, gracias Susana. Si quieren vamos a ir adelante, los demás ya tendrán tiempo de, de, de decir cosas. Entonces si me ayudan ahí con la presentación nuevamente y revelamos el resultado. 1%. Y estas son cifras de abril de este año, del 2021, del US Bureau of Labor Statistics en Estados Unidos, y es menos que el promedio de otras carreras. Realmente, obviamente todos sabemos que el empleo está sufriendo una crisis importante, pero en la música es aún más grave la situación. Eh, esto simplemente para mostrarles un poco esa realidad, como decía Susana, de un país que tiene una infraestructura y que tiene un desarrollo importante en el ecosistema musical y en las industrias creativas. Entonces, se los voy dejando ahí para que lo piensen. Acá tengo muy rápidamente unas cifras que me compartió eh, mi colega Esther Viñuela, de la Escuela Superior de Música Reina Sofía de Madrid, y que de hecho las presentamos un poco esta mañana, las presentó ella a todo el seminario, sobre cómo ha venido evolucionando el tema eh, en Europa y pues en España. Entonces, acá ve uno la evolución de los que se titulan en música en España, que en, el 70, en 1977 eran 462 personas y en el 19 fueron 1.626. O sea que la formación ha venido aumentando, cada vez formamos más músicos, pero eso no se refleja tanto en las plazas que hay disponibles en las orquestas en España, por ejemplo, porque ahí uno ve, digamos, eh, cuáles son eh, empleos permanentes, temporales de sustitución y se da uno cuenta que las plazas pues, son muy pocas. En, en 2020, por ejemplo, fueron 20 plazas. Eh, ¿no? e inclusive en, en el mejor año, que fue el 19, había 44 para 1.600 y pico graduados de música. Eh, y cuando uno se va a otros países, pues sin duda empieza a haber... Lo mismo, claramente vemos a Alemania como uno de los países que más empleos tienen las orquestas, pero pues eh, es importante ahí pensar que la infraestructura que tiene Alemania, la cantidad de orquestas y demás, y pues que definitivamente Alemania tiene trabajo para sus músicos, pero no para todos los músicos del mundo. Entonces, a pesar de que todos queramos migrar a Alemania, pues definitivamente la solución sostenible no va a ser que todos nos mudemos a Alemania a trabajar en las orquestas alemanas. Entonces, estos son los países de Europa, y acá yo les traje algo muy rápido de Colombia que yo no, pues te lo voy a, a traducir a ti Ricardo rápido y ustedes si lo ven muy chiquito me dicen, pero lo, lo resumo básicamente y es que eh, solo el 14% del total de proyectos sinfónicos en Colombia son profesionales, o sea, permiten que ustedes trabajen en, eh, efectivamente en la música sinfónica. El 56% de esos proyectos equivale a procesos de formación, quiere decir que estamos formando una gran cantidad de gente que luego no va a tener empleo porque pues son solo el 14%, esos son 43%, y 8% tienen que ver con la acción social, eh, y, y bueno, y luego hay unos híbridos interesantes del 4% que mezclan lo profesional, lo de formación y lo de acción social. 
Asimismo quería mostrarles acá eh, el nivel de satisfacción que perciben los músicos en sus empleos en Colombia y de estabilidad laboral y eh, la realidad es que más del 50% se siente insatisfecho, muy insatisfecho o crítico, lo que quiere decir que tampoco los que hoy están trabajando en Colombia sienten que haya una estabilidad laboral que les permita seguir adelante con, con, con su proyecto. Eh, me parece importante también contarles acá un par de cifras importantes, el primero de octubre vamos a hablar de equidad de género, de diversidad en la música y es que en el total de la muestra que entrevistamos en la caracterización del sector sinfónico en Colombia, que hicimos el año pasado con el Ministerio de Cultura y la Filarmónica Joven, que es este resultado que está acá, es que en el sector el más del 80% son hombres y el 20 y algo por ciento son mujeres, pero es que no alcanzó el 23.2 son mujeres. Entonces ahí ya empezamos a ver unas brechas gigantescas en las que decimos, bueno, ¿y dónde están las mujeres en este sector? ¿Dónde están las mujeres en los cargos directivos de las organizaciones? Y también en la representatividad pues, de los estudiantes y las estudiantes de, de música en el país. Y finalmente una última cifra que me parece importante para este diálogo juvenil y es que la mayoría más del 40%, más del 60%, un momento acá, más del 63% de las personas que están dirigiendo los proyectos sinfónicos, que están dirigiendo todos estos procesos, tienen más de 40 años y solo un eh, 36% está entre los 20 y los 40 años. Entonces eso también muestra un poco como esa responsabilidad que tenemos todos como jóvenes y precisamente los diálogos de, que, que organizamos ahorita van de los 17 a los 35 años, pues para ver bueno, cómo logramos que los jóvenes permeen más esas estructuras y haya mucha más participación juvenil digamos en la toma de decisiones de lo que va a ser el, el, el futuro del sector sinfónico en Colombia, porque al final justamente los procesos formativos en el país están concentrados en la población juvenil. Eh, y acá quería, ya para terminar esta introducción y ponernos a conversar, es mostrarles un poco en términos de formación qué pasa en Colombia, esto sale de la caracterización también, y es que hay 86 programas de música en todo el país, en 18 departamentos y en Bogotá por supuesto, y dentro de esos 86 programas de música que ahí pueden ver en las diferentes regiones, eh, tenemos 40 que se dedican a todo el proceso de música sinfónica, por ejemplo. Entonces ahí uno ya empieza a ver como la magnitud de la cantidad de proyectos que existen y la cantidad de escenarios donde se puede transformar justamente la mentalidad de los músicos, de los, de los profesores, de las instituciones para responder a esta crisis. Un poco lo que, lo que pasaba, ayer tenía una reunión con alguien que me decía no, es que es importante saber cómo hacer sostenible una academia de música y yo le decía yo creo que es más importante preguntarse si es necesaria una academia de música o si ese formato que nos inventamos de academia de música es el que es, porque resulta que en Colombia tenemos 86 programas de música pero seguimos teniendo el mismo problema. 14% son profesionales, no hay empleo, el empleo es, es insatisfactorio, entonces ahí es importante hacerse las buenas preguntas y las buenas reflexiones de si vamos a crear nuevos proyectos de academias musicales, de escuelas de música, con qué objetivo lo creamos y, cómo, y con qué formato para que precisamente no siga, digamos, trans, este, eh, siguiendo la tradición pues, de lo que ha pasado, que no ha generado buenos resultados, sino al contrario, recoja todas esas buenas prácticas, recoja ese trabajo y empecemos a construir, porque es importante obviamente respetar y reconocer todo lo que se ha hecho en los últimos años, pero por eso, por eso precisamente desde la Filarmónica Joven trabajamos con este enfoque intergeneracional, donde conectarlos a ustedes como jóvenes con los gestores de tradición hace que las discusiones sean interesantes y construyan un, un mejor futuro. Acá es importante saber que también hay 204 programas en el área de música que tienen que ver con educación para el trabajo y el desarrollo humano y que 84 están relacionados con ese universo sinfónico, que ahí están técnicos en instrumentos, justa de cuerdas frotadas, está todo el tema de lutería por supuesto, ejecución instrumental y eh, todo el tema pues, de interpretación también. Entonces, como pueden ver, espacios de formación hay muchísimos en Colombia. Entonces, ahora acá... Yo les, les pregunto, ya habiendo ustedes pensado como en esas primeras preguntas de cuál es su proyecto de vida, cómo se ven en cinco años, quisiera que pensaran para ustedes también si perciben que su formación en el conservatorio, en la universidad, en el centro musical donde participan, les permite alcanzar esos objetivos. Si realmente la formación que ustedes hoy están recibiendo es la formación que los va a llevar a alcanzar ese objetivo que se trazaron. Piénsenlo para ustedes, para eso sí está un poquito más... Más complejo, les voy a dar unos cuatro minutos para que lo piensen eh, con ustedes mismos. Conversación silenciosa.
Bueno, sigamos y empecemos ahora sí a, a conversar. Entonces vamos con las conversaciones abiertas. Y es, me gustaría que muy rápidamente, en, en unos minutos, porque pues la idea es que nos alcance el tiempo para conversar de muchas cosas, eh, me puedan contar, tanto las personas que nos acompañan en Zoom como acá Ricardo, que, que está conmigo presencial, ¿qué mantendrían de la formación actual que están recibiendo ustedes en el conservatorio o de la que recibieron a los que ya son egresados? ¿Qué mantendrían de esa formación que recibieron durante tantos años en el conservatorio para construirla su proyecto de vida en la música? Si quieres, Ricardo, comencemos contigo. No, bueno, yo estoy, yo estoy conociendo como que el conservatorio, pues estoy en primer semestre, pero si, si te soy sincero, yo, yo vengo desde, desde la Universidad de Nariño, yo estudié licenciatura en música allá, no me titulé, sí, pero sí tuve algunos semestres de licenciatura en música y bueno, el, el cambio ha sido drástico, ¿no? la, la, eh, la forma en la que abarcan muchas de las temáticas son, son muy interesantes acá en el conservatorio y, y te puedo decir que, que la verdad estoy en un mundo completamente diferente a lo que, a, a lo que era mi, mi formación en Nariño, ¿no? o sea, de, desde acá miro un, un, un enfoque más, más internacional eh, so, sobre mi tema que es la lutería, pues eh, miramos como que eh, el inicio de lo que es la construcción de los instrumentos acá como para poder posteriormente profesionalizarnos en, en, en Italia y ese es el objetivo ¿no? desde, desde el conservatorio. Estamos acá en una tecnología eh, de, de construcción de instrumentos de cuerda frotada eh, con, con miras a, a, a la perfeccionalización de, de, esa, de esa carrera en Cremona ¿no? ya, y buscar nuevos, nuevos horizontes ¿no? que, que, que nos abran puertas tanto laboralmente como, como personalmente. Eh, creo, que, creo que el Conservatorio del Tolima tiene, tiene un muy buen enfoque en tanto a educación, obviamente tendrá falencias que, que, las, he, que las iré mirando en el camino, pero si le soy muy, 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 muy sincero, eh, tengo, no sé, un, un nuevo mundo frente a mí, depende, eh, de acuerdo a lo que yo, a lo que yo tenía en, en Nariño, pues, y, 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 y como te digo, o sea, eh, nosotros miramos solfeo acá, eh, pues, como acercamiento musical hacia, hacia, hacia el tema, pero, pero yo miro que, que, que el, la metodología que, el, que mi maestro de acá utiliza para hacernos, eh, hacernos conocer la música es, es, es mucho más didáctica y funciona mejor que la que, la que me enseñaron a mí hace unos años atrás. Y, y pues como la miro, yo digo… Eh, hay cosas que ya están mandadas a recoger y, y hay que cambiar y, y mi maestro ahora está enseñándole a un compañero mío que tiene más de 60 años y, y mi compañero ya está, ya está leyendo ritmo, ya está empezando a adentrarse en, en, en el solfeo en, en un mesecito pasado que llevamos de clase y, y eso lo miro muy importante y, y, y pues nada, me, me tiene sorprendido si le soy sincero. Gracias Ricardo, muchas gracias. Eh, por allí en Zoom, ¿quién se anima? Bueno, pues me voy a animar porque había dejado, la, había levantado la mano. Pues Andrés, digamos, para, para todos mis compañeros y compañeras, yo no sé qué, qué está pasando, pero a mí esta preocupación ya me había saltado. Entonces, junto con un grupo de, de compañeros de la universidad, yo creo que en esto también se puede reconocer un poco Laura, que también es del Conservatorio de la Universidad Nacional. Y es que nos, nos adentramos tanto en esa preocupación de saber realmente hacia dónde estaba enfocado pues, toda, todo el pensum del conservatorio. Y la gran sorpresa es que definitivamente, si uno lo piensa teóricamente, lo que está en el pensum debería funcionar. Y debería funcionar para muchas cosas, porque tenemos, unas, tenemos por ejemplo... Eh, cosas de gestión, ¿no? pero digamos unas, unas materias que tenemos que ver en, en algún momento de la carrera, también las pedagogías, eh, se, supone, o sea, se supone que en teoría debería funcionar una cosa muy, muy armónica, muy grupal, o sea, sacas un músico que tiene unas herramientas que puede, que puede no solamente emprender, sino que puede enseñar, que puede tocar perfectamente bien en cualquier orquesta, pero digamos que yo la falencia que, que, bueno, la falencia que encontramos como grupo de estudio, digamos, 
de, 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 de mirar esa realidad, no solamente desde lo teórico, sino compararlo con la realidad de nosotros estamos pues estudiando ahora mismo en el conservatorio, pero vemos también esos referentes de las personas que se han graduado y la, preocupa la preocupación no es tanto, digamos, como lo que hay, sino hacia dónde va enfocado. Entonces son como un montón de información que en ningún, pu que en ningún punto se articula y no logra, eh, no logra el objetivo principal, que es formar un músico integral. No solamente desde la armonía y lo instrumental y demás, sino en todo ese montón de componentes que deberían existir para que existiera otro panorama, ¿no? Porque si cambiamos eso, tendríamos otro panorama en el futuro, no solamente nuestra carrera, sino nosotros como país. Y ahí respondo un poquito a lo otro y es, definitivamente a mí sí me parecería importante que la música, eh, la música no es solamente un proceso de compartir notas y demás, sino de... Bueno, en ese proceso de compartir, de unir, ¿no? De unir muchas partes y a lo mejor es lo que debería estar pasando. Ese es como, como en mi panorama. Tu comentario para sugerirles que entonces, para hacerlo un poquito más rápido, de una vez digamos qué mantendríamos y qué cambiaríamos. ¿Les parece? ¿Cómo, cómo cuál es esa mirada sobre lo que su formación pues, y su paso por el conservatorio o por la universidad? Si quieren, adelante. Julián, eh, no, ah, dale. No, dale Lau y luego Julián y Esteban, supongo, o Julián, no sé, alguno de los dos. Listo. Bueno, yo, yo creo que aquí me voy a, a permitir más el acto performático y voy a decir que no mantendría nada. Eh, puede que alguien me esté viendo y me tilde de desagradecida, pero según las cifras, eh, y no solamente las cifras de la música, sino del estado del mundo, y de lo que está viviendo exactamente el país, creo que toda la educación necesita eh, un cambio grandísimo y también la educación artística que ha sido como tan un privilegio. Siento que man mantendría de la... Lo único que mantendría ni siquiera tiene que ver con el conservatorio, sino con la universidad y mantendría la, la gratuidad de la universidad pública, eh, porque en el caso de los músicos es necesario para, o sea, que si, que si estamos pretendiendo tener programas sociales de música en las regiones, no negarles después la educación superior por el precio de, de, de la matrícula. Y ya, es lo único que mantendría. Gracias, Lau. Eh, vamos ahora con Julián y Esteban. Me imagino dos regiones diferentes de Colombia y dos perspectivas que seguramente se encuentran. Cuéntenos. Bueno, yo particularmente, eh, digamos en mi región, bueno, la, la Universidad de Caldas, en la institución pues, de donde realicé mi pregrado, una de las cosas que me llama mucho la atención es como la, ¿cómo lo dijera? Como la proyección internacional que tiene, que tiene la universidad. ¿sí? Digamos que gran parte del, del, como del enfoque pues, siempre es como, como proyectarnos nosotros como estudiantes a pues como a no quedarnos acá, digamos, realmente. Esa es como una de las cosas que, que digamos, pues los profesores, la, la gran mayoría, pues que han tenido como su formación en el exterior y siempre como que le dicen a uno en clases como que pues realmente, eh, pues no se puede quedar acá, o sea, y es, una, es algo muy triste, desafortunadamente, o sea, uno le toca, o sea, como sea, irse, porque claro, digamos para acá, la, como para el, el medio colombiano, muchas de, de, de las cosas pues, de, de enseñanza podrán estar bien, pero pues vemos que cuando vamos hacia el exterior es realmente insuficiente, ¿sí? Entonces, eh, de las cosas que, digamos, yo, yo, yo cambiaría um, específicamente, digamos, de, de, de mi universidad, eh, es el tema, por ejemplo, de, de prácticas instrumentales, digamos, porque eh, pues yo cuando llegué acá a Bogotá, pues me di cuenta que acá todo el mundo o una gran mayoría de, de, de los músicos pues tienen, por ejemplo, experiencias tocando con orquestas y muchos se quieren dedicar a eso. Y realmente nosotros en Manizales no. O sea, encuentras en Manizales y en Caldas bandas hasta para tirar para el techo. O sea, porque realmente en todos los municipios del departamento hay mínimo una banda, hay municipios que tienen cinco que tienen cinco colegios y cada colegio tiene una banda sinfónica y está también la del corregimiento y la del resguardo indígena. O sea, bandas encuentras por montones 
pero hay gente que tristemente se gradúa de la universidad sin nunca tocar en una orquesta sinfónica. O sea, varios de mis compañeros de corte, como de cohortes anteriores, se graduaron, recibieron su título y no saben qué es tocar en una orquesta sinfónica. Y pues, digamos que es algo como ya más de, de, de la zona, pues que digamos la, la, la fortaleza en teoría es, es como la, la formación en vientos, pero pues entonces sí es algo que, que directamente la universidad de, debería, o sea, ahorita lo están empezando como a como a tratar de vincular más los estudiantes con la Orquesta Sinfónica de Caldas y todo esto, pero pues antes eso no pasaba. Entonces, claro, mucha gente pues toca en, en muchas bandas, sea la banda de la universidad o la banda municipal de Manizales, etc. Pero la Orquesta Sinfónica de Caldas pues conformada siempre por los profesores y pues ya, o sea, los estudiantes no, no tienen como otro espacio, ¿sí? Otro espacio para, para hacer esas prácticas. Entonces, a mí personalmente eso es lo que me encantaría que, que se pudiese cambiar, digamos, de mi de mi universidad, porque me parece que es algo esencial, es algo esencial que todo el mundo pueda tener la, la posibilidad de tener esas prácticas, porque pues eso va definiendo básicamente a qué se quiere dedicar cada persona, si se quiere ir como por un lado solista, o por música de cámara, o pues simplemente como músicos de, de formatos grandes, y eso es una gran falencia pues que sí tenemos en, en, en el departamento de Caldas, que apenas hasta ahorita, unos dos años atrás, está empezando como a como a cambiar, pero pues sí es algo que en la historia siempre ha estado, siempre ha estado mal. Así está. Bueno, desde, desde mi punto de vista, como decía Juan, desde otra región, otra universidad, otras realidades, yo considero que, que como, como se mencionó ahorita, y como estamos viendo la, la visión del músico y, y nuestra formación debe ser bastante integral, porque ahorita nos vemos como enfrentados a, a, a crear nuestras propias oportunidades, porque como vimos, no hay muchas oportunidades en orquesta, eh, el sueño de tocar de solista también, tener una vida solista es muy complicada, entonces yo personalmente siento que eh, en la parte de conservatorios todavía estamos como trabajando en crear o solistas o, o músicos de orquesta, de pronto estamos un, un poco cerrados a, a estas dos posibilidades, entonces me parece que, que hay que abrir la perspectiva y entender que, que la música no es solo estas dos opciones, ¿sí? Abrir de pronto como la posibilidad a ver la música por muchas otras ramas que, que son necesarias y que, y que son las que de pronto podríamos aplicar en nuestro contexto y en nuestra realidad. Entonces... Yo no cambiaría o, o no quitaría de pronto este ciclo básico, por así decirlo, porque me parece que la parte teórica, no sé, hablando teoría, solfeo, armonía, eh, es, está muy bien, porque tenemos que saber este tipo de cosas, tenemos que tocar nuestro instrumento también. Son cosas que, que son completamente necesarias. Pero sí considero que, que es importante cambiar ese enfoque que, que le estamos dando a la, a la formación desde la parte de, de las instituciones que, que nos sí, estamos formando solistas cuando, cuando no, no, no hay donde ¿sí? tener una carrera como solistas personalmente acá en nuestro país. Entonces es, es bien importante eso, sí es importante toda esta teoría, sí es importante la práctica in, instrumental, pero en mi caso, por ejemplo, jamás me enseñaron... Y cómo vivir de la música, ¿sí? que, que es algo completamente necesario. Me enseñaron muchas, muchas cosas, pero nunca nadie me habló de cómo hacer rentable o, o, o cómo generar ingresos con, con mi carrera, no desde la parte de la universidad. Entonces me parece que son temas que son importantes implementar en, en nuestras instituciones y más en, en la realidad que, que estamos viendo no solo en nuestro país, sino en todo el mundo, donde, donde las artes, pues... Siempre hemos tenido una, una crisis, pero estamos en momentos difíciles, ¿no? Entonces, me parece bien, bien importante implementar este tipo de cosas. Gracias, Julián. Eh, veo allí la mano levantada también de Gilson. Sí, bueno, me uno un poco a las palabras del último compañero que nos estuvo hablando. Y es que de lo que cambiaría es que creo que el componente de emprendimiento debería estar mucho más presente en, en, las, en la carrera, en cualquier carrera musical. Yo creo que, creo firmemente que eh, todo el conocimiento teórico, eh, ancestral, pues es muy importante, 
Eh, sin embargo, estamos viendo las necesidades del mercado, estamos viendo las realidades sociales que apuntan quizás hacia otro lugar. Chévere ser músico de orquesta, a mí me encanta la orquesta sinfónica, pero no hay tantas orquestas sinfónicas profesionales aquí en Colombia que garanticen una estabilidad laboral para todos los graduandos de, de nuestra nación. Eh, entonces, pero sí me surge a un, digamos, una incertidumbre y es porque, porque somos tan especialistas en músicas del mundo, somos tan buenos intérpretes en música europea, en diferentes repertorios, formatos, épocas, y por qué no, no, no somos igual con nuestra propia música, porque no hay una orquesta que se enfoque en la música autóctona, porque no podemos crear una, una orquesta sinfónica con una línea de cómo se interpreta, de cómo se dirige la música colombiana, que es, otro, es, otro, es otra cosa, eh, porque no podernos ir, y yo estoy seguro que inclusive en el exterior, lo que más les llama la atención de los músicos colombianos y latinos es su música. Eh, yo estoy muy seguro que... que en Europa no están esperando que salgan los colombianos y que interpreten mejor Tchaikovsky que los rusos, ni que tampoco interpreten mejor a Beethoven que los alemanes. No, no, ellos no están esperando eso, ellos están esperando que venga el colombiano y que nos interprete una cumbia y que nos muestre cómo se hace, cómo se hace un bambuco. Eh, y no, yo ni siquiera soy músico tradicional, pero estoy completamente... Eh, eh, digamos que concuerdo con que nuestro enfoque debería estar también eh, desde los conservatorios en, en establecer esos lineamientos que no los hay en cuanto a la interpretación colombiana, en cuanto a la proyección y en cuanto al emprendimiento de cómo volver nuestro trabajo, no depender de un gobierno, no depender de una administración, sino que nosotros también podemos crear organizaciones o conjuntos eh, sostenibles, podemos buscar la financiación de ellos, ¿sí? Y esto pues creo que requiere pronto que desde nuestra academia sea tenido en cuenta y sea fortalecido. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Dilson. Susana, Gabriel. Eh, no sé cómo levantar la mano acá. Entonces... <risa> Tranqui. Bueno, yo creo que pues recogiendo como un poquito lo que todos han dicho, porque si sí, es un sentir de, como de todos los músicos o los estudiantes de música de aquí, y es que primero pienso que sí deberíamos apropiarnos mucho de nuestras músicas, o sea, las músicas que nosotros tenemos generalmente en el conservatorio, en las universidades, recibimos clases de, pero la música académica occidental, o sea, por ejemplo, en, el, en mi caso yo tuve que ver primero cuatro semestres de Historia de la Música de Europa antes de poder ver Historia de la Música en Latinoamérica, Historia de la Música en Colombia y Etnomúsica. Y fueron unas materias que disfruté muchísimo. Y pues sí me hacía cuestionar mucho de si nosotros tenemos, por ejemplo, ritmos tan complejos, armonías tan complejas dentro de nuestras músicas, ¿por qué no utilizarlas, por ejemplo, para la enseñanza de la música? O sea, ¿por qué tenemos que dejarlo relegado, sobre todo una música que no está en nuestro contexto social? O sea, bueno, tampoco es que en todo Colombia nosotros nos levantemos con bambucos, con pasillos, pero sí está en nuestro ADN, tenemos la salsa, tenemos el vallenato, en los pueblos sí muchísimo, bueno, yo hablo desde Medellín porque pues Medellín es, es una ciudad un poquito más grande y, y hemos perdido mucho, lastimosamente, todas esas tradiciones, pero ¿por qué no aprovecharnos, por ejemplo, de eso eh, para la enseñanza de la música? ¿Por qué no buscar, por ejemplo, nuevas pedagogías? Porque eso es otro problema. Yo siento que cuando pasé de la escuela de música a la que iba después del colegio a la universidad, a mí se me, se me acabó como mucho la motivación. O sea, seguía haciendo música porque me gustaba, porque estaba convencida, pero ya no era lo mismo. O sea, un punto en el que yo sentía que se me quitaba la partitura estaba perdida. No sé, hay, hay, y esto no es solamente de la enseñanza de la música, sino de todo el sistema educativo que tenemos acá y de la educación prusiana y de la revolución industrial que nos que nos forma para ser hacedores 
y creo que entonces también llega este problema en que la música también se vuelve un producto y es una cosa que hay que hacer bien, pero nos olvidamos de conectarnos realmente con lo que es el sentido del arte y de la música como forma de expresión. Creo que también es muy importante precisamente en el contexto en el que nos movemos, como dicen también, recibir una educación o una formación financiera, saber por ejemplo cómo funcionan los derechos de autor, eh, lastimosamente por las políticas que tenemos no hay suficientes trabajos para los músicos entonces a la mayoría de nosotros nos toca pagarnos eh, la salud, la, bueno todas las prestaciones sociales salud, pensión, la ARL y no tenemos idea de cómo funciona eso educación por ejemplo en cuánto se cobra por un concierto cuánto se cobra por una chisga, por un toque no tenemos idea de eso tampoco, o sea, ¿cuánto vale una hora de mi trabajo por todo lo que yo he estudiado y todo lo que he hecho? Entonces, yo sí creo que es muy importante reformar todo el sistema de cómo se enseña la música, de cómo se aborda la música, y eso ha acompañado también, eh, no me acuerdo quién era el que decía que, creo que era el Gilson, que nosotros mismos, pero no, yo sí creo que hay que exigirle al gobierno, hay que exigirle a las instituciones que se generen trabajos, que se generen políticas públicas que nos incluyan, o sea, políticas culturales que en la agenda programática se, o sea, que se esté, esté bien consolidado, por ejemplo, el presupuesto de la cultura, porque es a través del arte, pues donde se guarda la historia, la tradición, la memoria del, de los colombianos, pues como de cada pueblo. Entonces, sí creo que hay que exigir también eso y que hay que hacer una reforma, pero grandísima, para sensibilizar a las personas en la música, que lo vean como una forma de expresión, que no sientan como personas que realmente le aportamos muchísimo a la sociedad y pues eso genera, o sea, va a generar naturalmente que tengamos trabajos dignos y que la educación se piense desde el ser y no tanto desde el acero del producto. Gracias, Susana. Gabriel. Thank you so much. Such an inspiring section, such a beautiful question and answers. Thank you so much. Uh, from my perspective, I think we are used to one modus operandi. That means um, we go to social projects and then we go to universities and then you you get to the orchestra and then like what you go after getting getting to this youth orchestra like how to get a job i think the modus operandi is always bringing us to this orchestra environment and it's not sustainable because you cannot bring orchestras to all the communities and Talking about the, the how to teach and how to what about the universities? I think I would keep the curriculum, but I would add a lot of things as production. I would connect the the students with the community, like playing chamber music, and I would do a lot of research to understand what does the community need, because I think this is really important changing from one perspective to another perspective, it's completely different. One society is gonna need one kind of approach. If you go to another one, it's another, it's a different approach. So I think understanding this reality is the best way to change. And that's what we are doing here. And that's wonderful. That's why I'm so, so pleased to be here with you. And, about the curriculum, I would change the way of teaching because sometimes we are spending so much time in things that we are not really using in our daily life, in our profession, professional life. So I'm not gonna extend much more, but this is the overall about this question, what I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriel. Como pueden ver, Gabriel, es brasilero, está viviendo en Viena, ha tenido una formación internacional e igual puntualiza sobre las mismas temáticas, digamos, está de acuerdo como con la conversación y el flujo y eso muestra que realmente la situación no es que esté así en Colombia, realmente hay como una conciencia global de esa necesidad de ir formando a los músicos 
hacia, hacia otro camino, eh, Susana va a tener que dejarnos muy pronto porque tiene una reunión importante ahorita en, en, a, al final y bueno, de eso se trata de diversificar el perfil y tener muchas actividades y, y moverse mucho, pero Susana me gustaría mucho que nos puedas eh, contar muy rápidamente un poco esto que pasó hace, hace unos meses que lograste convocar a todos estos jóvenes eh, en Medellín, digamos un, po un poco sentando esa voz y creo que alguien, alguno lo decía, creo que era Gilson, que decía cómo conectamos a los músicos y, y a los estudiantes y las estudiantes de música con la realidad social, con esas problemáticas que suceden en Colombia, o sea, cómo, cómo acercamos a la gente a lo que está pasando en el país, ¿Cómo, los, cómo, cómo se logra eso, un poco cuál es tu perspectiva en ese sentido que has venido como acercándote a esos temas sociales bastante en los últimos semanas, en los últimos meses, y cómo ves tú también esa perspectiva de los compañeros que lograste reunir obviamente para esto que fue un poco como la orquesta de la revolución eh, entre comillas, eh, que se gestó hace unos meses en la ciudad de Medellín. Bueno, eso fue realmente idea de un amigo que es trompetista, eh, Juan Ernesto Arias, y o sea, ya llevábamos como una semana de las movilizaciones y él dijo como, o sea, no puede ser que los de teatro y los de danza estén todos en las calles haciendo cosas y los de música no estemos haciendo nada. Entonces, mandó como una nota de voz y otra persona, otra chica, Ana María Zapata, una clarinetista, se unió y yo también y dijimos como, yo, o sea, yo les dije como quiero ayudarles y empezamos a hacer la convocatoria ese día, a pedirle a compositores que hicieran arreglos de obras y a los grupos de WhatsApp y de Telegram llegaron más de 400 personas, a las 7 de la noche se mandaron las partituras y al otro día estábamos ya ahí en el parque de la resistencia tocando. Eh, fue muy importante eso que pasó, de hecho fue muy lindo porque eso ya se había hecho antes, aunque nunca había sido como tan viral, porque ya la Filarmónica de Bogotá, por ejemplo, lo había hecho, aquí en, en la Universidad de Antioquia también se había hecho un cacerolazo sinfónico en el 2018, creo, que lo dirigió mi maestro de dirección, y, y había muchas manifestaciones así musicales espontáneas pero entonces creo que fue muy bacano porque se le abrió también el panorama a las personas de mostrar lo importante que es el arte en la revolución social lo, lo importante que es la música como medio para transmitir mensajes por ejemplo eh, y también un poco porque se empieza a despertar esa sensibilidad y esa conciencia social en las personas y especialmente en los músicos y en los artistas y el enorme poder que tenemos en nuestras manos, en nuestra voz, en nuestro ser para despertar esa sensibilidad en las otras personas. Creo que nos hace mucha falta como músicos involucrarnos más en esto porque porque es que nosotros somos de los últimos en la cadena, en el presupuesto y en todo, o en toda la planeación que se hace, generalmente la cultura, la que está ya de últimas, y eso nos afecta muchísimo y nosotros todos lo sentimos, entonces sí creo que deberíamos, o sea, por ejemplo, todo esto me alegra muchísimo, la gente que está acá, o sea, lo que dicen, eh, lo que dice Laura de tiene que ser educación pública y tiene absolutamente toda la razón, no la había pensado, si te dan formación musical, ¿cómo no te van a garantizar después la educación pública también para que puedas seguir totalmente de acuerdo? Me encanta que eso se dé porque quiere decir que nosotros nos estamos pensando el país como lo queremos y que nos estamos apropiando de esos espacios y diciendo como no, o sea, ustedes ya pasaron otras generaciones, ya ustedes hicieron el gobierno que está ahí, hizo lo que quiso, entonces nosotros somos ahora los jóvenes los que estamos sufriendo, los que vemos que no tenemos oportunidades, que no vamos a tener trabajo, que probablemente más del 90% de nosotros nunca se jubile y somos nosotros los que llegamos y decimos ¿cómo es que tiene que pensarse este país? Estoy muy contenta porque todos somos aquí muy jóvenes, yo realmente esperaba que yo fuera la única joven, me alegra mucho que seamos todos músicos y... y y de las orquestas y todo porque compartimos algo en común y sería muy chévere que eso se pueda ir extendiendo a los otros músicos, a las otras personas y que aprendamos a, a luchar por lo que queremos, a juntarnos y a hablar de lo que necesitamos, que no es por ser 
pues no es por, por inconformes, ni por ser mamertos, ni por nada, sino porque es nuestro derecho, es nuestro legítimo derecho, y así es que nosotros nos tenemos que parar y luchar y hablar y pensarnos este país como lo queremos. Yo sí si quisiera, yo sé que fue una pregunta silenciosa, pero... Eh, yo, yo me cuestiono mucho, o sea, yo sé que ahora estoy haciendo una transición más a la parte del activismo y la política y todo esto. Y yo venía hablando con un amigo hace poco porque, eh, bueno, Esteban Mosquera, que fue un, un, él era músico y ahí lo asesinaron en Popayán, porque también hacía parte de todas las movilizaciones sociales. Venía hablando con un amigo y él, y él se puso muy mal porque sentía que no lo protegió. Y yo, me, yo pensé, en, yo le decía como, yo debería estar haciendo música, mi amigo le decía, tú también deberías estar haciendo música, Esteban deb, debió haber estado haciendo música en vez de estar peleando porque se nos respete la vida y la vida digna. Y creo que... Me, me pone un poquito triste el hecho de que sé que le tengo que bajar muchísimo a la música, pero por el otro lado me alegra mucho que, que a donde voy es muy probable que pueda hacer mucho o que pueda intentar hacer mucho por la cultura y por el arte y también sería como un llamado a todos a que de verdad nos juntemos y que cualquier cosa que podamos construir y cualquier idea y cualquier propuesta más que bienvenida, porque la idea es que entre todos nos apoyemos y podamos salir adelante como, como músicos, como artistas y como ciudadanos colombianos. Y ya, muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias, Susana, por esas palabras y sobre todo por la voluntad de, de construir en conjunto. Yo, como director de la Filarmónica Joven, sin duda veo un cambio de mentalidad impresionante, un compromiso de verdad de muchos jóvenes en el país de querer transformar las cosas, de querer comprometerse con esos cambios, parte de ellos están acá pero así como los que están acá podemos convocar a muchos más para, para que sigamos sobre todo generando estos espacios de debate y de diálogo donde estamos construyendo y donde como tú dices estamos haciendo país entendiendo qué ha pasado qué tiene que pasar y qué tenemos que hacer para que suceda, entonces muchas gracias por, por estar acá, vamos a seguir y bueno y te, te esperamos el, el próximo viernes para los siguientes diálogos muchas gracias Aprovecho esta pausa Chao. para darle la bienvenida Chao. a Gustavo Peña, violinista de la Filarmónica Joven de Colombia y de la Filarmónica Juvenil de Bogotá. Hola Gustavo, vamos a seguir aquí con la conversación y ya tú te vas ahí uniendo a medida que, que avanzamos. Gracias. ¿Me ayudan con la presentación, profe? Bueno, acá viene otra conversación abierta. Les voy a pedir acá que seamos un poquito más, más rápidos en el tiempo para que nos alcance todo lo que nos falta por, por conversar. Eh, entonces, básicamente la respuesta en un minuto y medio máximo. Entonces, ¿qué tanto influye la opinión de su maestro o maestra en su decisión de proyecto de vida? Y si usted discute con él o con ella sobre sus oportunidades de profesionalización en la música y la búsqueda de empleo. Muy rápidamente. Ricardo, si quieres comencemos acá presencial y luego vamos a, a Zoom. Gracias, gracias maestro. Eh, claro, eh, para, para muchos de nosotros la, la, la opinión del maestro influye muchísimo. Y sí, uno, uno, uno comenta con él la situación actual acá y pues el maestro lo que le dice es vete. ¿no? Eh, en, en, mi, en mi ámbito de la, de la lutería dice acá a nosotros no nos compra nadie los violines, ¿no? o sea, a nosotros nos vienen a comprar de otros, de otros países y las, las personas de acá traen violines de otros países, o sea, bien, pues lastimosamente el, la, la profesión es, está recién iniciando con nosotros y, y, los que, y los que hay son muy buenos, muy buenos, de hecho en mi departamento hay un, un luter muy bueno, pero igual, Creo que, creo que es igual en, en, en todos los ámbitos, ¿no? Si viene un maestro de otro lado, pues es mejor acogido que, que alguien de aquí. Entonces, por, por eso creo que el, los maestros siempre le dicen, ve, abre tu mente, abre tu, tu perspectiva y, y cambia y aprende. Y, y es, es la realidad, ¿no? Cuando uno sale de, de su zona de confort, aprende mucho. Pero es, eh, es triste mirar que que nosotros tenemos mucho de qué aprender aquí, de donde somos. 
y que no lo utilizamos. ¿no? Tal vez deberíamos empezar a, a aprender más de nosotros mismos que de alguien de afuera. Pues, eh, Kodali hizo lo mismo con la música, ¿no? Y, y era música, la música tradicional y la convirtió en académica. Creo que nosotros también podríamos hacerlo. Gracias, Ricardo. Listo, vamos a Zoom. ¿Quién se anima? Yo la verdad es que veo muy pequeñas las manitos de Zoom, entonces si quieren levanten la mano que los veo más fácil. Gustavo. Dale, bueno, eh, primero que todo, muy buenas tardes. Y esta, esa pregunta está muy interesante porque pienso que es fundamental, ¿no? Hay que aprovechar pues la experiencia que tienen los maestros, el camino que ellos tienen recorrido, ¿no? Ellos tienen una visión mucho más amplia de lo que es el panorama laboral actual, ¿no? Y sobre todo ese proyecto de vida de manera profesional. Entonces considero que, que sí es muy importante hablar con ellos, ¿no? Eh, obviamente puede que se modifique o no en ciertos lugares el proyecto de vida, pero, pero sí es fundamental, ¿no? Porque ellos tienen una trayectoria, tienen una cierta experiencia y esto es, esto es fundamental para, para trazar estos, estos caminos de, de la parte laboral. Gracias, Gustavo. ¿Quién más se anima? Julián. Bueno, eh, en, en mi parte personal también, yo comparto absolutamente cualquier decisión musical, incluso personal con mi maestra, pero yo creo que eso depende también del contexto y, y la... Sí, el, de, de cada uno, porque en mi caso mi maestra es prácticamente como, como una segunda madre, porque yo desde los 10 años estoy con ella, y eso está también cuando uno encuentra empatía con, con, con lo que esa persona piensa, entonces... En mi caso particular considero también que ella tiene una experiencia y como una forma de ver la música, el entorno laboral, bastante cercana a lo que a mí me gusta. Entonces me parece muy importante también contar siempre con la opinión de, de alguien que de pronto se afina a, los, a lo que uno siente o a lo que uno está buscando. Gracias. ¿Quién más por ahí? Lau. Eh, bueno, yo debo decir que, que los maestros y maestras son una clave importantísima en la vida de un, de un joven músico, o sea, tanto, tanto que yo siento que en psicología se debería abrir como un campo que no fuera daddy issues, mommy issues, sino maestro issues, porque aquí me está pasando algo <ríe> muy divertido y es que me alegra mucho como que las personas que, que han hablado han tenido buenos maestros, pero yo quiero decir que, al menos en el caso del Conservatorio de Música de la Universidad Nacional, eh, gran parte de la planta de profesores son profesores que llegaron del extranjero hace mucho tiempo, cuando, cuando la música todavía estaba empezando como una profesión, y son personas que se quedaron mucho en, el, en, esa, en esa imagen del músico y nunca se actualizaron, entonces como que ustedes hablan de... Eh, los maestros saben más sobre el ámbito eh, musical, y yo como que aquí estoy como el meme, de cómo sus maestros investigan, o sea, wow, porque ese es uno de los problemas cruciales, al menos en, en mi escuela, y que igual yo debo aceptar que, que la emancipación del maestro cuesta tanto como la emancipación de los padres, y sí influye, y tenemos también que hablar si, si vamos a transformar en darle garantías a los profesores y a las profesoras, pero también tenemos que ser... Eh, tenemos que apuntarle a una educación emancipadora. O sea, como sí queremos a nuestros maestros, son muy importantes para nosotros, pero también tenemos necesariamente que pensar y sentir por nosotros mismos. Y ya. Gracias. ¿Quién más se anima? Gabriel, you were... So, I, I would go for the same. As, as Laura, because it was such a beautiful speech. Uh, emancipation should be part of the process of learning and of, because there is no teaching in the end of the day. It's a process that both professor and student are in the same like path together. Because if we see the path as professor and student, There is no way to have a good exchange of information and a human way of communication. It's always going to have this kind of pattern of um, 
power dynamics. And this is so complicated sometimes because uh, it comes to abuse sometimes, it comes to a lot of problems that could be uh, avoided only changing the third and only changing the way of viewing, of like looking at it. And from this point of view, I think, uh, I, I don't like so much the word alum, alumini, uh, alunu, because it's the person that's without light and everybody has a light. And why should we call the person that has light alum, alumini, that it doesn't make sense. Everybody has a light. And I think the process of teaching and learning, both are in the same path, both are learning together because the professor, when they are, they're teaching, there is this, oh my God, I remember myself like 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, doing the same thing. And it's the process that you go together. There is no way but together. If it's not together, it's not gonna work. And I think if we go for this emancipation path, for sure we will get much more beautiful results out of it. And I'm so grateful because my professor is, is in the seminar. She is sitting there, I think, Jennifer, and, and I'd like to thank <laughs> Jennifer because she was one of this incredible person that made me think about emancipation. So I would like to ask you all to give a huge applause to Jennifer Stone. She's there. Thank you so much. Bueno, acá ya para ir, ir concluyendo un poco de todas estas conversaciones que hemos tenido en torno pues obviamente a retos sociales, a la emancipación precisamente de los músicos, a independencia de la educación y demás, me gustaría que eh, silenciosamente cada uno muy rápidamente en un minuto pudiera pensar, si pudiera definir el perfil del músico, la música ideal para enfrentar los retos actuales como sociedad, ¿cómo sería ese perfil? ¿Cómo se imaginan ustedes ese perfil? Eh, del músico del siglo XXI. Piénsenlo un poco ahí, un minuto, y ya conversamos. Yo los veo a todos ya como muy decididos de... Yo sé que estas son reflexiones que las estamos poniendo acá sobre la mesa para conversar entre todos, pero que son preguntas existenciales que todos nos hemos hecho... En, en, en todo este tiempo, yo, yo creo que a esta pregunta le venimos dando, al menos yo desde la Flerma y Cajón ya como dos años y medio, tres, y ustedes pues seguramente se lo han preguntado muchas veces más, mucho tiempo más, entonces me parece chévere que empecemos entre todos precisamente eh, a construir ese perfil en conjunto. Entonces me gustaría pedirles nuevamente un minuto y medio, máximo dos, para que cada quien me cuente cuál es ese perfil del músico del siglo XXI que ustedes se imaginan luego de esta conversación que hemos venido teniendo de cómo se debería transformar esa educación. Bueno, ¿qué sería el resultado de una educación ideal eh, hacia los músicos desde su perspectiva? Si quieren, comencemos nuevamente aquí con, con Ricardo, que está presencial, y luego vamos a Zoom. Bueno, alguna vez eh, un maestro me dijo que, que hay muchos perfiles en la música. ¿no? Yo tenía alguna duda existencial y me dijo, no, hay muchos perfiles. Pero como tal... Yo podría decir que, que el músico del siglo XXI es un músico que investigue, ¿no? que, que busque nuevos caminos, eh, nuevas técnicas, eh, no sé, que, que revolucione la música y que revolucione la forma de enseñar también y, y la forma de aprender. Pues creo que, bueno, yo soy un tanto romántico en eso, pero <coughs> creo que... Creo que deberíamos enamorar a los músicos de la música. Lamentablemente nos enamoramos por, digamos que por, por circunstancias de la vida, nos enamoramos de la música, pero ya como tal nuestros maestros no, nunca nos han hecho enamorar de la música, nos han hecho cogerle miedo. Creo que deberíamos llevar la cosa como por, por, la, por enamorarnos de la música. Creo que de, a partir de eso, de, de enamorarnos de la música, empezamos a, a ser interdisciplinarios y, y empezamos a hacer eh, una palabra se me fue ahorita qué pena eh, integrales integrales en la música gracias Ricardo gracias. Eh, sí esa noción de integralidad me parece bien bien importante tenerla en cuenta y, y quisiera como hacer un pequeño comentario sobre lo que dices y es 
eh, precisamente ese tema de que muchos le cogen miedo a, a seguir en la música, ¿no? Ahorita Susana decía como, yo ya no disfruté tanto cuando pasé a la universidad y hace, la semana pasada escuchaba a una chica de Alemania, una cornista alemana, que decía, cuando yo me gradué de la universidad, pues del conservatorio en Maastricht, yo dejé de tocar el corno como seis meses. No podía ni ver el corno porque estaba desesperada de la presión, de esta carga emocional que genera. Entonces yo creo que eh, es valioso lo que dices de esas pedagogías un poco más positivas, más humanas, que, que, que entienden que una persona no tiene muchos componentes, que es muy integral como persona y que requiere pues, que el maestro aquí, como decíamos previamente, pues tenga la habilidad no solo de investigar el campo musical y demás, sino que entienda que tiene un ser humano enfrente, que tiene unos sueños, unas expectativas, un proyecto de vida en la música y que ahí viene como, como ese acompañamiento y que es muy responsable, ¿no? o sea, al final es una, es una influencia tan grande que existe en la música eh, del maestro hacia el alumno que al final tú puedes hacer una carrera muy exitosa o tu maestro te puede decir, sabes que tú no eres tan buen músico y ahí en adelante vienen muchos problemas que, que uno no se alcanza a imaginar. Entonces, gracias Ricardo por esa, esa perspectiva. Yo acá recogiendo para, para luego ir armando ese perfil. Entonces, vámonos a Zoom. ¿Quién, quién quiere contarnos cómo se, qué, se imagina ese perfil? Esteban y luego Gustavo. Bueno, realmente era, era una pregunta bien, bien, como bien difícil y eso lo, lo hablaba acá con, con Julián. Y la cosa es como que el músico realmente hoy en día tiene que hacer absolutamente todo. O sea, realmente yo pienso que el momento de que únicamente tenemos que esforzarnos por tener nuestro instrumento y nuestro nivel musical al día y tocar todo perfectamente y ya, o sea, eso no, eso no es lo que nos puede bastar ahora. Desafortunadamente, porque, pues por lo mismo, o sea, por las oportunidades realmente, y es algo que nunca nos, nunca nos enseñan y que uno empieza como a aprender después, eh, lo que hablaba también ahorita con Julián, o sea, el tema, digamos, de redactar proyectos, de uno proyectarse a sí mismo, pero no solamente como tocando, o sea, hay muchas cosas que uno debería saber hacer y que eso uno no se lo enseñan en la universidad, o digamos, pues a mí particularmente solo mis dos últimos semestres vi proyecto de investigación y, y ya, pero hoy en día, y digamos para la realidad colombiana, por ejemplo, o sea, tenemos que saber cómo redactar nuestros propios proyectos, nuestras propias ideas, cómo, eh, pues valga la redundancia, proyectarnos nosotros mismos, o sea, hacer todo nuestro trabajo, porque realmente no vamos a llegar al punto de listo, o sea, soy un super solista, solo me preocupo por llegar y tocar y no sé qué, pero tengo mi manager que me maneja absolutamente todo y etcétera, sino que realmente todo ese trabajo nos toca hacerlo, hacerlo a nosotros mismos. Y eh, realmente algo que me llama mucho la atención ahorita de lo que, lo que, dijo, lo que dijo Susana, pues que desafortunadamente ya no está, y es que realmente el gremio musical es muy desorganizado, sobre todo políticamente. O sea, a nosotros un profesor en, en la universidad, en una materia que se llama Negocios de la Música, él nos decía como que realmente es que, o sea, se los voy a poner un ejemplo tan fácil. ¿Ustedes por qué creen que al servicio público y a los taxis le suben las tarifas todos los berracos años? Pues porque tienen a alguien sentado en donde se toman esas decisiones para que les incremente su presupuesto anualmente. O sea, tienen a alguien que pelee por ellos allá. Nosotros realmente somos absolutamente desorganizados y no tenemos quien haga eso por nosotros. Entonces son como muchas cosas que realmente nosotros mismos tenemos que hacer. Entonces, o sea, encerrar la palabra todo, pues no, no diría mucho, mucho pero pues en teoría sí es como lo que nos, nos, toca, nos toca hacer a nosotros. O sea, el, el tema de solo preocuparnos por tocar y, y ya, y responder artísticamente, creo que pues ahorita con la realidad que tenemos no, no es realmente suficiente. Gracias, Esteban. Vamos con Gustavo. Bien, bueno, esta pregunta también está bastante interesante. Yo resumiría todo en tres palabras. La primera es proactividad. Debemos de ser muy proactivos nosotros los músicos, estar a todo momento eh, indagando, preguntando, haciendo, vendiendo, eh, todo lo que pueda ser proactivo. Segundo, eh, algo que mencionaban ya anteriormente, que la pro, es la multifuncionalidad, ¿no? Tenemos que, que, que saber que el campo de la música es demasiado amplio y como decía... Eh, Esteban, ahorita no nos podemos quedar eh, solamente en estudiar un instrumento, ¿no? Esto abarca muchas cosas más, sabernos eh, promocionar para vender como artistas, 
cómo integrar una orquesta o cómo vendernos como solista, como músicos de cámara, como gestor de proyectos. Hay que, hay que eh, ser muy multifuncionales en esa parte. Y la tercera parte que creo que es, es lo que eh, en esta ola... De, de esta década que está iniciando va a ser muy importante es la parte humana no esta parte de la salud mental que es, es, es para los músicos vital eh, como lo venía mencionando pues muchas personas eh, por muchos eh, entes emocionales eh, pues dejan a un lado muchos proyectos o incluso estos instrumentos entonces creo que esta, esta parte es, es, es muy importante para, para el músico para el perfil no o sea, cultivar esta parte humana muchas gracias Gustavo ¿Quién se anima? Leonardo. Pues bueno, eh, es algo que veníamos pensando mucho con mis compañeros y a mí me parece que estas crisis, o por lo menos esta crisis que vivimos, no solamente se traslada a lo musical. Me parece muy interesante que lo estemos pues, enfocando a eso, pero, pero sí he tenido la oportunidad de hablar con muchos amigos que se dedican a otras cosas estudian otras cosas y definitivamente lo que, más, eh, lo que me parece más importante es que el profesional de hoy en día y en el caso del músico tiene que entender su contexto. ¿A qué me refiero? De que, por ejemplo, es muy natural encontrar compañeros que dicen como, no, yo estudio mis ocho horas al día y me voy para Alemania y consigo un trabajo allá, pero entonces hay una desconexión total de lo que está pasando no solamente en el desarrollo colombiano, sino en todo el mundo en todo el mundo. Eh, entonces, basándome en ese contexto que me parece muy preocupante y que hoy se reafirma con ese montón de cifras, a mí sí me parece que de las cosas más importantes es que tenga las herramientas que le permitan innovar. Innovar no solamente en el hecho de, digamos, a mí me parece muy valioso el tema de los proyectos. Eh, todo lo que hicimos con el GLP es supremamente valioso pero también desde la música, yo hemos encontrado, por ejemplo, a partir de la reflexión, que la forma como se comparte la música clásica eh, viene en decaimiento, porque se comparte de una forma errónea, se para completamente al público, entonces todo ese montón de innovaciones son necesarias, y el hecho de que se ahonde en que los músicos tengan las herramientas para hacer esos pequeños cambios, va a, ser, va a garantizar que esta, que esta, como decíamos con Luis Ángel, esta profesión siga teniendo carrera, porque se está acabando la carretera de, de todos los músicos. Gracias, Leonardo. ¿Quién más se anima? Gabriel. Sorry, I didn't see your... No problem. So, I think I'm going definitely with Gustavo with the proactivity um, mindset and way of thinking but more than that i would i would go for the artist artist we need more artists and artists i, I really like the niche uh, view of the artists and what artists by niche and there is two two kinds of people the active and the reactive the reactive is the is the person that's always gonna be um trying to find like so here we have something and it's not gonna work because of that of that of that and never doing the work that should be should be going that should be deep and there is the active that is the person that's always gonna go and make and find ways of of like making making the the activity and and going for what it needs to to achieve so i think we need much more artistry in this in this whole consent of thinking and being a musician is not enough play well the instruments not enough We need people that has this goal and let's do it together, let's make it happen. I think this is the way of changing things. Otherwise, we are going to be stuck and thinking about jobs for the next 20 years. Thank you, Gabriel. ¿Quién sigue? Lau. 
Eh, bueno, yo creo que eh, lo más importante son músicos, crear músicos que se sepan escuchar a sí mismos. Porque, digamos, bueno, yo sé que hablar de, 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 colia, de colonialismo es casi una moda ahora, eh, pero pues estamos hablando un poco de ser muy específicos en, en, en la técnica y en sí el, el instrumento y que eso no nos sirvió, sino nos sirve, qué pena la, la sirena por allá, eh, nos sirve, son, son las ideas creativas y me parece que la creatividad sale cuando nos empezamos a escuchar a nosotros mismos. ¿Qué quiero decir con eso? Que, por ejemplo, cuando yo crecí, a mí me enseñaron que mis referentes todos eran hombres blancos. Entonces, como que me parece que esa es la, la historia como colombianos, llega a un punto en donde nosotros no, nos, no conocemos nuestra propia voz, y entonces lo que hacemos es perpetuar la historia de siempre que ya estamos viendo que es insostenible. Entonces, pues, creo que algo que, que debería ser primordial en este prospecto de músico nuevo es que la educación primaria sea escucharse a sí mismo, o sea, si es una persona que quiere tocar eh, la música que, que sea y que le salga de su corazón, porque esa es nuestra historia, eh, está bien, si no es música que, que, que se encuentra, digamos, con muchas visitas en YouTube, porque como que en la universidad a uno le dicen que, que este es el referente y este es lo que nos debemos parecer, y de pronto la realidad está muy, muy alejada de nosotros mismos. Gracias, Lau. Eh, nos faltan Julián y Gilson. ¿Quién se anima? Julián. Por decisión de Esteban. Sí, bueno, yo, yo también creo que hoy, con como está la situación con, con las artes y, y con la música, tenemos que ser muy, muy integrales, muy integrales como músico y me parece muy importante eh, adquirir todas las herramientas que podamos. Yo personalmente soy muy partidario de, de pronto en, muchas veces nos, nos hemos tenido la oportunidad de aprender algo nuevo, pero decimos, no sé, por ahí no, no es de mi interés o, o de pronto no, yo quiero hacer tal o tal cosa pero es, esas herramientas que vamos adquiriendo en algún momento, en un futuro, nos van a servir y me parece que eso es, es muy importante. O sea, necesitamos llenarnos de cuanta herramienta podamos pues para ser competentes en ese mundo laboral que está tan complicado y, y, y con tantos retos que tenemos como artistas. Entonces, como yo lo veo, es aprender tanto como podamos pues para estar lo mejor capacitados posibles a la hora de, de enfrentar distintos panoramas que podemos enfrentar en, en el mundo de las artes. Entonces, considero que, que debemos ser músicos integrales y, y también, como lo decía Esteban, no, ya no basta con, con solo tocar bien y, y tener mi repertorio al día y, y que me salga perfecto. Hay que verlo mucho más allá. Entonces, así es como veo el, el músico de hoy. Gracias, Juli. Bien, eh, gracias. Sí, claro, estoy totalmente de acuerdo con todos. Realmente el músico de hoy debe tener un balance entre su conocimiento teórico y su destreza práctica. Eh, asimismo, la integralidad debe ser lograda desde lo humano, desde lo social y lo profesional. Eh, nosotros como músicos de también, o sea, creo que debemos tener muy claro y, y yo creo que todos en algún momento o lo hemos hecho o lo haremos y es que seremos también formadores y creo que ese tipo de formación que nosotros o ese tipo de formadores que nosotros lleguemos a ser va a ser indispensable, va a ser muy importante. Creo que eh, la, las transformaciones sociales se van desde la y no sé, no en un 100%, pero muchas transformaciones sociales se han dado desde la educación, desde la infancia, y creo que nosotros debemos estar ahí, así, así no seamos pedagogos en, es, en el momento, pero siempre tendremos niños y, o personas a, para enseñar. Como músicos es, es prácticamente algo que viene con el paquete. Nosotros vamos a enseñar, vamos a ser maestros, vamos a tener 
personas a cargo, vamos, algunos serán directores, otros serán en academias, otros estarán en universidades, pero siempre tendremos personas a nuestro cargo y creo que ese tipo de educación y esa transformación eh, hacia nuevas realidades, hacia nuevos contextos, eh, aparte de lo político, debe estar en la educación musical, como no, no en el sentido de vivir para la música, sino de una música para vivir. Y bueno, ese es mi pensamiento. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Gilson. Y bienvenidos y bienvenidas a los que se acaban de conectar de Zoom de la otra sesión. Y bienvenidas también Irene Yamile por acá. Y no sé si María nos acompaña todavía. María no está. Perfecto. Gracias por unirse. Ellos eran el grupo que estaba justamente eh, en la otra discusión hablando esta misma conversación, pero desde el enfoque de la innovación, el emprendimiento, la agencia cultural y todo eh, del trabajo, digamos, que desarrolla Pedro desde el Global Dios Program. Pedro, hola, bienvenido. Gracias por, por unirte a este grupo y eh, quisimos Hola. preparar este último espacio, estos últimos 15 minutitos que nos quedan para entre todos contarnos un poco cuál es ese resultado, esas conclusiones de lo que conversamos cada grupo y que como un, un único grupo que abordó todo el tema de la educación musical y cómo renovar esa educación musical eh, para enfrentar esos retos actuales, pues nos ayude a, a responder a esas preguntas. Entonces, eh, mientras por aquí vamos organizando a, a, al grupo que estaba en, en la otra sesión, si les parece, eh, yo les voy contando muy rápidamente qué concluimos de esta primera sesión y luego te doy la palabra, Pedro, para que tú nos cuentes qué concluyeron de la de ustedes. Entonces, si me ayudan con la presentación, profa. Gracias. Bueno, entonces básicamente eh, me parece interesante, les vuelvo a traer la misma presentación, el mismo eh, diapositiva que presentamos al principio cuando les dije piensen en ese perfil del músico, piensen en su proyecto de vida, piensen en cómo se ven en cinco años, hicimos toda esa serie de preguntas acá, ahondamos muchas perspectivas para al final terminar concluyendo más ustedes que yo, pero me alegra coincidir con ustedes eh, en que definitivamente un músico de la sociedad actual tiene que enfrentarse a muchos retos, tiene que tener un perfil integral, como lo decía por acá Ricardo, tiene que investigar, cuestionarse cosas, ¿verdad? Cuestionarse estructuras, eh, las metodologías pedagógicas, que acá está, educar en la música, ¿qué significa educar en la música hoy en día? También abordábamos acá con, con, con nuestros participantes que estaban en Zoom, bueno, Laura decía tocar música, pero ¿qué música? Si siempre hemos tocado la música, ¿verdad? Que heredamos de, de la Europa Occidental, de, de música hecha por hombres blancos, los referentes que tenemos, entonces qué referentes tenemos también para tocar música y qué tipo de música, cómo innovamos en la forma como tocamos música, decía Leonardo, ¿verdad? También cómo le metemos todo ese componente de innovación y ahí viene pues también todo este segmento final que, que yo hablo de, de, de las oportunidades de empleo y cómo generamos precisamente esos espacios eh, nuevos para, para la música. Hablábamos también de cómo hacer esa música accesible a las comunidades, ¿verdad? Y entonces Gabriel nos hablaba sobre eh, dos tipos de personas, las que actúan y las que reaccionan, y un poco eh, él decía, bueno, ¿qué, ¿qué pasa si más bien actuamos en pro del cambio, en pro de, de transformar las, las, las situaciones y no solo de reaccionar y hacer hacer? Y justamente eh, también discutíamos entre todos de la importancia de la emancipación del maestro, de la importancia de crear una pedagogía emancipada, donde el músico por supuesto que sigue los consejos de su maestro, por supuesto que, que eh, está esperando una guía, pero también es capaz de tomar sus propias decisiones, también es capaz de entender su rol como músico en la sociedad y construir hacia allá. Hablábamos de esa importancia de crear proyectos de, impo de impacto social y Susana Boreal o Susana Gómez que, que ya eh, se tuvo que retirar nos contaba de bueno, cómo, cómo nos conectamos con la realidad social, toda esta situación de las violencias, cómo como, como músicos a veces eh, pues se tiene que renunciar a, a un poquito a la música, no del todo, pero un poquito a la música para empezar a comprometerse con proyectos sociales, empezar a, con causas sociales, tener más organización desde lo político, como decía también Esteban Orozco por acá, de, de la importancia de mantener digamos una, una postura, una gremiación, eh, a, digamos generar un, una especie de influencia también en lo político y que eso genere eh, más posibilidades. Entonces aquí vemos un perfil del músico integral del siglo XXI que se, sin duda tiene que saber de muchas cosas, que tiene que estar emancipado, que tiene que investigar, ser proactivo, dijo Gustavo también por ahí, que tiene que ser proactivo eh, y conectarse con eso y bueno, como decía Gilson también desde, desde el Tolima, esa gran importancia precisamente de mantener ese, ese enfoque integral y de precisamente trabajar todo este tema desde las instituciones 
gracias, desde las instituciones, eh, desde las instituciones también educativas, pues él le enseña en el conservatorio y, y sin duda, digamos, es importante también ese, ese enfoque que tenemos. Y yo quisiera también finalizar ya aquí para contarles que pues nada, esto eh, lo estamos eh, deduciendo ahorita nosotros entre los jóvenes, esto hace parte de, de, de muchas discusiones, muchos eh, pensamientos que ha habido a lo largo de la historia, ya hace mucho tiempo Becker hablaba de los mundos del arte y de cómo los músicos se dividían de las tareas artísticas y las tareas un poco eh, que ayudaban la producción y todas esas cosas y a dos mundos que hoy en día se tienen que cruzar por ahí alguien hablaba de la importancia de la producción Gabriel creo, de importante que un músico sepa de producción hoy en día, qué es producir hoy en día entonces eso es importante eh, obviamente hay otros teóricos que hablan de los sistemas de actividad y yo creo que y, pero eso lo voy a dejar para el final artistas como agentes de, de Max Weber y de Bele, yo creo que es importante entender también esa relación maestro-alumno cómo construyen lo positivo y cómo cada vez más los conservatorios, las universidades en Europa, en Colombia, en todo lado, estamos empezando a dar cabida a esa emancipación, a, a esa participación de los jóvenes en su formación, en su, en su desarrollo curricular, que es lo que estamos haciendo hoy aquí, hablar de cómo esa formación en los conservatorios debería ser distinta, porque sin duda eso permite romper justamente esos maestro issues de los que hablaba Laura, que nos dijo que así como en la psicología debería haber daddy issues y mommy issues, también debería haber maestro issues, entonces eso no es cómo rompemos esas relaciones tan verticales donde el maestro muchas veces sin quererlo genera eh, eh, condiciones negativas en la carrera en el proyecto de vida músico entonces como los artistas son más agentes activos y no están ahí esperando que alguien decida por ellos la formación y finalmente agradecerles pues a todo el grupo que participó en mi sesión porque sin duda yo creo que ahí aplica el sistema de actividad y es que en la medida en que ustedes que ya están con ese pensamiento, esa mentalidad diferente, que ya tienen otra perspectiva, otra mirada van a entrar a influir en sus grupos de trabajo, en sus orquestas en sus universidades, en todas las actividades que realizan y pues estos teóricos que hablan de los sistemas de actividad hablan justamente que cuando uno introduce un elemento a un sistema que trae digamos unas características, afecta a todo el sistema y sin duda genera cambios entonces pues muchas gracias por haber participado y esa es un poco como la conclusión de lo que fue eh, nuestro grupo del diálogo 1 juvenil del segundo seminario internacional de música y transformación social, organizado por la Fundación Nacional Batuta y la Alcaldía de Ibagué de la Secretaría de Cultura, le doy la palabra ahora a Pedro para que nos cuente entonces cuál es el resumen muy rápido de el, del grupo número 2. Pedro, adelante. Bueno, admiro como siempre la capacidad de los colombianos, de, de su capacidad de locuacidad de los colombianos. Eh, nosotros hablamos de muchas cosas y me cuesta un poco conectar las conclusiones, voy a tratar de ser lo más breve posible. Eh, me pregunto si podría compartir pantalla. Claro que sí. ¿Puedo? Ahí, ¿ustedes están viendo mi pantalla? ¿Sí? Sí, en la pantalla Super. central no, pero en las laterales sí. Ya, ahora sí. Ahí está. Sí, sí. Ya, perfecto. Bueno, eh, nosotros comenzamos nuestra conversación entendiendo un poco el contexto, el contexto a que me refiero por eso, eh, entendiendo la historia de cómo se desarrolla esta idea de una eh, escuela de música, cómo se profesionalizan los estudios de la música, y leímos o, o compartimos un eh, artículo escrito por David Birch, que es un pianista norteamericano que murió en el 2013, trabajó en la Eastman School of Music como director del de Piano Studies Department, del Departamento de Piano. Y bueno, él genera esta visión de cómo la academia va creciendo y se va robusteciendo para poder existir, para poder otorgar grados en música con distintas eh, especializaciones, pero él enfatiza o él subraya de alguna manera eh, que en ese robustecerse de la, de la institución eh, no se piensa lo suficiente y no, es, no hay suficiente pensamiento crítico en relación a la profesionalización de esos estudios en el mercado, ¿cierto? Entonces habla de esta idea de una idea de, pro, de progreso sin propósito, una institución que crece y se alimenta a sí misma, pero que no necesariamente está conectada con la, con la sociedad. Eso genera graduados que están, como todos sabemos, armando camino al andar, que están buscando oportunidades laborales eh, y que hay un contexto saturado de las oportunidades tradicionales, ¿cierto?, donde los músicos podrían ejercer. Partimos con una conversación ahí y después llegamos a otro punto que es un complemento de esa necesidad, que es que los músicos de nuestra generación buscan carreras con impacto social, tienen la convicción de armar carreras, de ser el cambio en este contexto que ven saturado, que ven eh, como 
lleno de problemas, ¿no? lleno de distintos tipos de problemáticas. Entonces, en este contexto de necesidad y de convicción, esta mezcla, nace esta figura de emprendedores sociales en la música. Y era súper interesante ahí, eh, nos quedamos un poco tratando de definir quién es el emprendedor social en la música, quiénes conocen, cómo suena esa idea. Y algunas de las ideas que surgieron de esa conversación era que el músico emprendedor, en un contexto de, de emprendimientos sociales, ve oportunidades en problemáticas de la comunidad, se atreve a conectar la música con otras cosas que no típicamente van con la música, ¿cierto? Se atreve a, a, a conectar ideas improbables. Por ejemplo, eh, una de las participantes trajo a colación un ejemplo que es súper eh, eh, típico, súper famoso en esta idea de emprendimientos sociales, que es utilizar eh, instrumentos que se generan desde basura reciclada y todo el impacto que se tuvo en la comunidad, etc. Esta idea de conectar ideas que típicamente no van juntas y hacer algo nuevo con ellas, innovar con ellas, ¿cierto? El emprendedor social en la música también, una idea que me gustó es que compite. Muchas veces nos encontramos con músicos que, que piensan que, bueno, porque estoy haciendo algo que es bello, que tiene valor, etc., Además de eso tengo que competir, sí, además de eso hay que competir, y en, en esa competir se va descubriendo maneras de diferenciarse que agregan nuevo valor, de nuevo apuntando a esta idea de la innovación, buscando nuevas maneras en que la música puede utilizarse como plataforma para otra cosa, ¿cierto? Entonces ahí conversamos sobre algunas historias súper inspiradoras de, de estudios de casos, si quieres, de emprendedores sociales en la música. Y por último, hablamos sobre algo que nos referíamos como un cambio de paradigma. ¿Y cuál es el cambio de paradigma? El cambio de paradigma es esta idea de que por mucho tiempo el espacio cultural, el espacio de la música, se ha obsesionado con la actividad. O sea, hacemos conciertos, hacemos clases, series de clases magistrales, hacemos eh, clases, nos obsesionamos con la actividad y la calidad de la actividad. Y si bien eso es muy importante, ¿cierto? porque todos hemos tenido experiencias donde una gran orquesta toca una obra increíble y otras experiencias donde musicalmente ¿cierto? la experiencia no es tan gratificante. Sin desmerecer la importancia de la actividad, hay un cambio de paradigma en entender y en conectarse con el impacto de esas actividades. Y cómo medir ese impacto, la importancia de entrar en esa lógica. ¿cierto? Eh, y ahí era, era interesante conversar, por ejemplo, con un participante que era de Francia y que hablaba de los derechos culturales y que si bien no es lo mismo de lo que estamos hablando, conecta en el sentido de ir más allá de la idea del acceso a actividades culturales y pensar cuál es el impacto de las mismas eh, y cómo podemos evaluar ese impacto. Yo diría que por ahí va un resumen de, de la conversación que tuvimos en nuestra sala. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Nuestro moderador del de otro grupo del primer diálogo juvenil en el segundo seminario internacional de música y transformación social eh, me gustaría en este momento, nos quedan cinco minutos, me gustaría mucho que cada uno de verdad en 20 segundos nos cuente qué se lleva de estas discusiones, de este espacio para compartir. Hablamos siempre que es importante que los jóvenes tengamos voz en el futuro de la música clásica, entonces me gustaría mucho que en 30 segundos cada uno de los que estamos acá presenciales eh, y de los que están en Zoom nos comparta qué se lleva de esta discusión y de esta tarde de hoy. Entonces, si les parece, vamos a empezar por los presenciales que somos poquitos, son poquitos, y vamos luego a Zoom. Eh, si quieres, Irene. Bueno, buenas tardes para todos. Muchas gracias de nuevo a la Fundación Batuta por este espacio, también muy importante para las nuevas generaciones, para las voces jóvenes que estamos discutiendo sobre esto. En 20 segundos me llevo eh, una frase que me gustó mucho y es enamorarnos del problema para crear la solución, eso es parte fundamental de ser un emprendedor creativo y también hacer eh, cualquier proyecto social pensando justamente en el enfoque que tenemos como colectivo más allá del de interés particular que podamos tener y eso para mí es la gran diferencia entre emprender desde la creatividad y desde la cultura y emprender simplemente desde una visión digamos eh, mucho más eh, empresarial, por así decirlo. Me llevo esas dos frases que me parecieron fundamentales de esta reflexión que acabamos de tener en el Grupo 2. Muchas gracias, Irene. Vamos con Yamile. Buenas tardes para todos. Eh, ¿Qué me llevo? Algo maravilloso eh, que pudimos eh, a, dialogar fue eh, 
el aprender y desarrollar a través de un sueño no logrado. Eh, soñamos con algo que se frustra, pre, pero del mismo se aprende. Entonces, esto nos hace grandes a través de la historia y del aprendizaje. Eh, por ende, es bueno enamorarse de cada sueño y de cada proyecto. Muchas gracias, Emilio. Vamos con Ricardo. Bueno, eh, bueno, me llevo muchas cosas, ¿no? Me llevo muchos aprendizajes. Muchísimas gracias por, por esta oportunidad. Eh, nada, me llevó la convicción de que un músico tiene que ser interdisciplinario, que, que tenemos que aprender de todo, no solamente de, de nuestro instrumento. Y como en mi caso, pues hasta, hasta hacerlo tenemos que aprender. ¿no? Y, y enamorarme mucho de, de la música y, y yo creo que eso me llevó muchísimas gracias, maestro. A ti, Ricardo, gracias. Todo esto es muy positivo, tú estás en primer semestre apenas del conservatorio, pues no te asustes con las cifras, que ahí vamos a cambiar las cosas para que sí, tengas sal, una salí carrera de, increíble. Salí de sexto en, en la Universidad de Nariño y estaba aterrado. Exacto. tú empiezas por ahí justamente. <risa> <risa> vamos a sumar entonces a que nos cuenten qué se llevan. Yo los voy nombrando porque los veo acá en la pantalla para que sea más rápido. Entonces, Julián y Esteban, rápidamente, ¿qué se llevan? Eh, bueno, pues, co como mencionaste ahorita, de pronto, de entrada, uno podría desmotivarse alguna cosa por, por esas cifras como están, pero yo, por el contrario, me voy muy motivado a, a ver cómo hacemos, cómo, cómo trabajamos y, y, y nos juntamos para que esas cifras las cambiemos y, y pues, que que la música, el arte y todo la pongamos en el lugar que, que se merece todos juntos, trabajando en equipo también, que es algo que evidentemente nuestro gremio necesita. Entonces, nada, yo me voy con muchas ganas de, de seguir aprendiendo, seguir trabajando para, para trabajar por, por nuestro país, por nuestra música. Gracias, Esteban. Pues a mí una palabra que, que dijo Gustavo ahorita en, en una de sus intervenciones es lo de la proactividad. O sea, realmente eh, eso es lo que yo me llevo, de que nosotros como, como artistas, nosotros como, como músicos, tenemos que ser muy proactivos justamente para lo que Julián dice. O sea, tenemos que darle esa, esa posición al, al arte y a la música que se merece y no estar siempre por allá rezagado como la cosa menos importante que sea lo que siempre le corten presupuesto cuando necesiten sacar plata para alguna otra cosa, etcétera o sea, eso es como la principal el principal aprendizaje que me queda de esta charla eh, y es eso, o sea, la, lo, lo proactivos que tenemos que ser todos nosotros y pues que definitivamente, lo que yo mencionaba ahorita, eh, no es el momento y ya no estamos en, en un punto en el que solo nos tengamos que dedicar a, a tener las notas perfectas en el instrumento y ya, y no podemos desentendernos de, de la realidad actual. Gracias Esteban y Julián por esa respuesta más ambientada con el concierto de, de Mozart. Eh, vamos con, con Gabriel, que lo veo allí en la esquina de la pantalla. Gabriel, desde Austria, perdón la hora. So, great. I would like to bring a freight by Jeffrey Walker. Solving the world's biggest problems takes assembles, not soloists. And I think this seminar is a way to bring together problems and to bring together people that are thinking and together reflecting about how to solve to these problems. And, and I think that's it. We have to go together for the same goal. That's, let's get it better and find ways to, to solve all these problems. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk and to listen and to learn so much from all of you. Thank you so much. Gracias a ti, Gabriel, por participar. Vamos con Laura. Eh, gracias. Bueno, yo aprendí muchas cosas, pero yo creo, siento que lo más importante es ver aquí a tantas personas, o sea, que somos muchos y que somos todos y que creo que estamos pensando lo mismo. Entonces, es un llamado a que hagamos algo. O sea, si todos estamos pensando lo mismo, si todos estamos inconformes con el sistema como está eh, siendo hasta ahora, 
pues hagamos algo, porque no estamos solos. Es, es muy importante sentirse en comunidad, o sea, ahí es la importancia de estos espacios, de sentir que no estamos solos y que todas las ideas van a tener una resonancia en otros. Y más cuando nos damos cuenta que no solamente es el Estado colombiano, sino es en general el Estado del mundo. Entonces, pues más que una conclusión propia de que somos muchos, también es una invitación a que nos unamos y también eh, a los que están siendo actualmente profesores o profesoras, la responsabilidad que tienen para empezar a, a cambiar el futuro. Gracias, Lau. Vamos con Leonardo. Bueno, lo primero es que me alegra enormemente saber, o sea, me acuerdo las palabras de Lau, de, de, de la alegría que da conocer a más personas que también están supremamente preocupadas. También me quedo con la preocupación, pero como aprendí a verlo en el GLP, un problema es la oportunidad para encontrar pues, una solución, lo que también me lleva a estar muy motivado. O sea, yo estaba muy ocupado, pero mi trabajo tiene que ver mucho con esto, entonces salgo supremamente motivado a hacer lo mejor que pueda en, en mi espacio y en mi territorio para cambiar también un poco todo. Gracias Leonardo, vamos con Vincent de París. Gracias Vincent por estar acá a esta hora todavía. No, hola, fue, fue un enorme gusto eh, estar con, con ustedes eh, en la conversación. Eh, me, me parece que la, que la pandemia ha de una manera cortado la idea de, de comunidad y que ese um, seminario de música y transformación social es un ejemplo um, excelente de, de intentar uh, juntos a reinventar el, el mundo, de, de compartir ideas. Así que fue un, un honor estar con, con, con ustedes. Una palabra que me gustó mucho fue la palabra loco, y um, creo que es, es importante estar un poquito loco juntos. Gracias a ustedes. Genial, gracias, Monza. Vamos con Gustavo. Bien, bueno, la verdad, yo me llevo en mi corazón muchísima esperanza, porque me alegra mucho saber de que todos estamos hablando este mismo lenguaje, ¿no? el lenguaje de la evolución, de transformar. Y esto es, es muy positivo para mí. Eh, esto es un proceso y este espacio demuestra que este proceso ya empezó, porque no solo se está señalando, sino se está analizando y ya los cambios se están empezando a ver, ¿no? El, el proponer. Y esto es un espacio en el cual eh, todos nosotros, los jóvenes y las personas del, del ámbito musical, estamos precisamente en eso, ¿no? En ese proceso. Y, y como decía, esto es, esto es una evidencia más de lo que está pasando y, y es grandísima la esperanza que me llevo de, de seguir apoyando y trabajando en equipo día a día para, para esta transformación que sí va a ser posible. Gracias, Gustavo. Bueno, me acaban de decir que tenemos 40 segundos, entonces Heidi, Andrés y Gilson, muy rápidamente, ¿qué se llevan? En dos palabras. Eh, dos, mis dos palabras ya las tenía. Era uno, que uno tiene que estar en constante reflexión, o sea, reflexionando continuamente sobre lo que uno, cómo se están llevando a cabo las cosas y cómo podemos evolucionar, así como lo mencionó Gustavo, cómo las podemos hacer mejor. Y la otra es acción. Eh, y eso va muy conectado con nuestra última parte en, en el conversatorio que fue cómo emprendemos, ¿no? Entonces, no es solo uno quedarse también en ideas, sino tomar acción y llevar a cabo esto para lograr, pues, emprendimientos exitosos. Super. Andrés. Rápidamente, comenzar a crear algo, a hacer algo determinado. Todos, como músicos, como jóvenes, tenemos las herramientas idóneas para ello, que es que innovación y creatividad. Y todo eso nos va a conducir a generar un impacto en lo que nos, en los que nos enfoquemos. Siempre va a estar el miedo al fracaso, pero no temerle a ello y ir más allá de lo que se nos presente. Contra viento y marea, como dicen, decimos aquí en Medellín y en todo Colombia. Gracias, Andrés. Y Gilson, finalmente. 
Bien, ¿no? Muy contento eh, por ese seminario y por conocerlos a todos y sobre todo porque eh, de diferentes lugares, locaciones del mundo, estamos conectados con las mismas preocupaciones. Eso es muy importante. Y bueno, lo último que me gustaría decir es que me quedo con Seamos Agentes de Cambio. Desde donde seamos, Seamos Agentes de Cambio. Gracias. Super. Gracias, Gilson. Y gracias a todos y a todas por participar. Hubo gente que tuvo que desconectarse, por supuesto. Estaba Delia Stevens desde Inglaterra, también invitada internacional. Teníamos otros músicos eh, conectados también a estas sesiones. Pero bueno, muchas gracias a todos y todas los que quisieron participar y se estuvieron aquí hasta este último minuto. Eh, Súper bienvenidos todos ustedes y todas ustedes a unirse a los diálogos que sucederán el primero de octubre, las otras dos conversaciones, sé que ahí ya tenemos algunos que están inscritos en, en los otros diálogos, si alguno de ustedes quiere revisar las otras dos temáticas que serán eh, el rol de los músicos en la construcción de paz en los territorios y equidad de género y diversidad en la música, súper bienvenidos a unirse también para discutir ahí, para conversar, para debatir al grupo que ya tenemos allí y también súper invitados todos y todas a unirse a las 4 y 30 de la tarde el viernes primero de octubre donde Irene y yo estaremos haciendo las conclusiones generales de las cuatro charlas de los diálogos juveniles del segundo seminario internacional de música y transformación social Pedro gracias por unirte a esta aventura y al Global Leaders Program obviamente por llevar tantos años ya intentando cambiar esta mentalidad en los jóvenes músicos a nivel mundial y ahí vemos los resultados y el impacto de todo esto con estos perfiles tan interesantes que hemos tenido el día de hoy y bueno, muchas gracias a todos y a todas. Feliz tarde y sigan conectados con toda la programación del Seminario Internacional de Música y Transformación Social. Si quieren unirse a todas las conferencias, están buenísimas de aquí hasta el viernes, www.simts.co. Allí se registran eh, gratuitamente y pueden ingresar a todas las conferencias que todas están enfocadas a lo que hemos debatido el día de hoy, a lo que hemos discutido el día de hoy. Así que feliz tarde y muchas gracias a ustedes y a la Fundación Nacional Batuta y a la Alcaldía de Ibagué por hacer posible este proyecto.